All creative people should be wary of falling into two kinds of boxes. One is a box of other people's expectations. Sometimes you're unlucky enough to get early success with something you've done. <laughs> Why do I say unlucky? Well, it's because you could be trapped by your success. Like a band forced to play its early hits for decades after they have moved on, you could find yourself driven to do a particular kind of work because that's what people want or expect. And this hurts your growth. The second kind of box is a box of form. You fall in love with a particular form, like writing books or making one minute videos or three minute songs and then box yourself into that form ignoring other possibilities this is a problem because you may have begun your journey with a love of creating or a love of storytelling but a form puts a boundary line on it and you may stop exploring other ways to express yourself this would be especially tragic in modern times when the means of production are finally in our hands and we can create whatever we want so if you're a creative person keep experimenting keep getting out of your comfort zone be open to all forms of self expression like audio for example have you ever tried podcasting welcome to the seen and the unseen our weekly podcast on economics politics and behavioral science please welcome your host amit varma Welcome to The Scene and the Unseen. My guest today is a marvellous Manjula Padmanabhan, an artist who cannot easily be put in any box. She is a creator of the legendary and path-breaking comic strip Suki. She is an award-winning playwright, best known for the great play Harvest. She is an author of science fiction. She describes herself in this episode as a forever outsider. I love that term so much and I identify with it. No one who is a forever outsider will ever be a slave to conventional thinking. Their work will have more power. Manjula is 70. She She's lived a rich life. She's created works a fan will always cherish. And as you can see from her Substack, which I've linked from the show notes, she's in the middle of a career, as far as I'm concerned, producing work with energy and imagination. I hope you will love this conversation as much as I did. But before we get to my customary commercial break, here's a non-commercial plug. I've been super active recently on my newsletter at IndiaUncut.Substack.com. Please visit. Please share if you like what you see. Please subscribe. IndiaUncut.Substack.com. And now for the break. Do you want to read more? I've put in a lot of work in recent years in building a reading habit. This means that I read more books, but I also read more long-form articles and essays. There's a world of knowledge available through the internet, but the problem we all face is how do we navigate this knowledge? How do we know what to read? How do we put the right incentives in place? Well, I discovered one way. A couple of friends of mine run this awesome company called CTQ Compounds at ctqcompounds.com, which aims to help people uplevel themselves by reading more. A few months ago, I signed up for one of their programs called the Daily Reader. Every day for six months, they sent me a long-form article to read. The subjects covered went from machine learning to mythology to mental models and marmalade. This helped me build a habit of reading. At the end of every day, I understood the world a little better than I did before. So, if you want to build your reading habit, head on over to CTQ Compounds and check out their Daily Reader. New batches start every month. They also have a great program called Future Stack, which helps you stay. up to date with ideas skills and mental models that will help you stay relevant in the future future stack batches start every saturday what's more you get a discount of a whopping 2500 rupees 2500 if you use the discount code unseen so head on over to ctq compounds at ctqcompounds.com and use the code unseen up level yourself manjula welcome to the scene and the unseen Thank you Amit. Good to be here. I want to start with turning away from you to my listeners and telling them a little story mm-hmm. of things that have been happening this morning, which is when I was in the taxi, I started thinking to myself that okay, when did I first meet Manjula? Because I have this impression that we have met, but I couldn't remember a specific moment that we have met. And I also have this impression that we kind of get along and we got along in the OTs when we knew each other. So I had that vague warm fuzzy impression, mm. but I couldn't pin something down. So imagine my delight when we finally meet over here and before we start recording. when you said that you remember distinctly meeting me and i was like oh great please tell me remind me <laughs> and then dear uh, listeners manjula told me that uh, she met me for lunch at the iic and i gave her a cassette full of songs that i had mixed for her 
and that sounded odd to me because my impression was I knew her in the aughties. Why would I give her a mixtape then? And also, while I did give mixtapes to people in the early nineties, it was either the person I was wooing or perhaps close friends. So it, it felt a little odd, and we talked a little more. And then the horrifying realization came that Manjula had mixed me up with someone else entirely. Another mixtape. <laughs> and uh, yeah, another another mixtape happening right here, and it was someone else she had met and remembered as me, and she thought this other person had called her and invited her to the podcast. So she turned to me with this horrified look on her face and said, "I'm afraid I don't know you." So at then, <laughs> at all. So then we started piecing everything together because I did look familiar to her and she did recognize me, and it turns out that we did kind of know each other in the 2000s, and uh, I dug into my email. and i realized that we met at 5:30 pm on december 18th in 2008 at crossword and kems corner in bombay and also that i reviewed your book and that i liked it and also that you reviewed my book and that you liked it and this was and and my vague memory of all that is i, I had written this book that i now don't like very much i think i let myself down i tossed it off in 2008 and i remember manjula's sister geeta gave a really nasty review somewhere <laughs> saying it's such a piece of shit and i was feeling so low and then manjula said some lovely things about it and the, so the impression in my mind is that you're such a kind person hmm. and of course it, i am a, such a kind person you are and it's kind of you to still it's be sitting right here impression. even though you don't know who i am <laughs> right exactly i'm still wondering <laughs> yeah. is he is he not anyway yeah anyway good to meet you again <laughs> <laughs> yeah indeed life is strange and memories are sort of strange so you know we, you were also chatting before we met about how you turned 70 last year and mm-hmm. we were discussing the sort of the impact of these rates on us and you said it's a great age and all of that no it's a great age in the sense that it's it's a long time i don't mean that it's mm. a wonderful age but i have for most of my life been very unimpressed by the unwillingness most people have for discussing their age so of course i always do i always like to say what age i am and i'm never very sympathetic towards those who are uh, shy or unwilling and as far as i'm concerned being being 70 is undoubtedly old it is a a long time to be alive and it is much beyond the 54 years that is supposed to be the average for india at least it used to be and i feel one of the features of of actually you know like right up till 69 i didn't have this feeling but now that i'm 70 i feel my goodness you know it's it's getting there it's like i was saying to somebody i can sense the end credits <laughs> rolling oh my god <laughs> and i say that with light- lightheartedness in the sense that you you get a sense that okay you've been on the journey the journey is getting to its end and you are starting to feel comfortable with the idea that it will be over and that you can look back and ask yourself has it been a good trip and i can say that at least for myself yes it has so it's a nice feeling it's a nice feeling in that way being old is no great shakes i wouldn't recommend it <laughs> yeah, and you also made it to 40 years past the age when you were determined to sort of die. when you were 16 you decided yes. i will die at 30. not 16 when i was 17 mm-hmm. uh, 19 sorry mm-hmm. i was 19 and decided that i would die actually you're right i think it was 17 in it your book 17, you say 16 yes. no no it was 17. in getting there uh, yes whatever. getting there was uh, there was slightly shifted there some facts mm. were shifted I, it was actually 17 in oh. in real life and yes at 17 i decided that it wasn't really necessary to live beyond 30 because at, in those years there was an idea that the brain cells begin to deteriorate uh, sharply after 30 but more than that i felt looking ahead to the future 13 years from seven, from the time i was 17 it seemed to me i would have reached the outer limit of what is called youth and young adulthood okay and that after that i would have to i would be expected to make responsible 
decisions about life, need to, but the society around me would be expecting me to marry and settle down and so on. I didn't want to do those things. And I had recognized that if you want to be very alternative, chances are the society around you will push against you and that it will be unpleasant and uncomfortable. And I was very committed to the idea that one tries one's best to live a pleasant life. And I had had a, till, well, I won't say till 17. I would say till my pre-teens, I'd had a really lovely life. And I was very happy with it, except for a few things. I didn't like school, for instance. And, you know, much of one's childhood is taken up with school. <laughs> so there was the annoyance of school. But aside from that annoyance which, you know, I'm smiling because, of course, it's a huge annoyance at one level. But, yes, aside from that, I had what I believed, and I, I, think, I think I can even say objectively was a really rather nice life. And I didn't really want any of the grown-up stuff. I wasn't interested in it. I didn't want to, I certainly didn't want to marry. I had no interest whatsoever in the domestic world. And because we didn't live in India for most of my childhood, I didn't have the sense of pressure from family until we'd returned to India, and that was when I was 16 and a half, which is a terrible time to suddenly feel that sense of pressure, of attention from the family, and that attention was not friendly. It was not positive attention because everyone I met seemed to think that I was a little weird and a little difficult. And, of course, I didn't think that. I, I have always taken the stand when people try and tell me that I am strange. I just disagree and think it's the world that's strange, not me. Beautifully said, and I'll double click on a lot of your childhood a little later. But first, a related question about age. Like I, I turned fifty recently, as I said, and mm -hmm. it was horrible. I, uh, I was, I was, I, I, I think I was going through all kinds of mental anguish for months for a number of different reasons, and perhaps an impending sort of age had something to do with it. That how quickly the years pass, your youth is gone, and uh, you know there are friends of mine who hold the view uh, and a justifiable view that mm -hmm. people of my age will live to one twenty because of mental Medical science and advances and I was like listen no you know because that might mean 50 years of dementia and who wants that but right. uh, there's a term now along with lifespan called health span that mm -hmm. you can be healthy for much longer and a friend of mine who's 58 uh, told me Amit you have decades of work ahead of you which sounds exciting but I, I'm, I'm not sure entirely by that but the question I want to ask you is this mm -hmm. that over time how has your perception of time itself changed? Because like when we are young, like when you were 17, 30 would have seemed a long, long way away. You can live a rich life until then. And then, mm. yeah, you know, 40 year old people must have seemed terribly old to you. Mm. And as we grow older, we find that it kind of expands, you know, like looking back today, you know, the distance between your birth and now is the same distance as say, I mean, the 1857 rebellion ended a few years, you know, mm -hmm, if, if you're mm -hmm. just minus 70 yeah, from right. 1953. Right. So do you look at time differently? And in that regard, do you look at your own life and what you want out of life and what brings happiness differently? Well, going back to the decision at 17 that I would die at 30, one thing that happened as a result of imagining that I would be dead in 13 years is that... I lived those 13 years very intensely because I was very... Con I mean, I have met one or two other people who have had similar life plans. That is, they're going to die, in quotes, young. And because I had that idea that I didn't have long to live, 30 didn't seem... Especially when I crossed 20, 21, 13... The three zero did not seem that far away. And I felt I had to pack in a great deal of living to make it worthwhile to be quitting the stage at, at 30. <laughs> and it may seem funny and or, or bizarre that I honestly believed that I had, that I was going to do it. And I didn't often speak about it to friends because I knew that I had, of course, realized that people become irritated and disbelieving and you have 
pointless kinds of arguments. So I didn't feel the need to justify, to carry on about it. Of course, in my book, Getting There, I talk about it. But your question is about perceptions of time. Thinking that you're going to die at 30 by whatever means, we will, we will not go down the path of discussing the means by why, why I thought. And I have often looked back and thought, my goodness, if I had suddenly had a fatal accident at 28 or 27, my first thought would be, wait, <laughs> I have another three years to go. This is wrong. Wow. Uh, so uh, for some reason at the time, it never occurred to me that I might something might happen to me before 30. After And right up till 30, that, uh, up till that, my birthday is in the middle of the year. Right up till that date, I kept thinking, you know, I can still do it. I can. I can still do it. But the sense of waning intention, because it's also, again, I think we don't, we won't go down the path of discussing means and methods <laughs> because that can, for many people, can sound grim. It isn't grim for me. That's all I can say is that it doesn't. I don't, I don't feel a sense of doom, even though that was what I was thinking about the whole time. But because of that plan, my sense of time after I crossed 30 was, my goodness, I have my whole life and I have nothing planned. I don't have any concept of how I will live more responsibly or be more practical uh, because, of course, I hadn't. I had decided that I'm not going to live long. Therefore, it doesn't matter what I do. I can make every kind of mess in my life because... I don't have to care what people will think of me because I won't be around for long. <laughs> if you can convince yourself of that, I'm not suggesting that anyone listening to this podcast should convince themselves because it can be a little gloomy sometimes. But realizing that I suddenly had a huge, potentially a huge lease of life, as I said, it wouldn't. it did not seem to occur to me that I could die suddenly, unplanned. <laughs> and from all of this, perhaps it is clear that I lived in a sort of bubble where I didn't really see much of standard life in the sense that I didn't, we, because we lived away from the family, I didn't see deaths, much in the way of deaths in the family. We heard of events, birth and death, but we didn't actually see them. So I was neither familiar with old and aging people, nor with very young. I was not used to small children. I didn't especially like children, and I didn't have any in my immediate neighborhood. And my my nephew and niece, that is my sister Geeta's son and daughter, were, the, in a sense, the only children that I was initially exposed to. And no one in my family was so careless as to leave me in, in in the care of any children, because it was very clear that I was not equipped. So in a sense, by the time I was 30, I had a very strong sense of time, of time passing and of time being something that you can a little bit play with, that you can think about it as as something that you have to be very conscious of, because again, most of my 20s were spent in um, desperately trying to make up, make enough money to pay rent because at 20, there was a very, I would say, serious decision I made at 21. At 21, I uh, said to my parents, I have finished my degrees. I had done a BA in economics and an MA in history. I was never a good student, but I did, I seemed to have just kind of bumbled my way through my degrees. I got sort of got through them. And as soon as I was done, that is at 21, I said to my parents, you no longer need to support me. So I was no longer accepting money from them and therefore was not. And I said, since I'm not accepting money, I'm 21, I can live on my own. And I will. I wasn't staying at home. I was staying as a paying guest in a small apartment in, uh, just in a room in Bombay and then later in, a, you know, so two or three different places. And my only fixation was how to pay my rent because I was very stubborn and very unwilling to go back on my word. So 
I was determined never to ask my parents for money, and I didn't. So all that tells you is that I spent my entire 20s and much of my 30s struggling to make money from being an artist, an illustrator, cartoonist, and occasionally a writer. And anyone, again, anyone listening to this who has attempted to do that for a living will know that it's a very poor living. You don't make any money. And I used to earn all of 75 rupees for a small drawing in the Times of India. And that was not a small, in fact, it was a three-column drawing. It was the most I got for a, a, a drawing. And when, with my comic strip, I made 300 rupees a week, <laughs> it seemed like a lot of money. Of course, it wasn't because I was paying, whatever, 1,200 rupees for my rent. And it never, and that, you know, <laughs> uh, I also needed to eat and have money for taxis because I hated using buses. So it was, you know, as I, as, as I keep saying, I was not, and still I'm not practical. I preferred to, to spend whatever I had in my account rather than try and save. I knew I couldn't. Again, this is where dying at 30 was helpful because then I didn't have to think about, you know, saving for a future that I believed wouldn't happen. But after 30, then it all began to kick in. Oh, my God, I've made no plans. And then, uh, you know, if you are temperamentally impractical, then it just becomes another kind of vague dream. And you you just do what you can. But time had become something I was very conscious of. I have to meet a deadline. I would meet my deadlines. So I would say that the passage of years has been very conscious. I've been very aware. And also, I have two older sisters who are seven and ten years older than me. And through their lives, I have had a sense of the passage of time, what they feel, what they experience. It strikes me that, you know, setting, assuming that you have that fixed point at which you will no longer be here can also be liberating in the sense that it can then liberate you from goals. Mm -hmm. Like I think too many of us when we are young, we make the mistake that we set goals for ourselves. Ye karna hai, wo karna hai. Whether it is a goal in terms of building a career towards something or whether it's a goal in terms of, oh, I want to write so many books or make so many films, etc., etc. And those goals can become traps because in the end, the only thing that actually I think gives you happiness is just the process of figuring out what you like to do and just doing it and there need not be a goal attached to it and I think that's a trap that you know people can often take a, a long time to get past and it seems to me that that may not have been such a trap for you because one you're going through the everyday exp experiences of whatever you're doing and meeting the rent and your sort of horizon is much shorter than that and equally when earlier you spoke about I wanted to pack in as much as possible I'm assuming you meant in terms of packing in experiences and not packing in things that I will do per se or goals that mm -hmm. I will achieve. Mm -hmm. So is that kind of the case that yeah. you were never goal directed and you could just... I wasn't because I had, for some reason, I mean, maybe we can, we meaning, maybe if I felt like I could analyze why exactly. But by, by my mid-teens, I had grown completely unimpressed by other people <laughs> and other people's opinions and it never it never mattered very much to me if people didn't like me or didn't approve of me because as i think i've already said i seem to have i can't i mean i i, I can't be you know say it was i was born like that but Somewhere along the way, I became. I seem to have had such an extraordinary sense of myself as being entirely self-sufficient. I was. I'm not needy emotionally, and don't feel the need to be loved or even approved of. I. It's as if I have placed on myself a giant tick mark. And I don't, you know, if someone doesn't like me, okay, poor them is what I feel. <laughs> but it isn't, it, 
I wouldn't, this might sound, and if someone wants to think that it sounds horribly arrogant, maybe they're right. Maybe it is horribly arrogant. But I, I don't think of it as arrogance. I just think, surely anyone can make the same, it's a decision. It's not because I think I'm wonderful. I don't think that. I don't think I'm particularly smart. I'm often told that I am. I used to be <laughs> told that. But I don't pay any attention to that. I don't think I'm particularly smart. I, you know, I make lots and lots of mistakes. I I fail a great deal. And when people introduce me as, you know, the well-known, this for me, that's all completely ridiculous. It has very little meaning. And I don't, I, this is what I mean when I say I do, I'm not interested in other people's opinions of me because my opinion of myself is what counts and my opinion is middling. I think I'm not bad. That's all. And I don't wake up every morning thinking, you know, maybe there are people who do that, you know, people who are actually very successful in their lives. And so they wake up with a kind of, you know, the sunrise behind their heads. But I don't, as as I, as we said earlier, I, I don't wake up easily at all. <laughs> I struggle to get out of bed because I have, again, I <laughs> I laugh about this because it seems ridiculous, but I have wonderful morning dreams. I dream a lot, and I have charming dreams. So, it's it's like to struggle out of whatever the main feature of the morning is 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 not easy. And if the room I'm in, and in fact the room in Delhi is like that, if it is dark, then I have no incentive to wake up. If I'm in a room where the, the sunlight comes in, I'll wake up easily, but that's not the case in Delhi because we're on the ground floor and, you know, there's a driveway right outside my window, so it's curtained off, and so it's very dark. And the thing I detest the most is if someone puts a light on. I hate being woken up with a bright electric light. I like a soft. Anyway, <laughs> all of this is a way of saying that I am, in a sense, easily satisfied. It's I don't I don't ask much of life. I and in a sense I haven't actually got very much. I don't own anything. I don't own property. I, my, you know, I have a tiny cupboard closet of clothes. I've never had much of an interest in clothes. I don't have much of an interest in possessions. I don't own any pets. I don't have children. I am, to many people's surprise, actually married, but I never talk about the other person because he's very private and hates being talked about, and he knows that I talk a lot. So I try to be respectful and not talk about him. So I don't. So I would say, you know, it's not when I say that I'm satisfied with my life, it's not because I have very much. Maybe that's why, you know, it's like there's not very much to lose. Have you read this uh, excellent book called Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker? No. <laughs> I will. I will. uh I will send it to you because a couple of interesting things I learned from that book. And one of them is that he talks about the importance of sleep and divides it into his different parts. Mm -hmm. And the revelation there is that, you know, you have light sleep, you have deep sleep and you have REM sleep. Mm -hmm. And deep and REM are super important. And REM is that phase where we dream. Mm -hmm. And REM is actually bunched towards the end. Mm -hmm. Right. So I actually have a watch that tracks my sleep every day and tells me how I sleep and etc, mm -hmm. etc. Et and REM is bunched towards the end and that is when we dream so it is actually not unusual that you dream in the mornings because it is always yes, going yes. to be in the last part of your sleeping right. uh, that you dream right. and the other thing that I've learned about sleep is that sleeping in darkness is super important because the light even if your eyes aren't open gives a signal to your body that it's time to wake up mm -hmm. so long may you sleep peacefully uh, <laughs> in the dark without uh, people waking you up mm. and also you know what you said about not caring about others strikes a chord because A, I think is not at all arrogant. You showed a lot of humility by saying you don't think you're particularly smart. Frankly, I've had a lot of 
great achievers on this show mm-hmm. and they they all have the humility you know it it is really the mediocre who wake up thinking the sun shines out of their <laughs> ass so i'm not at all surprised but i actually envy that sense of not caring about what others think because i think that is really a fundamental human anxiety that holds all of us back i think it took me well 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 into my adulthood to you know begin to even recognize it and then start to lose it and start not caring and yet mm. it is kind of instinctive one does care so i really sort of envy that but let's let's get to biography now mm. so you know tell me about your childhood which was itinerant you were traveling around tell mm-hmm. me about your childhood your parents what what growing up was like so you know i was born in new delhi and we traveled very soon after that my father was in the foreign service we went to sweden for 2 years Switzerland for three years, Pakistan, Karachi for three years, and then, if, as far as I was concerned, for the first time returned to um, India in the sense that I was, I, you know, I didn't have obviously didn't have much in the way of memories of being born in India. So we lived in Delhi for three years, and then Thailand for three years, and then my parents, my father was. in thailand was posted there as ambassador and his final posting was in iran and it was a time in iran's um, history where they were celebrating 2000 years of the shahs uh, the dynasty the shah belonged to the pahlavi dynasty and it was it was a time in iran when they were they believed they were at their peak so it was a very glittering and fun time to be there i i at that time went to boarding school in kodaikanal in south india so i um visited my parents in iran it was wonderful i loved iran but it's like it's you know it's not really very meaningful to say iran because what i saw of iran was the very limited and glittery side of living with my parents in the embassy and that sort of very in one sense very superficial life of being in Tehran but i did love their food i did like the people beautiful people i mean it was to me it was really startling how handsome they were men and women um anyway then my father retired and uh I experienced what I have often spoken of as reverse frog prince <laughs> <laughs> from being something like a princess I became a frog I became completely and frighteningly ordinary in terms of my social life because my parents retired with in the same way that many government officials retire with a kind of a very modest living and I was not mentally and emotionally equipped to make that change and I re- I didn't consciously think that this was my this was all that remained you know it it seemed to me that my life had to be on a different trajectory and I, of course you know like any young person I hope to make it happen but rem- remember at 17 i was planning to so it's very possible that the change of life from the r- very pleasant traveling life of of my childhood to suddenly be stuck in india in in a kind of a reduced circumstance was a good reason to feel that, that you know there's no reason to continue doing this for too long <laughs> and i would so you know after boarding school i was in college for 3 years in bombay elphinstown college it was quite it it was a challenge to me to be suddenly surrounded by people similar but not very much the same because the people around me were from especially in bombay you know bombay is a commercial city and I had never really met people from commercial backgrounds. I remember in my boarding school which was as I said in Kodaikanal presentation convent Kodaikanal. For the first time in that school I met people whose values were based on money. I had never met such people before. I had never I had hardly ever used any 
physical money in my life. And I, the closest I came to actually using money was when playing Monopoly in <laughs> as a child in, in Thailand. I loved Monopoly, but as I have said in years since then, as an adult, I can't bear to play a Monopoly because it's too much like real life. Every time you go around the board, you maybe you get maybe you get two hundred dollars, but most often you've paid ghastly rents and none of your properties are earning anything. And it's just the pressure. I can't, you know, even on a game board, I can't face it. But in Bombay, it was. I have a few friends from then, from those years, and they were good friends. But they were, in many ways. Their lives and my life were clearly very different, and in a sense, the the minor sense of alienation I had always had. You know, if you travel as a child and you're always a foreigner, you are used to the sense of alienation. When you come in back to what is what everyone tells you is your own country. You should settle into what is your country, but what I realized was that I was much more alien in my own country because I didn't speak any any local language. I didn't speak Hindi, and I specifically also never spoke my supposed mother tongue. I say that English is my mother tongue because I learned English from my mother. I never learned to speak what would be my ethnic language, which is uh, Malayalam. I don't know it at all. I, I, I speak terrible Hindi, but I don't speak any Malayalam at all. And uh, so in a sense, you know, when people say, because of my it, a recurring conversation, is people hear my name, my surname, Padmanabhan, which is my birth name, and it is immediately assumed that I'm Tamilian because that is a Tamilian name. And they will say, so, oh, you must be, you know, and I say, no, I'm not from Tamil Nadu. And then they will say, so, you know, where are you from? And I used to say, I'm not from Tamil Nadu, but I'm from Kerala. But latterly, I've decided, I've begun to think that that is, it is really, it's kind of meaningless. I can say that my parents were Malayali. What am I? You know, I'm certainly not, I've never lived there. I have relatives. I'm very fond of my relatives. I like a certain amount of Malayali food, but I like all kinds of food. I'm not food specific. I I, I think it, people like to put others in a, in a pigeonhole and it is convenient to say, oh, you're Malayali, but I'm not. I'm an urban Indian, and I think, in fact, there are very many Indians who fall into this category, but very many of us choose not to accept that fact. We choose, we prefer, and maybe it's it, it, it's a sense of security, I'm not sure, but I I think for, for me, it's easier to think of myself as a permanent outsider and just sort of, I don't feel a sense of rootedness, and I also don't feel a longing to be rooted. I just, I, it's like that transistor is missing altogether. It, it's fascinating. I learned this, you know, great phrase, rooted cosmopolitanism, <laughs> from an episode I did with Sugata Srinivasaraju, and of course it applied to him and many others he was mm. talking about. And I feel in my case, again, the rootedness is missing. It's, I'm cosmopolitan but I don't really feel like I'm from anywhere and throughout my life I've kind of felt an outsider in the various fields that I've dabbled in and I've, I've, I've kind of come to terms with that a bit but I also sometimes you feel the sense of loss that where is home really that do I have a community who are my people quote unquote you know mm. but in in your case it was never that sense of loss apart from the alienation you said you felt when you were young yeah there's no loss I mean, my home is wherever I am, and I don't, I imagine one amongst the determining factors is food. If you have put very particular food needs, then it's possible that you will always hanker after something or the other, but I don't have that 
And it's very possible that going to a boarding school kind of uh, cut off the uh, desire or the need for a particular cuisine. But I, I, you know, I can't know that. I, I suspect it is something much more basic that I am lazy about needs and I prefer to be comfortable rather than be needy. Therefore, rather than yearn for something I can't easily get, I enjoy things that are easy to get, like toast and butter. I, I, like, I like very simple food and I very rarely have a need for anything particular. And most of the time, if you don't have very particular needs, you can easily be satisfied. So I, um, I think, as I said, it has something more to do with being lazy. I'm, I would characterize myself as extremely lazy, indolent, and that my, in my preferred mode, I have, you know, I don't want to make an effort to, to, to be comfortable. So if I, if I were the kind of person who was very particular about, especially about food, I would probably be very uncomfortable because typically people who have special needs uh, spend a lot of their time hunting for just the right thing, which, you know, when they get it, then they're really happy. It's possible, and I'm very willing to accept this, that for someone like myself, and of course I'm not unusual, if you don't have very particular needs, you're, I, and I, as I said, I think this is true of me, you don't experience the intense joy of getting something that you have hunted for. I, I think I don't have very strong emotions up or down. I don't get angry much, and I don't experience great highs. I'm very middle in the middle and very steady so when people go through that process of kind of coming into adulthood and finding themselves i find that there are two sort of journeys they make two kind of anxieties they deal with and one of which we've already discussed and you said you didn't really care about it which is you didn't care about what other people thought of you and that came very early and that is something that young people have to kind of deal with and there is this great phrase i learned recently from psychology called the looking glass self mm -hmm. where you kind of form a conception of who you are from the reflections in the eyes of others and you start doing more of what they approve of and you start trying to fit in and i guess that's one journey that is not so relevant but one journey that surely is is the process of figuring out for yourself who you really are and what you want to be and so on and so forth uh, and you know in the protagonist in getting there and i'm saying the protagonist in getting mm -hmm. there even though it's a memoir but mm -hmm. uh, you know uh, as you said some things might be shifted around and the protagonist in getting there is particularly at the start of the book facing that in terms of weight mm -hmm. that she just wants to lose weight she hates uh, uh, a way she looks and mm -hmm. even yeah something i can relate to now as well and <laughs> And later on, when that need to figure out who she is and to be someone else expands beyond just that, at one point, uh, she uh, is saying to her boyfriend, quote, I've got to go through with something. It's something I'm trying out. A person I'm trying to be. It's like trying on new clothes or a new costume. I don't know what I'll look like at the end of it. I don't know if I'll stay that way or come back to what I was. Stop mm. quote. And, and I found this very poignant. It's just this process of not knowing who you are perhaps at some level not being satisfied with what you are, maybe trying something else, a new way of being, etc., etc. So what was that process for you like? Like I imagine to some extent the art and the writing would have played a part in it. Hmm. But just overall, what was that journey like in those years where you begin to settle into the shape of what eventually becomes you? Literally the shape. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say the years between when I was in boarding school, that's 13, 14, 15, 16, I was in boarding school. And from the time, that means from the time I kind of returned to India, 13, 14, and then went to school, boarding school, and then till the 30s, you know, till the, the, lit, the kind of virtual death. So in a sense, it's possible that for me, that sense of crossing 30 was a kind of rebirth into another person. And that from 13, 14, 
which for many people is a time of terrible confusion anyway. But for me, it was com- made complex by the fact that we'd been in Thailand for three years. Thailand was a difficult place for a young person to be because the Vietnam War was going on next door. And I was in an international school, which, again, I expected that. That's how I lived much of my life. But the sense of being at the brink of things because of the war next door, obviously we didn't see the war in Thailand, in Bangkok, but we saw troops, American troops, in the city all the time. And this culture of continuous uh, sexual activity in, in the and the nightlife which you would not expect a school child to know about. But of course, we were. We, it was there the whole time. And in the shops, in, in the, uh, the whatever you saw, even in tourist shops, the sense of the sex trade going on continuously all the time. And you couldn't not be aware of this other kind of raucous nightclub life going on. And Meanwhile, you know, the, the Thais and their very delicate and beautiful and traditional culture are struggling to keep up with all of this other stuff going on. And the Americans in school with me who were all the, the children of troops, <laughs> I mean, obviously they were stationed in, in Thailand, so they were the children of officers, but they were very different to what I was seeing on TV, on American TV shows, the children in school were from lower middle class families from America, and where you know where they, the parents, the fathers were out uh, in, in the field. So from that to come to a very quiet and elite boarding school, these were huge shocks. And as I as I said, despite my sense of centeredness about myself, I was of course under continuous pressure from the outside. Coming back to India meant meeting the relatives who had not been there all through my early life. And when you say that it's one of the pressures that most people feel, they feel it because most people are embedded in their families. I was not. I have a huge family, but they were not actually with me. So I couldn't I didn't feel that that overbearing sense of uh, uncle this thinks that and aunt this thinks that and, you know, everyone thinks you are cross-eyed or whatever it is that they think. And I would hear these things, but they wouldn't be, because you need continuous exposure for it to have a, a deep effect on you and to actually begin to distort your sense of yourself. Because I didn't have that to start with, coming back into it as a teenager and then all the years between finishing, uh, ending school and then college and the pressures of struggling to live in a world which didn't have spaces for people like me. All of this, I was able to circumvent in part because I didn't speak local languages. I didn't speak Hindi, Marathi, Malayalam. So I didn't you know, when people are sarcastic, it is nearly always in the mother tongue. If you don't have a sense of those cutting remarks that people, if you don't have a sense of what they mean deeply, then even when someone insults you in some language that doesn't, you know, you might physically know, the, uh, might literally know the meaning, but it doesn't actually hurt because it's, oh, this is what it means, but it doesn't touch you. And I would say that might be one reason that I was sort of immune because none of the things that people might say actually touched me much. And it, But it still took a while to settle into something personal rather than external, an external view. And this Part of what was happening in getting there was struggling away from the shell, the various shells of personality that the the world places upon you, an expectation that you'll marry, an expectation that you'll settle down with a particular guy, that you'll live a, you know, if you've had an upper middle class life, that you'll continue in that way. All of that was what I was struggling to make sense of without any examples 
outside of myself of people, other people who were similar to me. There was no one like that. I mean, the closest relative who had done something unusual was, and very unusual in her case, was my great aunt, whose name is E.K. Janaki Amal, who is a famous botanist and a botanical geneticist who won all kinds of honors. She was born at the end of the 19th century. And I knew of her, and of, uh, of course I also met her a few times in my life, as the one, amongst my entire constellation of extremely respectable and uh, straightforward or straight livings, at least uh, superficially, aunts and uncles, one aunt, my great aunt, that is my mother's aunt, who didn't marry, who at 15 told her family that she was not going to marry, that she was going to wear saffron, be celibate, and become a scientist. And the fact that not only did she get her way, but she made a huge mark for her, a name for herself as a complete renegade. It was, it's like I could have chosen from all my aunts and uncles, but I chose that one to, to be impressed by. Of course, when I would say to my mother, well, you know, my aunt, your aunt didn't get married, she would say, but she was a great scientist. You, <laughs> on the other hand, are nothing, you know. Because my, my parents were not impressed by my desire to be an artist. They knew, I mean, my parents were both interested in art. They bought a lot of art in the course of our journeys. My mother had a very good eye for, for art objects. But, and of course, both my parents were, you know, they, they, my father was in the foreign service. He was an LLB, so he... Obviously, they were both, um, and my mother was a BA in English literature. Everyone was very, in the family, was very educated. But the idea of making a living as an artist or writer, this was not considered successful, no, not much hope in that. So if I wanted to do something to impress my parents, I would have had to be a professional of some sort, which I wasn't going to be. So... I didn't impress my parents much at all, but leaving home at 21 meant that they couldn't manipulate me much. Not that they were, they were wonderful parents. They were, the, the best part of them was that they left me free to think. They didn't try to control my thoughts or my ideology or idealism at all. But on the other hand, I didn't actually live at home. So they couldn't control me directly. I don't know if I've wandered very far from your question. No, no, my all my questions are direct are aimed at finding out more about your life. So you haven't you you're right in the center of it. And hmm. you, I don't think it's possible to wander far. You know, I, at this point, I'll remind my listeners and myself that this is really the late 60s and early 70s you're talking about mm -hmm. when you're in your teens and late mm -hmm. teens. And there is not only no internet in terms of access to knowledge and picking up different frames about the world. But, you know, when you speak of having no examples, mm -hmm. that sort of brings me to thinking about then, apart from having that one aunt, mm -hmm. you know, what are... How did you form your frames of thinking about yourself in the world in the sense that, again, your protagonist in getting there and therefore I assume you, mm -hmm. has a disdain towards traditional notions like marriage and having kids and that life. And I, I guess most people by default would get sucked into that notion of what they are expected to be in life. So the men will think I'm going to be doctor or engineer or whatever it is and I'm going to then get married and have kids. And the women will also think it's that way, etc., etc. But you had clearly pretty young sort of formed a frame that is different from that. I'm wondering if maybe the Thailand experience has something to do with that in terms of, you know, the relations between men and women, seeing the instrumental side of that mm -hmm. and perhaps, but maybe not. Or like, were there, what, what kind of reading were you doing? Had you actually done any feminist reading by that time? What were the books that influenced mm -hmm. you? Well, I think very early in my life, the questions my mother in particular was always asking the three of us, my myself and my two older sisters, was, what do you want to be when you grow up? There was never any 
For some, I'm not for some reason. I know very well what the reason is. My mother had always wanted to be a doctor and had been thwarted in her desire. And doing a BA was the best, was the closest she could get to an academic life, which she would have preferred. So very possibly, I was influenced very deeply by a mother who did not have an interest in traditional family life. She didn't, it's, you know, she may not have realized that she was instilling that desire or lack of desire in me. But clearly that had been, that was a deep impression early, left in me very early. And my sister's one sister went on to, you know, she, one sister got married early, but the understanding was that her education would not be interrupted. So she went from being married straight into her BA. And the second sister was uh, pressured. <laughs> I'm smiling because I, my mother was closest to that, the middle sister, my sister called Surya, and was then able to get Surya to become a doctor, which was what my mother high, you know, considered the highest possible profession. And with two sisters who were who were achievers and who had done what parents wanted of them, I didn't feel the pressure <laughs> to follow suit at all because okay, they'd done they'd gone that path. And since my life was quite different to theirs for all kinds of reasons, just on part, in part because I was much younger. And the influences I was faced with were different to what theirs was because part of what forms a person is this family life, the way that one is affected by all the relatives who know you. If you're not affected by very many relatives, they're just, they're nice people whom you meet and who are nice to you, but they don't uh, get in your mind. They, they're not in your brain. And I think for many, especially many Asians, it's all across Asia, the sense of your all your masked relatives sitting in your brain telling you what to do and, and frowning at you if you do the wrong things, if you don't have that, then you uh, make choices based on what you read, what you... So you asked me about reading. So I was a voracious reader till my late teens. And... I, uh, of course, you know, uh, movies were only things that you went to cinemas to see, and I saw a lot of films, uh, even as a child. One of the things of being in Thailand was that there was no uh, rating. There, were, <laughs> there was no censorship, so you, anyone could see anything. Of course, I was a child, so to get to a cinema, I would need to go with others. I wouldn't be able to go on my own, but there was nothing to stop any of us from seeing whatever we wished and which we sort of did. And later, so cinema was very important to me. And of course, much later when I met um, people who were knowledgeable about cinema, I realized that what I call cinema was just what they sneered at as, oh my goodness, mm -hmm. commercial cinema. That's not cinema, et cetera, et cetera. That's a whole other debate. And But it was it was very important also to understand that what I had liked was just, you know, Bolly, uh, Hollywood uh, commercial films and that there's a whole other level. But that was for much later in life. You ask about feminism. So in my late teens, I became conscious, as did many people, <laughs> of the feminist movement. And it was very important to me. I read not so much books, but magazines. I, I was a subscriber. My sister in the U.S., my sister by then had, the middle sister had earned her degree, gone to the U.S., was living there. And she sent me material such as Ms. Magazine. I had a subscription to Ms. Magazine. So in the late teens, early 20s, I was, as you can, as I say in getting there, I was quite passionate about being a feminist. But even by the middle of my 20s, as I say in getting there, I was starting to have some very deep doubts about feminism as an idealism to ideology to live by. I still I con continue to think it's a very useful ideology to help one help a young person, particularly young women, 
it helps women to think about themselves and the place of women in the world, in the world that we have rather than the world that we would all prefer. At the same time, for myself, I began to draw away from hardline feminism because it seemed to me that it wasn't working too well for me. Because, again, then we get pushed, pulled back into the opinions of others of what a woman should be, can be, ought to be. Whether it's in the West or in the East, these views are very hard-wired. And society has, all societies, have very fixed, rigid opinions. And I would say today's movements towards transgenderism of various kinds, you know, the, the fact that in today's world we, we acknowledge a number of different genders, is actually a reflection of the fact that society has rigid views for men and women as if we were completely separate species. Whereas, in fact, as I believe, and I'm not alone, it's a spectrum. Maleness and femaleness, femaleness is a spectrum. And most of us fit close to the one or the other end, but very few of us are, you know, fixed Puritans on either end of the spectrum. And some of us are very much closer to the middle. Now, I, I would not say that I am uh, trans. <laughs> I, I would not say I'm, I'm confused about my gender, but I clearly don't fit in the, in the, at the female end of the spectrum. Not clearly, because I don't live a fe feminine life. And I don't have any difficulty placing myself in today's parlance as cisgender woman. You can call me that, but I still don't actually live a woman's life. And I'm sometimes very conscious of that. I, I, you know, I, I see other women and the struggles they have, and I sympathize, but it's not my struggle. And so however much I might sympathize, I'm also very conscious that it's it's I haven't lived that life. And my ability to sympathize is it, you know, I worry is is there a terrible edge of condescension there? And to what extent am I truly able to report how, what am I reporting on? What am I writing about when it's not from the same base that most women are experiencing? When you say, I haven't really lived a woman's life, isn't that question itself with reference to the stereotype of what a woman's life is? Yes. And with a re reference to the stereotype of what femininity is or what women must do and all of that. Yes. And therefore, almost meaningless by itself, I mean. Yes and no. Because what it does is, you one can say that. But what it does is, by and large, when in any group of amongst other women my experiences are not the same and then if we if you keep keep making groups then my experiences are of course not the same as men and then which group will i easily belong to and no it's not easy to define that i again it doesn't upset me and then the uh, the there is another issue a lot of these questions become settled as one grows older and Older women are all much closer to a particular norm of of behavior and attitude, except that, of course, if one has not had children, then an entire world of experience is outside my range. And my not having children is because I had no, no interest. I never wanted to have children, never felt. And I mean, I don't even own a plant. I'm not good at looking after living things. So it's not... It's not at all that I felt any any desire to belong to that world. It's uh, and again, I don't feel there's any, <laughs> I never feel a sense of abnormality. I just feel there must be others like me, and I have been fortunate to get away with fe being the way I am without being stigmatized much. No one really attempts to tell me that I'm odd. I know I'm odd, <laughs> and I, it doesn't, it doesn't, hasn't affected me. 
What's yeah, I, I actually don't think you're odd, number one. And and number two, what I kind of meant was that just because you don't conform to the stereotype of what a woman is expected to be like doesn't mean you're any less of a woman or doesn't mean that, you know, you know does I, I mean, then we are defining that category too sort of uh, rigidly in a sense, I think. Mm. I mean, people are what they are. Why does it make a difference? But It starts to make a difference. But, I mean, you mm. know, I, I live around all the... Uh, barriers so most of the time and you know i can unlike someone who is actually transiting or is feeling unsure and so on i'm not i i easily tick the mark that says male female i tick the mark i you know i, I i'm not pretending but i would say that there are certain differences and that sense of Oddity, if I don't feel it, it's because I live outside the norms. I don't, you know, I never go to weddings. I hate weddings. I hate situations where the sexes are are highly underlined as being, this is the male side, this is the female side, and, you know, God forbid that you're somewhere in the middle. I don't go, I don't experience any of that. And I don't, I'm not usually in a situation where I have to, with some embarrassment, say, well, you know, that doesn't apply to me. Oh, obviously, I'm not trying to stand out, so I don't. It's it's not as if I I wait for moments when I can say, oh, that's not me. I, I don't say that. I don't need to. Just yesterday, I recorded an episode with Ira Pandey. Mm -hmm. So she related this incident from the early 1980s. Her husband was an IS officer in Chandigarh. And he had committed to going to a party with mm -hmm. her mm -hmm. on the very evening when there was going to be a critical episode in Hamlog when Nanhe was going to die. Mm -hmm. So she was like, I can't go. Nanhe is going to die. And he was like, no, I have already committed. You must come. So uh, he takes her along. And then they go to this party. And she sees that it's all men. So mm -hmm. she says, hey, you brought me to a stack party. I'm taking the driver. I'm going home. I want to watch Nanhe die. Mm -hmm. And uh, then Justin, the host, says, no, 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 madam. All the wives have also come. And then he takes her into this room. And all the women are sitting there mm -hmm. in front of a television. <laughs> and she, she sits with them. <laughs> and they all watch Nanhe die together in that uh, sort of seminal episode of uh, Hamlog. And they all cry together. So when you mention men and women being mm -hmm. in like distinct right. rooms, right. I uh, totally remember that. And if I was at the party, I would have just liked to go out and be away from the men and the women. Right, and I, right. I imagine you would too. Yeah. Let's let's talk about your art. And, uh, you know, you've described yourself elsewhere as you've said you thought of yourself when you were very young as a writer who could draw. Mm -hmm. But later the, uh, the artistic impulse took over more because it was easier to sell in the mm -hmm. marketplace and all of that. But obviously in your mind, there's... I mean, I'm, nothing is primary. Both mm -hmm. of them are things that you did. Mm -hmm. So, you know, with whichever of those journeys you'd like to start on first, take me through that because especially like when it comes to art, I'm just thinking you didn't actually receive any formal training per mm -hmm. se. Mm -hmm. You had to pick up whatever you did partly from instinct and partly from just looking all around you. As you said, your parents were interested in mm -hmm. art. But again, you didn't have the unlimited glories of the internet to feast mm -hmm. on different uh, mm -hmm. uh, sort of... Uh, to, uh, to build an LLM for yourself, as mm -hmm. it were. Mm -hmm. So uh, to take me through, uh, you know, whichever of those journeys you'd like to start with, how you got into it and so on. Right. So 11, 12, 13, when we were in Thailand, was a time when I had much more time to myself than in previous years. And both my sisters were very were gifted. So being able to draw was not considered any big deal. Everyone in my family, I have lots of cousins. I have 33 first cousins. Wow. Do you remember all the names? <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, if I have to. I but I, I know some, I, certainly some families more than others. But most of my, my cousins are also very gifted, very talented. But I, I am one of the very few who has built onto that talent the huge majority who can all paint and write and so on. Haven't done that for a living. Of my larger network of family, one of my, uh, it's not a cousin, but a cousin's daughter is a very well-known painter. But that's very rare. I mean, in that large network, it's she's one of the very few. 
Being able to draw was therefore something that it expresses itself more than writing. But I still have essays that I wrote as a 12-year-old, 11 and 12-year-old, 11-year-old from that school. And I had tremendous <laughs> belief in myself, as I keep saying. It never even occurred to me that there was going, there was any uh, doubt about, uh, you know, I had not heard that writers don't merely write something and then get published, that there was any, any uh, review process. I had no idea of that. I, it just, it just it seemed to me, you know, people have an ability, they produce books, they get published. The idea that there is a struggle um, did not occur to me. And in that sense, art is a little bit easier because it's instant, instantaneous. You can see it, and either it does or it doesn't work. And um, in that sense, it was easier to uh, get a certain kind of attention for ability because, you know, I, I, can, I could draw. And because my uh, sisters and parents had high standards, it wasn't enough to just produce, you know, a, a mark on paper for everyone to gasp and say, oh, my goodness, that's fabulous. No. My mother would say, yeah, but, you know, that it's just, it doesn't work and um, it could be better. And um, there was no easy acceptance. And also, it was not enough ever to just get attention. My my parents were busy. They, the, their social life was extremely intense in Thailand and Iran. So it's not as if they were hovering over me at all. And um, I had a, you know, a huge range of influences to choose from. And I only ever chose from the classic artists of the Euro European world. So if you are measuring yourself against Michelangelo, your standards are going to be high. They're bound to be. So, and that is what I did. I, I, these were my great heroes. I had no time for Picasso. I thought he was a complete worthless type. And it was, it, you know, all the, the impressionists were okay. It took me a while to warm up to Van Gogh. Um, but my favorites were Michelangelo. I used to copy his work uh, to, to get us, you know, to, uh, to get, to get a closeness to that way of seeing. And in that sense, perhaps it's a good thing that there was no internet because then you're, in today's world, it is so easy to get praise. It's so easy to get people to um, admire some very worthless little something that you've done. And I'm, I mean, you know, people feel good. So that's that's great. But my standards are, based on another, a very different norm. And it took a while, of course, to realize that, yes, you might be able to draw, but that doesn't mean you can make a living. That continues to be true. Everyone I meet is, I, I would say, most people acknowledge that I am gifted, but I'm not successful. And I still haven't been Despite having admirers, despite having people who claim to like my work, both as an artist and as a writer, but that that further shore of actual success that is not mine. And at seventy, um, I, I I acknowledge it might never be. That might be true if you define success in a particular conventional way. But if you succeed in doing the kind of work you wanted to do, I guess you're successful and that's the end of it, isn't no, it? No, I don't think so. Don't think no, so. no. How do you define I, success? Uh, I, I think if your success does not, I mean, if you're, let us just look at writing. If your abilities, however much they might be admired, do not actually touch a lot of people, then you have not succeeded. And it's not enough to get a little scattering of praise from people who already like you. If you if you have something to say that goes beyond your own horizon, and I think much of what I do is like that, 
then if I don't find an audience, it is a failure. And it might be my failure. It might also be the failure of the market I'm in. It might be any kind of thing, but it is a failure. And I... uh, uh, the other day, someone was, someone raised the possibility that I'm doing this on purpose. That is, I am on purpose, maintaining a kind of comfortable low. Maybe that's true, but there's uh, you're you're looking a little uh, surprised by that. But what I mean is, there is a certain pleasure in being the forever outsider the one who doesn't ever make it to the inner circle because there's a kind of maverick otherness. Uh, Well, you know, I could say, yeah, maybe. I think you can be a forever outsider and still be successful because I won't define success as making it to the inner circle. Like there's this phrase I first learned from Sam Altman, I think Paul Graham first uh, coined it, and it was in the context of advice to startups. Mm -hmm. But I think it applies to artists as well, and I've certainly embraced it, Mm -hmm. which is that it's better to build something that is loved by a few people than liked by many. And I think in the case of Suki, and of course we'll talk about all your work later, Mm. but in the case of Suki, it certainly strikes me as something that is loved by a few people, perhaps by some definitions, even loved by many people, but may not be an incredible breakthrough. And, and And I can see sort of that sense of what you mean by not successful in this you've spoken elsewhere about how getting there kind of just felt like a failure it just came Mm -hmm. it disappeared and all of that and I understand that and one thing that I also wonder about is you know when I look at all your science fiction work which is you know audacious ideas so well written and and I just wonder whether there's a tremendous streak of luck there also in what we call conventional success Mm -hmm. that you know in a different place and a different time the same books by Margaret Atwood may not have made it Mm -hmm. and she might be just you know one of many and if you're in the right time and the right place you make it and Mm -hmm. as far as mainstream success is concerned it does seem to me that yeah fine you weren't in the right time and the right place Mm -hmm. in those senses but nevertheless I think as far as that phrase which is resonant and means so much to me that it's better to be loved by a few than liked by many you achieved that didn't you yeah (laughs) <laughs> yes. Yeah, so you're successful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I, I'm not. I'm I'm comfortable with where I am, but there is a little dis, you know, a little discontent, <laughs> <laughs> and and that discontent c- pertains to the sense that, in particular, you mentioned uh, the science fiction novels. So there's there are two. One is called Escape, and the other is called The Island of Lost Girls. And I am working on a third because it. it I had, in fact, wanted to write a, a quintet. I don't think I'll make it to a quintet. But trilogy, I think, uh, not I think, I'm working on the third. What I can see of my of the world that I have built so far, and because I know what lies ahead, I think it is an interesting and complex world. And it irritates me that that it hasn't found the uh, never mind market. It hasn't found the audience that would find it interesting, because I think there are a lot of interesting ideas in both books, but especially Island. And there is a certain freedom that comes from knowing that you have an audience that is interested in more. So it's like you're building for an author who has a good audience, then it's like, you know, creating um, uh, stepping stones for yourself. If there's an audience, the stepping stones are in place. For me, I'm always placing my next stepping stone myself, and no one is helping me do that. And there's no sense that there is any, I mean, this is not boohoo, it's just how it is. And I, uh, I mean, there are two kinds of freedoms. One is when there's an avid audience just waiting for the next thing. That can also be a pressure because they want you to say things that they will enjoy. I have nobody waiting uh, uh, feverishly for the next book. A small scattering of people might be interested, but 
Therefore, I am free in one sense, in this other sense. There is no real expectation. I can go anywhere. And I, I know that the next book is going to be very much more challenging because the character who has been a young person in these first two books, that is Meiji, will in the third book have a voice. In these first two books, she hasn't had much of a voice for various reasons. She's been a child, and in the second book, most of the, half the book, she's sort of uh, mute for one reason or the other. But in the third book, she'll be much more independent and will have a lot more to say. And since gender has apparently become one of my, one of my subjects, and about this, I, I have something interesting to say. So, Escape and Island, I refer to it as Island for short, were both written at a time before the terms for transgenderism were common. At the time I wrote them, I had no idea in my mind that I might be regarded as an author who deals with transgender issues. It was never part of my intention. But <clears throat> it is certainly true that in Ireland, in the island of Lost Girls, there are two characters who are, who are actually transgender. They would now be called that. At the time I wrote them, that term was, it may have existed, but would not have occurred to me to use that term. I was contacted by uh, an academic, and um, in, the, in this particular case, he's uh, he editing a, a double volume of essays about transgender science fiction, which seems to be a very, very specific uh, subgenre, but according to him, there's a lot being done. And I was astounded that he got in touch with me because as I said to him, we talked on the phone, I said to him, he's American and his, the, the cache of authors will be from around the world. And I said to him, you, you know, I don't, I, I'm surprised that you asked because I would not characterize either of these two books as being transgender fiction, science fiction. They are science fiction, but okay. He's what he wants me to do is to write the foreword. So this is not the introduction. Introductions are long. Forwards are not long. They, you know, five whatever, two thousand five hundred words, uh, two thousand three thousand words. Um, I said I'm not sure at all that I have the background background for this because I'm not a scholar uh, of uh, transgender studies. Doesn't particularly interest me as a as a subject of study. But now that you mention it, yes, it is true that there are these two characters who are transgender characters. And in that sense, I admit that I have some awareness. But it's awareness outside the field of transgender studies and those interests. So I'm not sure that I'm a good fit. And he said, I think you're a good fit. I think he was saying that in part because... It becomes interesting if a person from a traditional culture, i.e. someone like myself, who is at least on the outside, apparently a cisgender woman, has written two big books, at least the second one is bigger than the first, okay, in which there are characters who are crossing gender norms. And I didn't even know that. I didn't even, I wasn't even particularly conscious that that was what I was doing. But with that in mind, then yes, the third book is certainly going to be very much more conscious of this, the new realities in the outside world. So I'm aware that my work is entering, you know, it is breaking new ground and in some ways, the lack of attention has is freeing. I'm not. There's no one carefully studying what I'm doing and trying to control what I do because very few people are paying attention. 
So I hope you do go on to write that write that quintet. Why only a trilogy? You know, you you're gonna live till one twenty. Oh no uh, no no! You know, I'm I'm do. too old for that. <laughs> you have to be younger to live to one twenty. Well, at least uh, I mean <laughs> long enough to write the quintet. So yeah. let's let's kind of keep that going. No, and I just remembered one thing. So you know the story at the start of the episode are both our memories. Mm-hmm. And when we were discussing this outside, you said that you know in Bombay. Somebody, uh, I inv- invited you to launch the book Escape, but somebody else launched it. Mm-hmm. Well, guess what? So I just went on my blog and I did a couple of mm-hmm. searches, and I realized that I only launched it. <laughs> I'm referring to you and I being in conversation about the book, okay. and I've written a few paragraphs about the book as well over there, and I've linked to Jay Arjun's <laughs> review and Nilanjana's right. piece. And okay. This is like 2008. Okay, good. We have wonderful and memories, both so, of us. Uh, the, the, neither of us remember this. Yeah. That I was in conversation with you at Crossfit right. Camps Corner Weird. about your book. And yeah. neither of us remember this, which is mind blowing to me. Yeah, well, we've obviously been smoking a lot of weed. Yeah, which yeah. is not true. I don't smoke. I I have asthma, so I a kind of asthma, so I can't smoke. Neither can I. In case the authorities are listening, no <laughs> illegal substances have been consumed. And uh, you know, while blogging about that, I found another post I wrote about you, where I quoted from the speech you made, apparently somewhere. Let me see. This was a speech you delivered at a cartoon congress in November two thousand and eight. In Nepal, in Kathmandu. Yes. And uh, this para now strikes me, where you say, "This makes a cartoonist similar to a lion tamer, or as I would put it, a demon tamer. Mm-hmm. Our profession requires us to live with the demon of mortality chained to our drawing boards, mm-hmm. chained to our drawing boards. And every morning we give it a poke in the ribs, make it stand up on the dining table, and sing a silly song for our readers. But the demon does not much like this treatment, so it snarls, claws at us, and in general reminds us." that in the end it will win stop quote and i'm also wondering here about you know what you said earlier about you know the way the way that you learned art you you set high standards you sing mm-hmm. michael angelo and later on of course you did appreciate modern art and all that as you have, as as you've pointed out but there's another quote from getting there uh, parad has struck me and i'll read it out uh, where you say time is also a kind of fuel except that it can't be stored nevertheless i could feel the rolls of unused hours lying in unsightly heaps across the sagging <laughs> belly of my days mm-hmm. in the time that it took my fellow illustrators to complete a whole book i might get one small drawing done I could not force myself to produce anything if I wasn't in the mood and getting into the mood might take hours or days of just lazing about waiting for inspiration to dawn stop quote which is which I identify mm-hmm. with so much because I'm exactly you know I I have hours and hours accumulated just sagging away so my question here is drawing from both of these is that tell me now about that process that f- fine your talented so are many of your cousins mm-hmm. but then you hone it and then you build your ability you turn that talent into ability and i'm sure that requires countless hours of work and then you are actually working professionally you have deadlines sometimes you don't have a choice about what you're going to draw you're given an assignment and you're doing it you know uh, ranjit hoskote would in a recent episode called that sort of thing dancing with chains mm-hmm. which is a phrase that i love so tell me about that aspect of it that you know if we go beyond the art and even beyond the craft in a sense and just talk about sort of the discipline the act of getting sit, sitting down and actually doing stuff what is that like tell me about that journey for you where it goes from being something that you love doing to something that you have to force yourself to do to some extent mm. even if you love it oh very much force <laughs> whip 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 is <laughs> is the term you have to keep a deadline if you want to earn that carrot you have to keep a deadline so there's there's always that sense of needing to finish something so that i can deliver it in the morning was instilled all through the early 20s when i was very much struggling and what what can one say you know it is the same state of mind with which one completes an essay in school you do it you find the time to do it and you do it and you become better and better at finishing certain things i mean one of the i don't draw like that anymore but one of the techniques i taught myself early was what is called stippling where you use a fine a tip pen to make little dots and you with you by varying the thick the the density of the dotting you get dark and light and 
you learn that by seeing other work which is like that and you figure, well, okay, this is how you do it. And you make little dots and you discover that you can get a certain effect. And like I said, because my standards were high, because the people whose work I admired produced very detailed and beautiful work, and I wanted those effects so then my and i had a i had very strong prohibitions about copying work to use i i was very willing as a young child to try and draw from michelangelo's paintings but it would never uh, never occur to me in the sense that i would consider it utterly wrong to copy someone else's drawings and pass them off as my own and if this sounds horribly, you know, uh, sissy, well, that's the kind of person I have always been. I wouldn't do that. And so I would see a certain line work and want to be able to re produce that type of line work. And then it becomes a challenge like anyone who pushes themselves to run a mile or to climb Everest or whatever. Fortunately, I have no ambitions at that level. But just sitting in, in, a, in a room with, with the materials for producing a bit of work, you can do it. And you, once I was drawing my cartoon strip, then all the standards were based on my setting them. And... You learn very quickly how to get something done in time. For instance, when I was drawing Suki, my cartoon strip, very, very quickly I realized that if I put a lot of effort into the first frame, that is, if I draw someone wearing, let us say, a jacket with a, check, a, a checkered design on it, then I have to reproduce that by hand in all three. And... Therefore, you leave the checkered jacket out at once, and you just don't put that in so that you can easily draw another three. And similar, I mean, that's a very simple, straightforward example, but that quickly becomes the way you learn how to do things. I mean, that's what I mean about the learning curve. Within the first strip, I would know, well, I'm not going to be drawing that character again, or else they're not going to be wearing that jacket because it takes too long to draw, and I have to finish it by tonight because I'm delivering it in the morning. So, so you know, that's the, this, for that reason I say that leaving home at 21, when I was 21, and supporting myself without having a clear notion of what that would require from me, Again, this is because I didn't have examples ahead of me. No one, There was no one to tell me, no, it's very hard to do that, just don't do it. As a result of that, I thought, well, people in the West do it, so I can do it, not realizing that, no, it's not really the same. It's not the same because the societies are very different. For instance, living as a paying guest in Bombay, it just so happened that I didn't for the first one or two, in the first one or two places, I wasn't even thinking about food because for whatever reason I was eating at work or I was eating at my sister's house. But in one, at some moment, I realized uh, we had lost our cook. The, there was no cook in the house and my landlady went out to work. And I realized, oh, well, I might actually have to buy and make food myself. I'd never done that. I'd never really done that. And at most I could make a sandwich, but I had no interest in making food. And I hadn't, you know, I'd, I, I I, didn't really know. I, Of course, this, this, when I say don't know, it's also a willful lack of knowledge. It's an unwillingness to find out. Now you really sound like a man. <laughs> <laughs> but... You know, it's true of anyone who grows up in a kind of privileged way. Mm. I read just the other day, I read a book uh, charmingly titled How Not to Boil an Egg. Wow. And it's by a woman who was a very lovely, charming woman called Mary Newman. She was born in India, many stories. But as she tells the reader, as a young uh, married woman uh, returning to England after spending many years in India, when she was placed in a situation where thrown in amongst other 
women who are all running a some kind of I forget what was the, some reason for which she was told, oh, you just go and you know boil some eggs. Well, she uh, she guessed that you put the egg in a pan of water and you put the the pan on the heat, and it'll cook. But she had never seen this being done and had therefore no idea that when water boils, it, uh, it, it bubbles. And she thought that, oh my God, something terrible is happening and turned it off. And of course, the egg was not cooked. And I, I saw, I recognized uh, a little portion of myself there because whereas I, I, had, I had a similar experience in that I knew that the difference between a fried egg and a boiled egg was that one was made in water and the, oh, no, not boiled, but a poached egg. They look sort of vaguely the same, but the uh, poached egg is made in water. And I knew how to fry an egg, but someone had asked me to make a poached egg and had not, you know, there was, they were running out of time and they just wanted the egg. And... <clears throat> I knew that it would be a bit odd, for a bit awkward for me to ask how about a poached egg. And so I figured it's nothing, you know, boil the water, put the water on the pan on the fire, just like this lady, put the pan on the fire. I knew it would bubble. That much I knew. But I broke the egg into the water and immediately realized, no, the egg has now disappeared. I don't see any part except the yolk. I, I can see the yolk, but no white. And it. I was wondering how how do cooks make the white become nice and firm, and you know, a little a little bundle of white around the. And of course, it doesn't happen. You have to make it happen. There's a way to do that, but I only realized that a thousand years later. So these this lack of sufficiency was something that. It's not, you know, it's not casual. It's not, it doesn't just happen. You don't, those people who want to be practical, who want to know how to, how to survive, they learn quickly. I did not learn quickly because it was never a priority. It's not something I wanted to do. And I think being able to cook is marvelous. I, I would, um, I admire people who can and I, I regret that I'm incompetent, but there we are. I am. I can. I am very much more accomplished now than I used to be. Do you poach eggs or on regular <laughs> basis? I don't go down that path at all. Scrambled eggs are good. <laughs> on on that note, let's take a quick commercial break, and on the sure. other side of the break, we'll talk more about sure. uh, different kinds of okay. eggs. Hey, the music started and this sounds like a commercial, but it isn't. It's a plea from me to check out my latest labor of love, a YouTube show I am co-hosting with my good friend, the brilliant Ajay Shah. We've called it Everything is Everything. Every week, we'll speak for about an hour on things we care about, from the profound to the profane, from the exalted to the everyday. We range widely across subjects and we bring multiple frames with which we try to understand the world. Please join us on our journey and please support us by subscribing to our YouTube YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Amit Varma, A-M-I-T-V-A-R-M-A. The show is called Everything is Everything. Please do check it out. Welcome back to The Scene and the Unseen. I'm chatting with Manjula Padmanabhan. And, uh, you know, we have just about reached what you described as the struggling years, your years of struggle or something of that mm. sort, where, you know, you leave home at 21 and now you have to create art for money, which sounds so delightfully romantic. Yeah, but not at all. Tell me a bit more about what mm. those years actually involved in terms of, you know, how did you start? How did well, you approach Well, if we look at those years, so that was 21, I was in Bombay and living in a paying guest accommodation. And um, it's funny, at this moment, I cannot easily remember which of the various ones. I I do believe it was in, um, yes, it, it was in Kolaba. And I I had lived for two and a half, three years in a hostel called the Working Women's Hostel in Kolaba. And then after that, I went to a paying guest accommodation close by, and that is the location of getting there. 
So those years t- from 21, 20, 21 to 25 were, I would say, the peak years of struggling with meeting deadlines, which were hard to meet because of my the, the slow pace of, of work. You know, I knew that, for instance, Amar Chitra Katha, cartoonists, comic artists, they they earned 125 rupees a page, but they were able to put out that page quickly. If I had to draw a page of, uh, you know, dotting and very carefully drawn and so on, I would take a whole week to produce one page, and that wouldn't work because they had to, obviously you get 125 rupees a page for, this was many, many years ago, I'm sure it's much more now, but you have to finish the whole comic. You don't do one page at a time. So I knew that I couldn't go down that path. And at the time, you know, I was, uh, I think that was the era in which I'm, I drew a book called Tales of Birbal, which was 64 pages in color, with 54 pages of which were in in print, and so 54 pages of text in a 64-color page book meant that the publisher wanted color on every page, but there actually wasn't that much space for drawing. And the way I worked out that book, which was my first full book that I was supposed to be designing and drawing and filling and even doing the paste-up, for that entire work... I was going to be paid 5,000 rupees. And I remember it as I remember it with particular bitterness because I took maybe eight or nine months. And at the end of it, all I was going to get was 5,000. I had paid a lot of money just to get bromides to make uh, repeating designs and all kinds of things. I knew that this was not working that it was, uh, and yet I couldn't get out of it. You know, I just had to I'd put in so much work. So for me, those years were the years of maximum um, difficulty in attempting to make a living from my work. Then I went to Holland for, I mean, I went to the U.S., um, Germany, and Holland for what became eventually was written up in getting there many years later. So going to Holland and that entire episode, uh, going to the U.S. and then to Europe, was about nine months. It was a whole nine-month um, cycle of um, it was a little more than that, probably a whole year. And it really changed my sense of self. I would say that was... the. Whenever I'm talking about my life, which seems to happen a great deal these days, this is another feature of being (laughs) older. You know, there's a lot of life to talk about, and people are starting to ask questions about, so what did you, how did you, etc. So I would say that I very frequently talk about turning points. There have been very many turning points, important beachheads. I would say that uh, the trip to Holland was a huge beachhead because of all the things that I had attempted to do before going to, I say going to Holland, but it's, as I said, it's, um, it's it was a much longer trip. It was to the U.S. for four months, and then I went to Germany. I spent a month there, and then three or four months in Holland. And because of the... Uh, purpose of this trip was very vague it was the it was not that i had an overwhelming ambition to get a certain something done i wanted out i wanted to break out of whatever life i was in i seemed to be quite happy i had a boyfriend who was very very nice a very good person but I could see that he, both he and the world around me was conspiring to make it look like a marriage. And I was dead keen to not marry. And specifically not marry in, well, it, you know, I, at, in that, at that age, it was, I was not in a position to say I didn't want a particular kind of not marriage. <laughs> <laughs> I just knew that 
it's not what I wanted, and yet I liked him, I liked being with him, I liked the life we had together, but I didn't want it to change. And I could see that it has to change, I, that I was realistic enough to see that it couldn't remain where it was because it wouldn't be, f I have to say it this way, it wouldn't be fair to him. And what I wanted was not clear. I He, he knew of my ambitions about uh, a shortened life and so on, but like everyone, he assumed that that was some kind of childhood joke. And when looking back, yes, it was. <laughs> but for me, it didn't work. It didn't work that he, he being an extremely nice person, wanted a standard nice life. And I didn't want that. I didn't want a nice life in that way, in quote, quotes, nice. I didn't want a nice life. I wanted an interesting or dangerous or exciting. But all of this within the fact that I am a comfort-loving, lazy person who is not interested in trekking across the Himalayas or anything like that. I wanted a comforting life, a comfortable life, but not the standard life. I did not want a respectable two-bedroom apartment with 3.5 children. And, you know, I didn't want any of that. As I said, I didn't want children at all. So I didn't want to be in any way connected to someone whose family, however nice, and they were very nice, would kind of expect that. And if we didn't have that, then it would everyone would look a little bit sad. I didn't want any of that. So I needed I needed something extreme to lever me out of a particular groove. And that's what going to Holland in that extremely irregular way did. It's the fact is I went without telling my family where I was going. I had very little, as all of this is written in the book, I had very little money. I had a one-way visa, and that that expired very quickly. So then after a while, I was in Holland without a visa. And being from a foreign service background, I was very conscious that this is, a in quotes, a bad thing, and that and people who get discovered in countries where they don't, for which they don't have a visa will then be, in quotes, deported. And all of these, you know, this like, I, I come from enough of a respectable background that all of this was terrifying for me, and yet I did it. I did it because I couldn't argue my way around the imponderables of my life and and it has to be said i had also in the maybe 2 years before the whole holland experience i had read carlos castaneda and if you have read carlos castaneda so then it's so what i read was journey to ixatlan and i read that while on board a train from bombay to madras and in those days, I used to take the Dadar Madras Express. I would always contrive to whatever my actual seat was, I would exchange with anyone to seat to be on the upper bunk. And then I would just stay there for the entire 20 whatever, 21 hours or whatever it was, and just kind of chill. And um, on that occasion, I was reading uh, Carlos Castaneda from Dadar to Madras, and it it was by the time I got off the train, it was I was no longer my feet were no longer on the ground. I was I I was barely able to talk straight because I was in a. It was not I was not on any drugs, but I might as well have been. My mind was completely blown away. I was in another dimension. I was no longer seeing things the same way, and it was because of being so altered by that book. The sense of needing to leave everything to, and also to to leave things. In, in an unplanned way, which is what that book suggests we have to do if we want to learn. And my friends, my, the two Dutch guys that I met in Bombay, whom I then used as my reference point to get to Holland, 
they had also read Journey to Ixitlan. So we were both on this, we all three were on this other dimensional journey. And it seemed the right and proper. So it's very hard to explain that for the purposes of the world around me, everything that I was planning to do, which I didn't, of course, I didn't reveal, was completely wrong because I was lying to people about where I was going. I was betraying the trust of my friends, my family, to go completely outside the boundary of what is known. But if you look at what I was, I had been reading, then I was doing exactly the right thing. That I was, I was running blindly along the, that is in total darkness. I was running along the edge of a cliff and being, it's not, it's not trust. It is you 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 run in the dark along the edge of a cliff, heedless and unafraid of the consequences. And maybe you'll fall. And maybe you won't. But you run without fear. The whole point is without fear. And if you are brought up in an middle class, upper middle class atmosphere, you live with fear the whole time that your car will not come, that you'll miss your flight, that you'll fail your exams or whatever. So you're you're continuously you're brought up in a constant cauldron of various vague fears and you 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 know, you cross each one of these like hurdling hurdling not high hurdles, you just get through everything pretty much because you can. And you choose your hurdles in these lives and you you don't really test yourself. That is the whole feature of middle class life. You think you're being tested, but you're not. What I was doing was going outside the hurdle field altogether to places where there are no hurdles, but where you don't know anything. I mean, there are no cars to, there are no trains to catch, you are just in the kind of vague abstract of doing, in quotes, what you want to do. Then you are faced with this issue, what do you want? I think that is the whole point of what I did in Holland by going to Holland. I was stuck with, okay, I've got what I wanted. I have traveled um, away from my entire family. They don't know where I am. For three months, my family didn't know where I was, and I wasn't communicating with them. They didn't realize that. I mean, they didn't realize that they didn't actually know where I was. They thought I was in Germany, but I wasn't. And having done that, then I I faced the this ultimate question: What is this really? What I want is this is this okay? And if it's not okay, then I have to fix it. But how do I fix it? I don't have the means, and. Uh, it was because there was, it was very much like the high trapeze without a net, which is, which is, of course, very Carlos Castaneda. That's the whole issue. If you have a net, then it's not working. You have to fly without the net. And to the extent that people like me who are still in, you know, st I could just make a call to my sister. I could. So it's not as if there was no net, not really, but it felt like there was none. And it, for all practical purposes, there wasn't because I was stubborn and obstinate enough not to call. I only called when three and a half or four months had passed and it was getting cold and I had finally sold something. I sold an, a poster and made a little bit of money, not a huge amount, but I made some money. And that gave me the confidence to say, well, you know, if I want, I could stay here and do this, but I'm not going to. <laughs> I'm going to. I've I've proved a point. I've made everyone terribly uncomfortable in the house that the the family with whom I stayed, they were not happy with me, but we we made we built our bridges. We made up. By the time I left, we had all made up and we were smiling at one another again. And I was friendly with the younger brother of the person that I chased after to get to Holland. And that friendship, this is actually now I'm, I'm crossing a lot of time, that friendship has remained solid. I have remained friendly with that younger brother. And it has, I mean, we didn't communicate for 20 years or something, but just 
like four years ago, we got in touch. We we've, we've talked. We've they're still living. He's still living in that house, and it's fabulous to be in touch. That's a Simon character. Yes, the Simon character. He has read Getting There. He and his wife both love it, and he's still living in that house. And has said, you know, come back and stay with us again, and we have a good toilet this time. <laughs> Towards the end of your book, you have these memorable lines, quote, the sense of, and, and before I read this out, I must uh, give a little bit of context to the listener that uh, somewhere at the start of the book, somebody asks you what your favorite animal is and you say tiger. Mm. So the quote is, the sense of being in some fundamental way, a loner and an outsider to humanity never left me, but I don't feel oppressed or caged in by circumstances in the same way as I used to. I don't test the bars. I don't try to run away. I draw and I write. I breathe. Sometimes when the jungle is quiet, my whiskers feel shiny and I purr. Stop. Good. Beautiful lines. And Thank you. My, my sense of reaching the end of the book is that this person may not even now really know who she is or what she wants, but she knows who she is not and what she doesn't want. Mm -hmm. And in a sense that there is some kind of liberation there as well. Is that an accurate way of... I would, think, I would say so, absolutely. Because I really broke very many boundaries by not just pretending to go away, but actually going away. And certainly at a certain level, putting myself in a certain type of danger. Um, it may all seem, you know, very minor at, at this distance of time. And even when I was in Holland, at one point I was talking to someone who was not a, a friend, a much older man who was the friend of a friend, an, an American who was in Holland for some reason or the other, I forget what. And... I said, you know, I'm really outside, living far from my family, and, you know, I'm on a kind of adventure. And he sort of, uh, he, we had talked enough that he, he could make the statement that he made. He laughed, he gave a kind of dry chuckle, and he said, you know, you went to an elite finishing school, you went to college, you're you're traveling for a few months away from your family, staying with a well-heeled Dutch family. It's nothing. <laughs> <laughs> you're doing nothing. <laughs> and he put me in my place and I I you know I it it uh, was um, one of many little slaps I received from life to show me that yeah it, it is nothing <laughs> compared to what happens and it, I mean in the world since then you know I have reminded myself again and again compared to what refugees are facing around the world and people in war zones and children who who uh, are damaged by blasts and who lose all their everything their parents their family and are left on the road what have i faced nothing you know is nothing and all the so-called discomforts that we might face because the power is off for 20 hours big deal <laughs> i have a roof i have i'm overweight i don't i'm not worrying you know about my next step so most of us when we complain it's about nothing and my little adventure to holland was was frightening for me it was a challenge but even at the time through little reminders such as this person who said this to me, the realization that it's very little compared to what what challenges people can face and do face. And and then, you know, to come back from that was it was tremendously uh releasing to come back from that, not to not to run away so efficiently that I would no longer be the same person. I came back to the same life in some ways, but also in many other ways, a very, very different life. And because I had actually done something, I had broken something. It was, I was, I had, it's like the difference, I'm guessing, because of course I was not in the military. It's like the difference between being play acting, being a soldier, and then being out in the in in a battlefield. You come back changed, and in that sense, I had really done something that 
other people of my uh, class, I have to use that uh, reference, would not do. And you could say that I wasn't very damaged. Uh, nothing terrible happened to me. I didn't get raped or I didn't become pregnant or get... I. The, it's like the big three terrors that people have, getting pregnant or raped or uh, catching a venereal disease. None of these things happened. And you could say then that... I mean, people reading Getting There have, to my amusement and amazement, said... Nothing much happens. And I think, yeah, if you if you expect that the, the something that happens has to be some dreadful misfortune, well then yes. It no no terrible misfortune over overcame me. But I would say that psychologically and um soci- philosophically, I think a very great deal happened. And that I I um challenged myself i i in many ways i wagered my whole life and the the wholesomeness of my previously very middle class life in a way that was foolhardy but in the castaneda sense i had to do i had to it was not a choice in that sense I had to do it in order to be in the castaneda sense a warrior that's what he talks about to be a warrior. And in that sense, I did that. You know, I will vehemently disagree with anyone who says nothing happened in the book. A, a, a lot happened, but in a sense, you're comparing you to Shekhov because an early criticism of Shekhov was that nothing happens in his stories. <laughs> so, like, well done getting there. My, my, my sense of reading that book was that it's a very unusual kind of journey because it, it seemed to me that this protagonist was... It wasn't that she was looking for something and not finding it. It was that she didn't know what to look for, Mm. that she was just adrift. And in a sense, when the book ends, she is still adrift, but in a different place and in a better place. So, you know, one, is that reading correct? And two, when you sort of came back to Bombay, how did you view yourself at this point? Because on the surface, I'm guessing it would appear that, oh, you went away for a while and you come back and you're doing the same thing. You're living in PGs, you're doing illustrations. But, you know, what had kind of changed within you? Well, the biggest thing that changed was that I knew that the relationship with the boyfriend, whom I still was very fond of, he's a very nice person, was over. You're still friends with him? No. We meant what we what I said to him was, we can stay friends, but I'm fundamentally different, and I won't talk about what happened on this trip. And he said, I won't ask. Fair enough, and you know, thank you. But I said, let's give it a year. If at the end of a year, to the date, we can't make it work then it's goodbye. And it was exactly to the date, a year. And we said, okay, here it is. And it is goodbye. And by then, I think he was ready to go. And I was sad, but also ready. Sad because it's a tremendous comfort to have a partner. And I acknowledge that. I like having a partner, but it couldn't be the two of us. And it was a hard reset, like in computers. It was goodbye and over, out, nothing. And I think that left him free. And it left me free as well because I don't have regrets. He went on to have a happy life. And I I know that because my sisters remained friendly with him and stayed in touch and have they maintained a relationship. I don't I don't feel that need. And being changed, being no longer partnered, uh, you know, in a year after returning, hugely changed my my approach to the world because right up from say 21 to 25 I was with this person and but uh, you know a year and a half I was away so and then another year we were in this twilight so 
after, so that was from 26. And, you know, the clock was ticking. 30 was coming up, four years away. <laughs> <laughs> so I was in that mood of, okay, I'm now loose in my shell and I can think about what to do next. But, you know, what happens as time moves along is that if you're gathering, you know, some rolling stones roll and gather moss. So I was gathering a lot of moss in the way of abilities. I could be going to Holland, coming back from there and the work whatever in quotes work because I hardly sold anything but just that one poster. But I had produced a lot of ideas and other types of work, other types of uh, personality. And the sense of having something to offer was growing. And again, this this will sound as if it's rehearsed and it is because I have what I'm about to say I've said many times. When I say that I wanted to die at 30, it was because at 17, I felt a kind of no-person uh, self. You know, I didn't... It. I was all potential, and I hadn't done very much. What happened at 30 when I knew I was actually not going to pull the cord on myself? I had, in a very deep way begun to like myself. I didn't want to die because I liked myself. And it was a very genuine and very warm and comforting feeling that I I felt I was worth the expense of staying alive. And it was it was a great feeling. It wasn't a sense of defeat. Oh, my God, you know, I made this plan and now I've now not followed through. <laughs> what a failure. But I didn't. I felt I found something. I found a reason to be alive, which, of course, many people scream about how they don't have a, you know. But I I discovered I, I liked myself. So I was happy to continue breathing. What did you like about yourself? I thought it was a nice person. And interesting, and I had done some stuff, and that I had something to share, I mean, my ideas, and that I was, I had genuinely managed to live an interesting life already, you know, at 30. And I had understood that 30 is nothing. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's very young. And, and that I uh, felt that I had uh, more to offer. So it was a, a nice feeling, and it was not a pat on the head from anyone else. It was from fate. And, you know, that childhood sense of confidence that, you know, many children as children are very confident, and what happens in puberty is this terrible battering down of all your peers and the bullies that you meet in school, and they all batter you down. And then, of course, because you, your body changes and you, you begin to look like your adult self, and that may or may not uh, conform to whatever society tells you should look like. So it can really burst your bubble and make you feel little and small and so on and so forth. So what happens in what I, the character says in getting there about not knowing what, what my true appearance is, and how that can really change and and damage in some ways a person's ability to relate to the world. Well, by the time I was 30, I was very much more confident. I re recovered the sense of a childhood confidence that I don't I don't have to care what people think of me. Once more I was in that zone, you know, whatever I had felt in parts in the intervening years. I recovered that sense of ease that I I am sufficient and I don't have to look outside myself for a referent. So at this point, I want to sort of go back to the subject of your art and how it was evolving. Hmm. Uh, you mentioned elsewhere that 
earlier than this you worked for a while in farsiana and that was uh, you know formative for you mm-hmm. in terms of things like attention to detail and other aspects of the craft it was much more than formative it was the first actual job i had and i was just i was out of school but still in college and when i was recruited for parsiana not farsiana Sorry. but parsiana and it is a small magazine aimed at the parsi community and when when i started with it it was it had just changed ownership to a very a dynamic and very idealistic journalist called jahangir patel who came who came from in the sense that he had studied in the uh, done a degree in the us but more than anything else he had been impressed with a uh, classic american style journalism of the old school which is very ide- idealistic and very austere in a certain way and he wanted to bring that training and that idealism to india and to well to certainly to bombay and ultimately he found that the only way he could continue to be the person he wanted to be and the kind of journalist he wanted to be was by owning his own in this it turned out to be a small magazine but within that small magazine he maintained a universe of of uh, high standards now if you are very young and and i was uh he wasn't he was in this i forget i don't, don't know maybe early 30s or something like that i forget but i and the two other people working for him were very young and impressionable yes up to a point but more than anything else it was the um the experience of working with someone who was very focused on what he wanted and it was never enough to just produce something that passed muster it had to reach, reach some very high um uh standard of excellence regardless of the fact we were a tiny magazine with you know a minute um and very focused community focused um readership nevertheless he kept us to a very high standard now the other two people one i mean we all did this all the we all performed all the tasks we stuck labels we went to the press to read proof and it, these were the days of lead type so linotype and zinc plates and so on but we all did all those things but i was the only one who could draw so at very early on he wanted little drawings in his magazine because it seemed to suit his uh, un- his knowledge of what makes what makes an uh, gives a character to a magazine so i still have the drawings i did uh, in those early days and you can see within maybe a couple of weeks a couple of months the change from very kind of you know vague unfocused drawings to a, a kind of snap uh, into focus and it was because he couldn't draw but he knew what he wanted to see and my favorite story on this subject is how uh, he wanted a caricature of himself so a little caricature a small thing but 2 inches high and you know 2 inches by one column so it's a tiny thing and he wanted to show himself wearing the traditional parsi undershirt called a sadra and needless to say i'm not parsi so needless to say i did not particularly know what that looked like so he took a shirt off in the in the office he took a shirt off and showed me what it is a a, a muslin uh, undershirt like a like a vest but muslin and it's held there's a waist a cord around the waist which is called a kasti and a child who's entering the parsi religion when they have their first what would be a kind of first communion they are taught how to tie that it's a reef knot and they i then did a drawing and when i showed it to him his remark was the stitching is wrong now the drawing is only <laughs> two inch high and the idea that i i could improve the stitching the detail of the stitching on this shirt was hilarious but as soon as i did it i realized of course he's right and and it certainly looks better and it certainly looks more precise and the the thing is 
working for someone who, as I said, he couldn't draw, but he had a very keen eye. His ability to appreciate, his willingness to appreciate something finally done was a huge uh, source of inspiration for me. It helped me to, to home in on a standard that I also could appreciate. If he had been the kind of person who said, yeah, yeah, whatever, I, it would have produced whatever work. And in the larger world outside, I soon realized that people outside in the other world, outside of Parsiana's very cloistered atmosphere, people were often telling me, there's too much detail here. This is too much, you know, we don't need that. And and the sense of I was putting much more time and effort and energy into things that were not desired, were not required by the people asking for my work. And then they didn't ask for it because clearly the time and energy I put into it, they weren't going to be paying for that and they didn't want to. And another very telling moment in my youthful life when I was doing some, maybe a couple of years later, I was writing a column for Eve's Weekly, and at that at that time, the uh, um, editor—I mean, she was assistant editor, so she was in—you know, she was commissioning. So she asked me. Her name was uh, the well-known author called Amu Joseph. She uh, commissioned me to write a column, and I had a page to myself and a little cartoon. And at the time she commissioned me, it, I for, now I've forgotten what, let us just say it was 500 rupees for the page. And after three months, it was once a month, so after three months, her her general ed or whatever, the publisher called up angrily and said, I see that you're paying some contributor 500 rupees for a page, but 500 is what we paid for three pages. Why are you paying some one person? And she said, oh, but that person is also doing a, a, a drawing. He said, drawing? And she told me this. He said, drawing? But that's just 10 rupees. <laughs> and it's instead of being insulted, what that told me was how very low in the, in the value system of the world I was in, was the worth of a drawing. He was not at all interested in the drawing itself. It could be a bus ticket as far as he was concerned. It is that he didn't want to pay more than 10 rupees for it because it didn't have worth for him. And it, it had, the, more importantly, the realization was for people in the publishing business the pages of the magazine with creative work, that's just ad revenue, which is being wasted on creative work. And it, if they could only fill it entirely with ads, that would that they would prefer that, but then no one would buy it, just read ads. So they've got to, how boring, put in some creative work. And that is just to support the ads which are between. So it cleared my understanding of what what people's values, what the values of the world were. And it also gave me a, a clear impression of what I was up against, that there was there was no, no interest in the quality of work, whatever I did outside of the hallowed halls of Parsiana. Parsiana was, uh, was um, um, from a single room or two rooms in a small establishment, in the fort area. So it was very central, but a small place. But what we experienced there in the way of high quality was streets ahead of everything outside in the much bigger corporations and uh, magazines and newspapers. So it was a tremendous education for me, the education I didn't get in, in any college. I got from this one person because he... he um, channeled my willingness to improve because I knew I could I knew I could but I am as I said I keep saying I'm lazy I would never have made the effort if I didn't know that there was somebody wanting something better 
So here's a question, but before the question, an anecdote about one of my favorite tweets of all time. Mm -hmm. There's a person on Twitter called Derek Guy. Mm -hmm. He's known as a menswear expert, basically. I think his handle is Dye Workwear. I'll link it from the show notes. <laughs> so he will pick random photographs and get really finicky about them and also give a lot of lectures on fashion and it's very illuminating. So at one point, there was some random right-wing guy who had become very popular in Britain, some 24-year-old, who was po who posted a picture of himself in a, what he claimed was a bespoke suit. Okay. So Derek Guy took the picture and pointed out with some detail in mm -hmm. why it is not a bespoke suit, mm -hmm. obviously. Mm -hmm. Now, the other person then put out a tweet in response to that mm -hmm. and said, no, that, you know, it is a bespoke suit just because you disagree with with my politics, you are, you know, criticizing a poor tailor somewhere. And Derek Guy's classic tweet, the response mm. was, I got my info from your tailor and from the photos you posted. I called him to ask him about his process. <laughs> like he actually called this guy's yes. tailor. Right. And what he discovered, uh, you know, the, the flaws that he pointed out, mm. how he realized it's not a bespoke suit, mm. was how the lapel was stitched on from the stitching. So yeah. when you said stitching, yes, stitching. <laughs> I thought about that detail and I just kind of loved that so that so much and I just really respect people who care about detail that much and here's my question to you that and, and there are two aspects of this one is you point out that you know, you speak about the going to the presses and the lead uh, sort lead of type. the lead type, the linotype, etc., mm -hmm. etc. All of, uh, and how you all of you had to immerse yourself in that as well. And you also speak about uh, you know then Jahangir's attention to detail and to the finer things. And I want to ask you about the importance of these in developing you as an artist because today often there is an impression that w with so much computer aid and all that, you can take a lot of shortcuts which earlier were not possible. Mm -hmm. In one way, it is good. You are you might cut out some drudge work so you focus on higher order creativity. But in another way, I think it's a problem that only when you go through all the rigor of, you know, these sort of hard yards, I think they, they play a formative role in make helping you understand your art and your form a little better. Mm. And both that, immersing yourself in uh, these brass tacks, both that and also that attention to detail, give you a sense of values. And mm -hmm. then if you have a sense of values that creates a virtuous cycle, mm -hmm. where throughout your life, you are applying the same rigor to something. Mm -hmm. Like my guess is that, you know, once Mr. Patel gave you that sense of values, that mm -hmm. details matter, the stitching matters, for the rest of your life, you are looking at the stitching. Yes. And that is making you a better artist. Mm -hmm. So, Tell me a little bit about how your values as an artist kind of uh, developed and what they were. Well, it's exactly as you said, a sense of uh, worth built up because uh, as as I, you know, as I have said in several different ways, I already had a very <laughs> <laughs> sense of self-worth. Jahangir definitely broke it down and made me aware of how completely minor I was and the willingness to make the effort to do to get his approval was important, but very soon it was not. I mean, there was a wonderful. We had a, a lady called Minnie Botwala who was a wonderful designer. She was older than any of us, but she had a tremendous sense of design and getting approval from people who had high standards was very attractive. Very worthy of working towards and what going forward what that did for me was this is yet another example of I didn't pay attention to people who told me they liked my work if I could see that what else the other things they liked were rubbish so then it would make no difference I mean if they if it makes no difference to them why should I bother but the, the two other editors who had a huge impact on my life were, um, unfortunately, are both no longer with us. One is Daryl DeMonte, who was a wonderful editor at the Times of India. And the other, of course, is the greatly beloved Vinod Mehta. And they were both people who, who had a keen eye for the visual world. This is the thing that many editors don't have. They haven't kind of vague views about, they leave that to the designer. 
But these were two people who who liked the visual world. And Daryl was, he, he asked, you know, he commissioned a number of illustrations for the Sunday magazine. And he liked the fact that I didn't go take a literal path, that I, I worked with ideas. I was able to give a visual dimension to an idea that was being sought. And later on, when I worked with uh, Vinod Mehta, for, for, who uh, bought um, Suki from me, the, he was my first editor for Suki, he never looked, he never even glanced at Suki. He let me do it. Once he had accepted that I, I had a strip to make, he gave me the space and just let me do it. And I, I had the sense that if I ever did something inappropriate, eventually I would hear about it from him or from some lackey. But it never happened. And the sense of being uh, trusted with that space, it was almost a quarter page of the newspaper, that is for Suki, was tremendously um, encouraging. And I think one of the points made in by the doctor at the diet clinic, he, you know, to go to that diet clinic, you had to do some kind of personality test, and then supposedly they would f find a, a path that would suit each each patient. In my case, I think what he realized was that I was the kind of patient who did not want to be told what to do. So that principle colored many other areas of my life, that I preferred to be trusted with a particular responsibility and then be allowed to just do it. And I think the understanding was I would find my level and that I would maintain that because I liked to do it. It's not that I wanted to get away with whatever. I never did. And when I saw the work of other artists like, say, at Amar Chitra Katha, which, uh, as it happens, I detest Amar Chitra Katha. I mean, the artists who work for, who have worked for it, for the, for ACK, as they call it, they do a great job. But it's the kind of work that I would never want to do because it's so lacking in, what can I say, culturally and sociologically detailed, uh, focused detail. It's not, you know, it's, it's the exact opposite. They're aiming for something general. And that generalness, you know, if everyone looks kind of pale and they're pale-skinned and general hair, general build, everyone looks sort of vaguely the same, except if they are villains and they're dark-skinned. All that complete lack of any ideology, which comes from above, it's from the publishing house, and also aimed at an audience which is also unconcerned about issues. Well, I was, uh, I would not have been able to, I would not have been happy at that kind of job. But of course, I was not feeding a family, I was not having to do something because I had to earn a living. And I became very conscious that if I if I was taking liberties with how much I earned, it was also because I didn't have to be terribly responsible. But the the you know the tuning of the work, which is you're trying to get at process, all I can tell you is that I would I wanted to maintain a certain standard just for myself, and I happened to work for people who appreciated that. So, you know, the saddest part of getting there for me, the saddest part was the details of the diet. Because today we know that eight meals instead of three is a disaster. <laughs> that, that that whole dogma of small frequent meals mm -hmm. as being, you know, healthy for you is terrible. It is exactly the opposite. You get an <laughs> insulin spike every time you meet, eat anything. So today mm -hmm. we kind of know that, you know, intermittent fasting is a way to go. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and um, oh my God, I read about it eight meals a day. And I said, this character is not going to lose weight sustainably, which, <laughs> you know, through well, the book. Well, she didn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
we spoke about that early part of your 20s hmm. uh you know up till the point that you know you're a freelance illustrator you're a pg then that trip happens then you end your relationship over a period of time and you're still kind of an illustrator doing the things that you're doing tell take me through the rest of your 20s up till that important <laughs> year of 30 <laughs> yeah <laughs> well there was a big turning point again so that second i mean one of many turning points was a huge turning point was when i was invited to go to bhutan to illustrate a series of of um english language textbooks so the deal was this there was a british educator he was a very much an alternative thinker and kind of uh, he had alternative alternative views on education living in a village outside bangalore with his family he had earned a name quite a, a, a reputation for himself his name was david hosborough he was very well known as an um unconventional but very creative thinker in education um in educational circles and oxford university press had a deal with david hosborough which involved a grant from the british government to the bhutan government using indian talent to illustrate and one can just imagine the worth of it uh, to the british government and the and oup because an indian talent meant it didn't have to cost as much as a british talent mm-hmm. would so you know when one can just imagine why uh, this particular triangular relationship developed now i was introduced to david through a friendship i had a very warm friendship i had with the artist anjali ilamenen and we became friends because i used to write reviews i wrote a review for one of her shows she liked my review and we became friends and because of that friendship she introduced me to david who was connected to her again this some this i know what the connection is but anyway a very warm close connection between them and one thing led to another and i went to bhutan uh in 19 19- 81 and it was a huge um watershed for me in a, again in part because it took me out of my my familiar range and i was away i was supposed to be away for one month but oup in its wisdom did not send me a manuscript and to illustrate they sent me there in order to work on the manuscript that they would send me they never sent me an, a manuscript and they said oh you can use the previous one and then we'll make changes and i thought that was completely idiotic and from the time that i was in bhutan i spent four months there eventually and i lost any interest in who was paying for my trip as far as i was concerned i was having a wonderful time because i was in this unusual and beautiful place and more than anything else it was a vision of otherness it was an asian country but so different and i had been exposed to buddhism in uh, thailand but this was mahayana buddhism which was so other it was so transcendent it was so full of light and it it may sound like some kind of hippy crazy stuff but it really it was like the another kind of castaneda it was it just blew open my mind and i remember the moment of transition as you can see this happens kind of often so when i arrived in bhutan I was tired I was sneezing I was um immediately uh, bitten by a, a million fleas I had burnt my hand in the in the transit hotel in between and reached there in a very bad mood and feeling that sense of where have I come why have I come why am I doing this and all of this and in two weeks I transited to a state where if the um room boy had not brought a 
tea, a tray of tea at four o'clock, which is when I might have asked for it, instead of calling angrily and saying, but where's the tea? I would call and say, is the football game over? And do you have time to bring the tea? And that was the state of things in that, both in that hotel and in that country. You just don't bother to get angry. That's so, you know, ridiculous. They're playing a game and, uh, you know, the waiters are playing a game and they will come when they're ready. And it was such a transcendental shift from every other thing that I had known about how to be. And another great moment of rev revelation was, you know, in the in the both in the plains and in most other countries if you you there is a convention of uh, polite smiling you say hello you grin you whatever you say i'm so glad to be in your country and they say yes it's wonderful to have you or whatever it is and these are all completely and utterly hypocritical nonsensical statements that you just make to be polite well what i noticed in bhutan was that nobody ever bothered with that <laughs> They didn't smile at you out of just out of politeness. They, there was never any polite smiling. It was like a completely uh, solemn s smile lessness, but not ultimately one realized it's not that they're either in a bad mood or not smiling. They're not they're not being hypocritical. they're they're not dissembling. They're just being themselves. This is how they look when they're at, at peace or at ease. And that there is a way of being where you just, you know, you just say hello and you don't have to grin. <laughs> and it was, it was, I, I don't know, it was incredibly releasing to, to be in a, a culture that should be familiar. It's very close and yet it's not. We might as well have been on Mars. And the, uh, beauty of that culture, their clothes, their crafts, the way that I shift, my perceptions shifted, whereas when I first went into one of their craft, so-called emporia, it was, you know, the shelves were quite bare. There were only a few items. But when my vision had shifted, I realized that what items they were were highly valued because they took a lot of time and one person's effort. It was not put out by some kind of craft machine where everyone is working for horrible wa wages and um, angry and unhappy. This produced by people who loved what they were doing. This is all, you know, 40 years ago. I don't know what it's like now. But at the time... This sense I had of humility towards a small culture that had pride in itself and its people had pride in themselves was huge. I was overwhelmed and overcome with the sense of impression, of, you know, of of high, of uh, a very good impression of that that small culture. And the sense that, okay, I come from this, you know, this giant culture to the south, that is to the south of Bhutan. And that, by contrast, we are so degenerate in our understanding of values. And it was, it was very powerful. So coming back from four months of that, and then returning to all the usual stuff. And I remember a moment when we were, came down and, and a, uh, there were about five or six people in the same uh, vehicle. We came down, there was some problem in the the engine. And I was sitting in front and the two Bhutanese, uh, the driver and his assistant, they were looking into the front of the car with a mechanic from whatever small village we were in. They were, all three were looking in. The mechanic was an Indian, and, you know, it was tragic. He, his, that man, he was so beaten down by life, that mechanic, that sense of being burdened in so many ways that it showed on his skin, that showed on the grease in on his skin, his hair was unwashed. Whereas these two Bhutanese who were just ordinary people, just the driver and his assistant wearing their traditional clothes and kind of peering in. 
their faces were radiant. <laughs> they were maybe they were just thinking, oh, "Oh God, how are we going to get out of this?" But the difference in their faces, it was like watching some kind of morality play, you know, this is what can happen if you believe in transcendence and are not weighed down by the inevitable cycles of birth and death and all the horrors and sorrows and so on. It seems silly to say this, but that it was like seeing a visual example of something like that. So coming away from Bhutan, which was... Again, I was edging ever closer to the 30s, and I think that was 28 or 29 or something like that. And that made a very big difference in my life. And it made a difference as well because I earned a little more money from that entire experience than I had, than I typically had. So I started to get a little more money. And then that helped in many ways. I mean, it helped shore up my sense of self worth. So that kind of began to move forward, you know, the sense of self-worth. Yesterday after my recording got over, I, I was taking an Uber back to uh, the house of the friend I'm staying with in Vasant Kunj. And uh, uh, for a while there was some traffic and uh, the car kind of stopped at a bus stop. And it was there for a while because, you know, there was a jam. And I was looking at all the people who were sort of waiting at the bus stop. And I remember thinking that they all looked so desperately sad it was beaten almost down. beaten down is exactly the word it was almost heartbreaking that there is just no spirit left and of course and and i i wonder if that's also a measure of the kind of life you lived at how do you feel at 4 p.m mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. uh, and, and you know thoreau's phrase of lives of quiet desperation applies so much more here than it mm -hmm. would have in his own time perhaps right and uh, that was sort of very Poignant. The other thing that kind of happened in your twenties was also the beginning of Suki. You know, in nineteen eighty two, double talk happens because mm -hmm. of Vinod Mehta. Vinod Mehta commissions you mm -hmm. to do that. Take me a bit through that because now it's not just about art in a sense. It is also about storytelling, about creating characters, about you know learning how people talk and learning dialogue, which as you mentioned helped you in your playwriting later on. Right. And we'll come to that. So take me a bit through the you know the birth of double talk and how did you approach it? What were the kind of lessons you learned as you were doing it? What were the processes you had in place? So what was what had happened just prior to that era was uh, went to Bhutan. I had a little more money, I was a little more confident, I was no longer attempting to die. And I had a strong sense of wanting to establish a, a more regular source of income. And I, I had been thinking that one of the ways would be to set up a comic strip and I'd had a, one or two ideas. Asuki came into being just in that way that things that, you know, you use, many artists are like this, you use whatever material is closest at hand, which, of course, in my case would be myself. I'm there. And initially, Suki was loosely based on myself. Again, this is something I've said many times over, that originally Suki was kind of based on myself. I had shoulder-length hair. It was kind of bushy, so I did a caricature of myself. I always believed that I drew a fat person, and then <laughs> one of my friends said, she is not fat. You are, but she's not. <laughs> Thank Cru you. What a cruel Thank you. thing. Yeah. yeah, right. My friends were good for me. Yeah. So... 80, end of 82, it's not that he commissioned me. I sent Vinod, whom I had met through a friend, I sent him a proposal of what brilliant things Suki would be doing in his, mag his uh, newspaper. And the thing is, I already knew that he was interested in local comic strips because he, unlike the average Indian editor, was actually interested in comic strips. And he was, we've not even touched on Modesty Blaze. Modesty Blaze is a huge part of my life, okay? So he's a Modesty Blaze fan. And I knew Modesty Blaze from Bangkok from the time I was 11. And that's where I first encountered this comic strip. Knowing that Vinod was uh, publishing Modesty in his newspaper was a huge kind of uh, key to feeling that I could approach him. 
So when I approached him with a panel of uh, um, a, a kind of a kind of self recommendation letter in in panels, he said yes. He just said yes. Sure, you know, gave me a space, and I was on. And because he didn't try and tell me what to do. It was entirely up to me. And if you see the progression over the weeks of first few weeks, and initially I I hand drew all the frame lines, I hand wrote, you know, all the text. It was in, in minute. It was unreadable. Little by little, little you know, things uh, change for many reasons. Amongst them, it's quicker to do big. <laughs> <laughs> big lettering. It's quicker to not have a lot of detail. It's quicker to have fewer frames, not eight frames, and fewer characters. And also, if one of your characters is a frog, then it takes up much less space, and so on and so forth. There, there are many little gimmicks that cartoonists can use to ease their way. Because, of course, doing a comic strip and being paid on a monthly basis was certainly not paying my full rent. But I had to do other things. And finding time to do Suki, and then sometimes at some point uh, it switched to color, and getting it painted in color just before deadline. Sometimes the paint was wet en route to the office and would uh, throw it down and run away. I kept, I have the originals. So I would always go back the next week and collect the one that was from the week before. And little by little, these abilities begin to smooth out, you know, and become streamlined. But slipping forward into uh, electronic aids, as far as I'm concerned, I now work almost exclusively in Photoshop. When I do a drawing, uh, let us say, if I were, I for six years I had an, uh, a later version of uh, Suki as a comic strip. What I do is I make a drawing in pencil, I ink it, and then use Photoshop. I I um, scan in to my computer and then use Photoshop to do the boring stuff like filling in black space, black or color or whatever. It's just that much quicker. And if people think, oh, well, you know, you're using a computer, I don't care. <laughs> it's, it is, uh, it, if you think that the computer is doing it, think it, I don't care. It's not, but it does, it's a huge help. I can do so much more. And there's a lot of work that is much easier to do because you don't then have to make complete something in black and white or in color on paper, then scan, then uh, re, you know resize. All of those things have been made easier by doing things on the computer. So I'm very happy to use a computer. But there's a huge difference between what is produced on paper. It There's a quality change. And I, I think something that readers or viewers sense without perhaps even understanding what they're sensing. When you see something painted or drawn in the real world and not electronically, what and if you're buying it, what you're buying is that artist's time. You're buying a certain chunk of time. And when the artist has short shorten the process by using some electronic method which i have i mean with with some of my children's books the late the more recent ones i would never be able to produce a children's book in four months if i were not using some electronic aid but it does mean that the level of um the the time element that goes that goes you can see in the early work where everything was on paper is missing. So, of course, I know that there is a quality, qualitative difference. I don't know if the readers notice, but the fact that people return repeatedly to earlier books suggests to me that they do notice. They know that there is a, but they don't know why, why there's a difference.
I probably first read Suki in the pioneer years, so perhaps in the early 90s, 92, 93. Mm-hmm. And that was ink. That was ink. Yeah, that, that was, was not ink, a- yeah. electronic. Yeah. And I, I remember thinking even then that it looks so different from all the other typical syndicated comic strips that mm-hmm. there were. Mm-hmm. It was just different. I mean, the content was different. The style was different in a good way. Hmm. And what often happens when you encounter something new is that you don't know how to respond to it. Mm-hmm. Right. It happens with I have had restauranters on my show who speak about how when they experiment with food, the initial reaction is just hostile. Mm-hmm. It's not even uncaring. It is hostile. And mm-hmm. then it takes in a few years that kind of gets normalized. And even with Suki, you've mentioned in the past that you did get a certain amount of criticism and hostility. A lot. A lot. So one yeah. letter writer said she gives me this Pepsi, mm-hmm. uh, you know, <laughs> whatever that process is like. Mm. So uh, how did you, so how did that make you feel? How did you deal with well, it? Well, it was, was it was yet another turning point. <laughs> <laughs> so Suki had been appearing in the Sunday Observer for several, you know, several weeks. And I... As I said, I didn't connect with the Vinod or the office. I never had any dealings except to go and drop it off. So it was a shock for me to see in the um, letters section because he loved to maintain a big letters, a half page of letters from the readers, an angry letter complaining about Suki. And I was a little taken aback. It was quite, quite nasty. And then a week later, there was another one. And so maybe two or three such episodes later, I was starting to feel a little hurt and a little sorry for myself and no one was loving me and so on. So I I wondered, you know, what does Vinod feel about this? Is he starting to... Because they were saying things like, why are you wasting good, expensive newspaper columns on this rubbish? And so I thought to myself, well, maybe he's asking himself that. And if the readers hate Suki so much, of course they're hating me. Of course I know that. I went to him and I said, you know, what do you feel about this negativity? And he said, this was the turning point. He said, you know, when you stand in a public place, what he the word he used was coconut shy. When you stand in a public face, space, you're going to be hit. So if you can't take it, don't stand in a public space. But if you want to stay in the public space, take it. And as for myself, he said, I love to get negative critiques because it means that someone cares enough to put a stamp on a postcard and put it in the new, in the post box. And it means it's a certain kind, it's negative, but it's a certain kind of passion. And it means that they care. And he said, I can't tell you. If you want to stop, I won't stop you. And I went home and I thought about that. And I thought, he's right. (laughs) It's like (laughs) one of these moments, (laughs) you know. And onward into battle, you know. So I uh, persevered and I found that it it was cool to get the more... I got uh, angry letters, the more fun it was to kind of play with it, you know. And in your mind, how did Suki evolve? Like when you mentioned that some readers will go back to the earlier strips. But for you, what is what are other phases that you like? What did you feel about it? Because I imagine in the beginning, it's a learning curve. You are awkward. You would be a little awkward in your drawing. You'd be a little awkward in your Mm storylines. Then it gets much better as you Mm -hmm. find a certain assurance. But then there is a You find a rhythm, you know. Yeah. So, what what are what are your feelings on? Well, there were many. There were certain phases in Suki. The, the first phase was when she was supposedly based on me, and so some a lot of the in that early phase, the things I did were the things that she did, or my friends would sometimes turn up in the strip, and there was a certain amount of irritation that one of, one of my friends really didn't like the way he appeared in the strip, so he was dropped. <laughs> um, but the, the great break between Suki and myself happened when I had been away on a trip, and she remained away and in, the, in the strip. And I was back in Bombay and walking around, and someone said, you're here? I thought you were still in the U.S. <laughs> and I said, no, that's Suki. And that, the split happened. That's Suki, and that's not me. And 
she became very much her own person and not someone who she didn't she's never particularly liked me and she has very much she's always had her own she's a very un, unruly in the sense that there is no specific characteristic that you can place on her she's she does what she likes which is mostly nothing she doesn't do very much she has opinions they are usually not very political there's once in a while so the bombay strips were very much more abstract there were aliens there were there was a visiting alien there were there was her she had a friend called miss maidenhood who was burka clad cabaret singer i don't think i would get away with that now and it it was very easy to draw miss maidenhood because it was just a, <laughs> <laughs> So I loved drawing her and she was very feisty and she would say that she was performing nude in her burqa. <laughs> yeah. Delightful and you're giving away too many of your tricks. <laughs> so there are those who say that early Suki that is the Sunday Observer Suki was the high a high point. Personally I really liked the development in the, in Pioneer Suki because that was 6 days a week and so it wasn't just that I had to finish it uh, before Sunday and throw it in but I had to do it for sometimes I would do it the day before but usually I would do 6 days at a time and had worked out a way of the panels appearing on an A3 size and then be reduced and I would I never gave the originals I gave reproductions and that is photocopies so i would take an a4 sheet which i'd reduce down so that it would be the right size and take that to the pioneer and because of the continuity the six days gives you a lot of time in which to build a story and it uh, gave me tremendous experience for writing dialogue because she would interact with whoever and the the effort of drawing characters repeatedly the same way you know this of course any strip cartoonist has to be able to do that but that's why so many strip cartoonists you know they usually have only three fingers not four mm. suki has four fingers and a thumb but many cartoonists have the convention of three fingers and uh, they're rounded and there's no nail and this is just to cut down on the uh, repeats you know they you have to repeat so many things each time you draw that character so i would say that the for me some of the ideas of the pioneer strips in the middle years were i think my favorite years but there was a terrible falling off towards the final year and a half of pioneer because uh, vinod went uh, away uh, to outlook and uh, the st- the people who headed the pioneer after that I, i'm not even going to try and name them just didn't have any interest and they also stopped paying <laughs> that's a very big and useful reason for starting to hate to do anything is they just stopped paying and i was stubborn enough to just continue producing it and they continued to print it but they didn't pay so there was you know i was not in in the sunday observer i got a lot of in, in mostly hate mail but i did get a, a a little appreciation and then some of the hate mail was i realized in the in the sunday observer meant to be kind of jokey and they realized some of the readers realized that if they, if they write something really extreme it'll get in print and they wanted to see their names in print so they would do that but in the pioneer no response at all for 6 years nothing I think in 6 years I got one mail piece of mail and it didn't make it to the letters page they physically gave me a piece of mail in the end I wasn't getting paid and I wasn't enjoying it so then why do it you know so I stopped in 97 Tell me about the impetus towards writing especially play writing like you you already mentioned that you got better at dialogue because you were doing dialogue in the strip and your first play lights out was based on a story you were told by a friend a true story mm-hmm. but why a play you know why not a short uh, story this is this, this is this is another 
It was it was not a turning point. It was just one of those things that happened that I the friend a friend with in whom with whom I was in conversation we were talking about something or the other and she just she said, "You know, the other day and it obviously had not happened recently it had happened a year before the time we were talking." She said, "I uh saw something, something that left a terrible impression, not surprisingly. And what she saw was a gang rape outside a window from the flat they were in. And I'm not going to go into any details here because it is detailed in Lights Out. And she told me this, and we were both very... Obviously, she was shaken, but she had not talked about it since the time that she had seen it. So she had internalized what she had seen, but what she told me was in great detail. And it left me very, very shaken. So, of course, as anyone associated with the press might do, I immediately went to Vinod and I said, you know, I heard this incredible story. And he said, yes, it uh, sounds awful, but there are no details it's happened not recently. It happened a year ago. You, I, that's what I said. And there are no witnesses willing to come forward. Again, I knew that this the person in whose house it uh, occurred, from which they saw the site, wanted no attention. So they would never speak. And there were, there's no, of course, no address or anything. So it's not a news story. It's just say so. And he said, you know, if I wanted, I could write that as some kind of, uh, if I can link it to other stories. I wasn't at all interested in doing that. The one thing led to another, and then I talked to a friend called Rekha Khanna, who was at that time edit, going to be editing um, a magazine for India Today's. It, in, India Today had an idea of starting a women's magazine called Wo- Wo- Woman Today. She was going to be editing that, and she was sitting at the at her editorial desk, and I told her about this. I I told her what I had heard. And she said, you know what? Why don't you write it as a play? And it's like like a, a kind of buzzer in my head, you know. It's like, hmm, this is an idea. Why not? You know, maybe that's the thing to do. That is to write, not to become a playwright, but to write a new story in the format of a play. So... Therein, <laughs> a whole story begins, and it it happened. So I was reading the play today morning, and 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 for the benefit of my uh, for the benefit of the listeners, it's collected in a book called Blood and Laughter, which is a collection of your long form mm-hmm. uh, plays. And what struck me while reading it is how brilliantly it works as a metaphor even for these current times like what essentially happens in the play without giving much away is that you have a bunch of people who are meeting for a dinner party and they hear some noises outside and clearly it's noises that the hosts have heard before so they know what it is and they tell the guests they don't bother to look it's just a religious thing it's a religious ceremony and etc mm-hmm. etc and eventually they look and it's it's a gang rape which is happening which is described in some detail in the play but never shown mm-hmm. obviously uh, you avoid uh, you know that aspect of it but it's it's described you can make out what's going on and at first they explain it away oh it's a religious ceremony then you realize oh it can't be a religious ceremony it's a rape then somebody says that oh maybe she's a prostitute maybe she's consenting for this etc etc you know the whole Mm. thing plays out that way and did you intend it as a play that is just about this one disturbing incident or was that larger comment which frankly is a timeless comment and Mm. applies as much to it was very much my intention because when i attempted to write it as an as an account of an incident that is not a news item because i have no other I have I have no newsworthy details to offer. Realizing that I'm going to have to present it as if it were fiction, but I'm going to also say it's not fiction. It seemed to me pointless to just to just pr- provide an audience with a tale of horror or nastiness. For what purpose? I mean the. 
the sense of purpose became embedded in the desire to write it as a play, that there has to be a purpose, but what is the purpose? Why do I bother? Why will anyone bother to buy a seat to watch a performance if all I'm going to say is something nasty happened in Santa Cruz? It's not enough because something nasty is happening somewhere everywhere in the world. So that's not enough. A piece of fiction or a piece of, uh, dare we say it, literature has to go beyond that. But what? Uh, I certainly am not going to have an, a, a, a group of actors on stage um, shaking their finger at the audience and saying, now don't do that. <laughs> mm. You don't want that. You want the audience to come come away with something other than, oh, we shouldn't do these bad things. That's not enough. I mean, I'm saying it's not enough. Uh, an author, a playwright, um, and anyone uh, who puts something out in the public domain, as I said, that remark about from Vinod, which is if you do something in the public domain, be ready to be critiqued, to be hit at. But stand by what you're saying. He didn't say all of that. He just... His remark was very brief. But the idea that if you put, if you have people paying for a seat, give them something, something more than just a little lecture on don't be bad, <laughs> Baba, don't be bad. Now you go home and be good. That's not enough. You have to, you have to have something to offer. And I, again, uh, to to go back on the issue of age, I think at 15, I wouldn't have had anything to offer. But at whatever I was, 30 plus, I, I felt I had something more to offer than, than just, now don't do that, yeah. <laughs> you know, and what I had to offer was questions, not answers. That I wanted the the audience to go home with a, a terrible sense of of responsibility for crimes of this nature where it is not the crime itself well, who knows why what was going on outside we'll never know that that is something we never know neither before nor after nor at any time in between we have i have no idea what was going on or why what I do know is that people have opinions about why women get raped. Why, I mean, so many now, of course, with, you know, the, all the developments since there are so many ways and opinions people have about what people should or shouldn't do and think and feel about uh, assaults on men or women, but certainly women. But part of what I want people to think about is what effect it has on all our values for life and self-esteem when women are told repeatedly that it is their, the way they dress or the way they behave, or they're, even they're having desires that people think they shouldn't have, which causes them to be in danger. And what it does, what words like slut or whore do to demean someone who might not deserve to be demeaned. After all, one of the points one wants to make in the play is, uh, one of the characters says, do you mean to say if she is a whore, she can't be raped? And the the two guys say, of course, I mean, what is a whore? But someone who is, you know, just... They don't say the words, but they're suggesting that, well, where's the question of of decency? And the character asks, then, if, if there's no purpose, if whatever a woman does, she is going to, she's vulnerable to assault, then what is the point of being decent? And then, of course, the others say, oh, now you've completely lost it. You've lost the case here. So there are no answers to questions of this kind. These answers can only be sought by the audience about themselves, what they really feel, what they feel about, because that much deeper question that Lights Out only slightly touches upon, which is, what are the rights of a whore, a prostitute? Do we ever allow ourselves to think that there are rights that... 
anyone in the business of uh, providing sex, they're not just machines who have no, no feelings or no thoughts or no rights. Even there, there are rights. And our unwillingness to look in that direction because, after all, some some people are their customers. So what what are we saying? You know, that it's a free-for-all? It can't be. They are They are just people, ultimately. And if we're not willing to look there, then we can't really have any right to look at rape and issues of assault. We have to look at the whole spectrum, which we don't. We tend to only look at, oh, some woman has been modesty has been outraged and we have to all feel angry about it but we don't look at the the foundation of the outrage of the anger where does it arise and how and for me the part in the play also lay in the fact that beyond all these questions it also goes into something fundamental about the people in the drawing room like the sense why i got at the end of it is okay the real crime is looking away yes you know the real need of the moment is to think about all the things that we have normalized because we are refusing to look outside that window mm-hmm. so for me it just felt uh, incredibly powerful and what is even more remarkable about that play is that it was actually performed <laughs> so right. tell me a little bit about so uh, it it continues to be performed it was just performed the other day in bombay yeah. Yeah, but like you pointed out, for 16 years after this was performed, nothing, no, nothing, yes. none of your plays was performed. Right, so, for a long time. In that sense. The thing is, the thing is, to perform a play that is going to leave the audience shattered, <laughs> and it does, I'm laughing, but it is true. The audiences for Lights Out come away kind of gray with uh, tension and because you're... you're Most of us are primed to think that you go out for an evening of uh, theater and you come away somewhat, you know, entertained and feeling kind of good. And even if it's many, after all, a lot of the drama is about dramatic things and things that ri- raise you up in emotions and anger and, and, and sorrow and so on. And then it leaves you off feeling relieved at the end. Well, Lights Out does not leave you with anything tender at the end at all and what at what does happen is which is what i i have suggested to people who perform it so at the end of the show come out into the audience and encourage discussion and if anyone wants then engage in a group hug and people like that they they want that they want that connection they want to be told that well you know they were awful people back there but we are okay <laughs> <laughs> but it does leave people shaken and most pe- the question that is asked at once is did it really happen you know and what can i say i was told it did and <laughs> so, i mean the other thing is it's these kinds of things are happening and maybe not so extreme what made this extreme is that people watched but does a violent assault take place of course we know it does and what do we do what do we think how do we react and more than anything else why is there so little compassion in the room there is no compassion for anyone i'm the i mean the idea of just going and beating up someone with no idea of why they're doing what they're doing and what you might encounter if you're actually face to face with the assailants uh, that's not even you know there's no time in the play of course to discuss any of that so the the lack of compassion and the lack of accountability is uh, is what is really being discussed. So I I always push away the of course it will always be described as a play about rape but it is truly a play about apathy about public apathy and a lack of civic responsibility. But of course these are not, you know, these are not juicy words. So it's easier to say oh it's a play about rape. It's not. So with this play with you know with lights out which as you point out gets performed within a few months of it coming out on the one hand it feels like you have found another powerful calling that you are, you know now that you can write plays that you, you can think of yourself as a playwright but on the other hand 
in the ecosystem you're still the forever outsider in the sense mm-hmm. you're a playwright writing plays in english with a particular kind of sensibility and most of the playwriting scene is all your hindi playwrights and nst and blah 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 so you did you still feel kind of on the outside did you feel that there is a world that you can belong to or did you feel that no essentially i am still like an army of one and i just have to do what i like many of your plays you mentioned all your plays you mentioned you basically written alone mm-hmm. even if you know that a particular troupe is going to perform it with you you've hold yourself up and written it alone mm-hmm. and so on mm-hmm. so tell me a little bit about that and was that frustrating that having found this new calling you st- you know the scene is not so receptive at all there is no vinod mehta well uh, of course it's plays, frustrating of course it's frustrating but by certainly by that age i it was 1984 i wrote lights out naturally by then i had grown very used to the state of uh, this condition <laughs> and i would it would just intensify you know so i wrote i forget the exact sequence but i wrote i think straight after that was the mating game show which the mating game show is a is a play that had a lot of potential and a lot of uh, the at least two or three groups tried to or wanted to perform it but ultimately it could not be performed because it was a big expensive it would have been a big expensive production and then govind yahlani commissioned it as a screenplay for a 12 part series and that was supposedly for bitv and there was tons of money and everything collapsed and bitv collapsed and we actually wrote, i wrote that so 12 episodes or i don't know how many a huge cast it got performed it was got filmed it's in the cans but never seen and you know all of that certainly produced a sense of futility in doing things you know the worthlessness of making the effort because it's not going to result in in a performance and therefore of course no question of any money and i i can only point to my continuing willingness to uh, chase down uh, hopeless quests that i continue to do things and perhaps if i hadn't one way or the other continued to survive sort of i mean it was always notional there's always scraping together so in the middle i worked for india today for a couple of years and that stabilized me i moved to delhi in 85 i wrote lights out in 84 i moved to delhi in 85 i worked with csc for a few months uh, maybe a year then straight after that so i was getting a little more in the way of regular money very little but i was getting some and then for uh, india today for a year and a half and then i freelanced a little more and then we're edging towards harvest now obviously harvest was the other giant watershed in my life i went to the two or three things happened all at once in 91 in 81 i went to bhutan in 91 i married the person i met in bhutan and obviously there was a change of life but not in terms of money i i am not dependent on him and have I've never been and so for me the need to be self-reliant was remained the same but in 95 i went to china as part of the un women's conference the un had has a women's conference every 10 years or something like that anyway 95 it was the big big women's conference that was held in china 35000 women from around the world came to china it was the first time that china was opening up i was not there as a delegate i was there as a cartoonist so it was for me a very charming otherness not i was not part of the main conference i was part of the ngo conference which was not in beijing it was in a resort called huairu and it was a wonderful again a kind of one but it it is not what i would call a watershed moment this was not a watershed it was just a wonderful excursion and it also introduced me to 
a larger network of people, but the same old story, which is people think that I, you know, they like my work. I, you know, everyone thinks I draw well, et cetera, et cetera. But I can't, I don't actually make much of the way of a living. And in 91, end 91, I started a new cycle of uh, Suki. So Suki was running in the Pioneer from 91 to 97. So whether I was, I had gone to Australia or to, um, uh, because somewhere in between I went to, that's the whole point. I I think, I'm, I'm losing track of the years, but at some point I went to China and then I went to Australia and Australia was the big one of the big moments because in Australia, I saw a little, a small uh, theater journal, and I went to Australia again as a cartoonist. There was some feminist book fair, uh, something something international feminist book fair was held in Australia. I was invited to it. I went there with Suki and so on and so forth. Okay, all of that was going on. But in Australia, I stayed two weeks with a friend. He had uh, a journal in his house, a 16-page uh, theater journal out of a small theater group. And I asked him to subscribe for me, so I got four copies. And that was in, as I said, I'm losing track, so I'm not sure... So I must have gone to, this is it. I went to Australia in 94. In 95, I went to China. In this, between 94 and 95, I got four copies of this. This is relevant. So in the final copy I got, which was in 95, I saw a very tiny advertisement for uh, a, an international comp play competition, but sponsored by the Onassis Foundation. Now, I knew of Onassis because... As a child growing up in outside India, I was very conscious of Jackie Jackie Kennedy marrying Aristotle Onassis. It was such a big scandal and so on. And so I knew the name Onassis, so it caught my eye. And I thought, because I was now really desperate for, no, I just didn't have, um, I felt I was not surviving my life well. And... I saw that sum of money and I thought, that's the kind of sum that I would find very useful. It would be really great. And I do write plays, so why don't I try? So I saw that in 95, in the middle of 95, and the submission date was the end of June in 96. I wrote the play and sent it, and I didn't, as everyone, as the rules specified that you it should be an un published, unperformed play, I didn't tell anyone, not my sisters, not my friends, not anyone. So I wrote the play between March and June and sent it, and to cut a long story short, because there was an incredible year-long wait, in July 97, I got a call from Greece to tell me it had won. So in that twinkling, my life changed, and it became a different life. And in that sense, a life that was no longer at the edge of struggling the whole time. I'm still struggling, but not the same way. What did that do to you? Because, you know, it's completely life-changing, and I don't think there is a single writer, a single struggling writer or artist in India who hasn't dreamed of something like this. Mm. Right? Oh, my God, if I had that kind of money, you know, everything is taken care of. I can just, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So what do you even do? How do you Two plan for that? Two or three things become, can easily be said now, said so many years later. I was 44 then. I'm 70 now. And I can say two or three things. One is, yes, everything does change. Part of what changes is the way people look at you. Suddenly there are like uh, Scrooge McDuck, you know, dollar <laughs> signs in the eyes. They're looking at you like that, like you're suddenly made of money. Of course you're not, because what you realize almost instantly is, yes, it's a lot of money, but there's only a certain amount of things you can do with it. If you buy a house, for instance, you don't have any money to live on, so you can't buy a house. So there's... There's, you know, it's like you don't even think of buying a house when you have only 5,000 rupees in your bank account. But when you have a lot more, then 
you discover the things you can't do. <laughs> <laughs> All that you do know is the universe has smiled on you and you are grateful. And if it happens late in your life, which at 44, it is late in your life, you don't take it for granted. A lot of time has gone into making. It is not just the lottery. It feels like the lottery, but it isn't. And it, you, you realize with humility that it can, it can, it need not have happened. It happened, but it's by such a hair's breadth, and it, you feel humbled by the nature of reality that it could so easily not have happened. I mean, I was told that it was one of the last plays to get in under the door in time for the deadline. And you feel grateful. You feel responsible for, you know, to the power of chance. And you realize that it's, I mean, it's great, it's wonderful, but you can't, you can't be irresponsible. You can't take it lightly. You also can't do very much. You, you know, you can't, it, it will s support some things, but more than anything else, and this is what I said at the time, and it is 100% true, what it really did was it freed me to do what I already do without having to fret about Never mind paying the rent. Okay, right. I still have to pay rent now and then, but I I can I can continue to do what I want to do with less of the sense of the wolf at my heels. The wolf is still now down the road. Then now the wolf looks different. The wolf is mortality, <laughs> <laughs> and you know how much can one do before uh, age and health and so on catch up, but the the sense that for all the things that can go wrong sometimes things go right and i think it's 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 very positive it's very reassuring that you can take a chance and it can work and that of course there are many people who uh, go crazy and they you know buy yachts and things like that but you know, as I said, very soon you realize, no, you can't do very much. You can do what you can do the things you couldn't do before, a few of those things, but not very much more. What I love about the story is a perfect storm that had you not gone to Australia, had you not visited that friend, had you not seen that magazine at his place and taken that subscription and gotten that fourth issue and looked inside it and found this and and been optimistic and enough. been optimistic. Which but is, there, there is a wrinkle that I haven't even mentioned. This mm. friend, how did I know this friend? But actually, it's a little bit X-rated, so I will not go there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> no worries. I met this friend in Germany a million years before. And what can I say? Sounds juicy. <laughs> it's not really. It's not really. Mm. But there was a, a, a reason we stayed friends, whereas I was friendly with a number of other people, and I didn't stay friends with them. But with this one I did. Well, thank God for whatever that extracted reason is, frankly. <laughs> and no, and, and the big lesson in this, I think, and a lesson that I should also learn and put in play is that sometimes it's important to increase your surface area of serendipity, you know, and traveling does that. You know, you travel, you meet this friend, you pick up the magazine, you are enthusiastic, you say subscription, chahiye, you get a subscription, you notice that, you're optimistic. <laughs> All the time you're increasing your surface area of serendipity. Whereas if you're like me, you're moping in your flat, you're not <laughs> going out. I'm an introvert anyway. You don't meet people, you know, and shit doesn't happen. And the big lesson in this is that you have to, you know, and this is also another reason traveling helps and just putting yourself out there helps, even if it is sometimes an effort, not for a particular purpose, but you're just increasing the number of good things that could possibly uh, sort of happen to you. Hmm. How did people look at you differently after this? Because Indians, we suffer from this post-colonial nonsense that foreign validation means so freaking much to us. Right. Well, it had a negative effect as well, because what can happen in, again, in India is if you get if you are regarded as of no consequence in India 
then if someone, some outside agency decides that you are of consequence, in India, it translates to, oh, well, you know, she must have done something silly to get that. And it doesn't have to touch us at all. So th there was no immediate concept that maybe the play is good. No, the the first thought was, oh, it you know, it, it makes sense to foreigners, but for us, it's nothing. And it was, Harvest was very much treated as not, you know, it's what was said in so many words is it, it works on paper, but it won't work on stage, on the page, but not on stage. And what can I say? I, I, I can't do more than write the play and then send it and it wins a prize. And if you think it's nothing, then what can I do? I can't do much. I can't convince you otherwise. And the fact is, I am not part of the theatre community. And there are a couple of sad stories I can tell, but they're not worth telling because it's like, yes, you know, people everywhere behave badly. So before harvest, people behave badly. After harvest, people behave very badly. But right now, I can say there's been a very recent development where it's being translated into Hindi. And there may be, in a year, a Hindi stage production of it. I'm thrilled. And the person who's doing it, his name is Nikhil Mehta. And we're all feeling very hopeful. Congratulations. That's great. Yeah. And so here's an interesting thing that we kind of have in common, though I don't deserve to have this in common with you, that after my book came out, which you reviewed so kindly, mm -hmm. Govind Nialani got in touch and he said, hey, I want to make a film with this. And I, It's because of me. You put him onto the book. Yes. My God. And I find out now. I find out now in the middle of a recording. Thank you so much. That was so kind of you. But what eventually happened was that uh, we did a, uh, I did a treatment with him and he couldn't get funding in Bollywood. And then he said, Ki Marathi mein banate hai. he said the Marathi film industry, this was circa 2009, is like the Hindi film industry of the early 1980s. Mm. And I wrote a treatment uh, for him where the story setting changed to Pune. And then I just had a feeling nothing would happen. And I think I just became apathetic like the people in the drawing room and I stopped replying to his emails and I inadvertently ghosted him. Mm -hmm. So if you ever meet him, tell him I'm really sorry. He's, uh, he's not doing well. He's not doing well. Let's not go further down this. Yeah, so uh, it's... But the point... Uh, the, what I was coming to next was that he made a film out of Harvest called uh, They Harm. So they tell me about that sort of process and, you know... Well, the thing is, by then... That's why I think that was 2002 he made the film. And... It was all, you know, it was very, you know, what word can I say? Heartwarming or, you know. But, you know, the film, I had already realized that page to film is not much fun for the writer <laughs> because the film is entirely the director's baby. And it you you see your work being sort of packaged and used by someone else, and it I I had I was not you know I was not feeling possessive about Harvest. I had seen it performed on stage here and there. You know, Harvest is performed every once in a once in a while on stage somewhere, and. I've seen it a number of times now. I don't watch because I find it hateful. Hateful in the sense that I have I don't enjoy it. I'm glad that they do. I, I must say, I'm kind of hoping that the Hindi harvest will be great. But I, I, by and large, I don't really like to watch. Because, okay, they're doing it. They're getting something out of it. But for me, it's it's past. It's over. And, of course, Dehem was in 2002 and it was still quite fresh for me. But... It was still not my play. Mm. It had become somebody else's film. And I, you know, I was glad, but kind of gotten over it. There's this old cliche in India about how if you put, you know, crabs in a bottle, uh, yes, they... all, all the crabs will pull the, any, mm -hmm. any crab tries to escape, the other crabs will pull him down. And... And I, I and I can't speak for other countries because I've only lived here. But what I have seen here is very often, especially in the artistic community, there can often be a lot of bitterness and resentment against people who have done well. Like a friend of mine who went on to become a novelist, 
told me once in the late 90s that amit every time a friend of mine does well a part of me dies <laughs> and i just found i was yeah he was trying to be clever and he's been clever uh, all his life ever since but i just felt that that was such a terrible horrible yeah, thing to say but at, the, but at the same time mm. it also felt true to me it also felt that you know instead of celebrating each other's successes too often we uh, we are trying to push them down we try to find reasons in our head that you know they are not what it's cut out to be and mm. some of the responses that you got to harvest, harvest. also kind of indicates right, that yeah. there is jealousy there is envy yeah there was but you know the thing is when you have gotten out of that glass bottle it mm. doesn't matter <laughs> they i can't be you know they can say what they like they can feel what they like well, they, is, this is, is all it, in the past is this so. more of a tendency with us i don't know I think it's always it's the case with any small community and many literary artistic communities are small but so some of it will happen but I think one reason that it is more noticeable in a large country like India is that however large the country might be the artistic communities are small and people are still hungry even very wealthy artists and writers are still they behave like poor people in that they are not generous i mean in fact the poor are generous yeah but they the people in the many variations of the artistic community are not generous with one another or they'll be generous to people of their own community there'll be a lot of parochialism and in all of that someone like myself who is already an outsider i'm not so there what would be my my community there's no community to support me it's not as if you know because i don't perform as a let i mean it's unthinkable that i would ever do that but it's not as if i i behave i say you know i'm I'm a Malayali and I'm proud of being Malayali. I don't I can't I can't possibly say that with any honesty because I don't even speak. So I I can't have a sense of community support from whatever is my ethnic community because it's not real that way. And I I come across as an outsider even from the way I speak. the way i behave the way i look and then of course i appear to be living outside the country and i is not as if i have some kind of foundation there or anywhere so the fact that i'm not actually supported by anything is is merely one more feature of my outsider existence but like i i've been saying all the way all through it's become my identity it's become my i've said this in other places it's it's become my nationality to be an outsider and there are people like this there are others like me of course we don't belong to one another either we are all tiny nations <laughs> yeah yeah uh, beautifully put i want to ask you now about the otis the post harvest years and i'm particularly mm-hmm. fascinated by the fact that you were actually in america at the time of the 2001 uh, mm-hmm. world trade center attacks mm-hmm. uh, and part of the reason is that you know we live our lives assuming that there is a certain normal we define it in a certain way this is the shape mm-hmm. of the world this is how things are etc etc and in a sense we are lucky to be living in times where there is not much reason for that to be shaken too much mm-hmm. in previous times there would be invasions and conquests and natural disasters and the world is going to hell every few years mm-hmm. but in a sense 2001 was a big moment of rupture when the normalcy is suddenly broken when those two great buildings kind of fall down mm-hmm. so tell me a little little bit about you know that period of time because you were actually in america when that happened and yeah. uh, you know how did that make you feel what were those times like for you well i don't think i have especially uh, set up the way you know other people in my life were where they were situated for instance it's it's important to recognize that 
my two sisters, my two elder sisters, have always been a very important presence in my life. So one of them lives in Madras. Her name is Geeta Doctor. The other one lives in the U.S. Her name is Surya Narayanan. And she immigrated to the U.S. as a doctor very many years ago in the early 70s. And in many ways, these two, my two sisters, have been like my anchors. And certainly in the U.S., the fact that I had a sister living there in in Pennsylvania, not in New York or Boston, uh, but in a small town in Pennsylvania, part of why she's important to me is that she made it possible for me to come and go from the U.S., when in 2002, I became an immigrant, I, I was now required to, to spend a certain length of time in the U.S. So my sister's presence there made a big difference. But I also very often was living with other people as a guest, as, as a longtime guest. Now, in 2001, it was a difficult year for my my tiny family, that is myself and Ethan, to whom I married, and his father, Joseph Allen Stein. And in 2001, the three of us traveled to the U.S. to stay with very dear friends in the small city called Newport in Rhode Island. It's on the East Coast and about an hour and a half from Boston. And we 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 traveled there knowing that Ethan's father was not going to live very long. He was in his 90s, and it was it was expected that he would pass away while we were in the U.S., and we had traveled there for that, with that understanding and that knowledge. So at the time of uh, 9-11, the three of us were not in Newport, but uh, in uh, North Carolina for the south from Rhode Island, and staying in Ethan's brother's house. So it was a tense and difficult period, you can imagine, for all of us because a great person that is Ethan's father was was slowly passing away and i i can i you know like many people talk about uh where you know they ask that question where were you when president kennedy was shot so for another generation this this event of 911 was going to be that question that that people would ask what were you doing and where were you when the towers fell. Well, I and Ethan and his father were in his brother's house, Ethan's brother's house in uh, North Carolina. And I had, you know, because we were guests and we couldn't be, we couldn't have a large TV in the rooms we were in. I had a tiny handheld TV, if you can believe it. It was it was like a, a large cell phone. It was that it was that small. It was a tiny TV. I was on the phone talking to my sister for my morning call with my sister because we, we communicated every day. I was holding this little TV and we were, no, I, I, the, we were, you know, we had been talking and something came in over the radio, not even the TV. And I then flicked on my little TV and she and I were both watching and she said, are you seeing this? Are you seeing this? You know, something has has happened. A, a a plane has flown into one of the twin towers, and it was, it was one of those moments. You know, I called out to Ethan. He was in the other room, saying, "Are you? I, have have you been picking this up anyway? I I don't need to go further down this path because, you know, it's it's it was the the experience of so many people. You know, there were so many." stories exchanged horrified stories but like you said it was that moment when the picture of the world we had we'd had till then suddenly cracked and we began to have to adjust to a, a new reality that none of us was prepared for because of course it was a completely unfamiliar experience to and uh, particularly for you uh, people in the US who had not, I mean, for the longest time, had not experienced anything like an attack on their own soil. So when we were at this 
at this time, which was in a personal sense very difficult for us because we were having to face a big loss and big adjustments in our lives. Then when we were moving back and forth across the U.S. to go to, you know, to go to Newport and then we went somewhere else, I forget. Oh, we went to Vermont to get over the loss. Um, all the traveling was made strange because of the sudden security. Again, in India, we're used to, we had for many years been used to seeing people with uh, machine guns at airports. In the U.S., it was completely unfamiliar and people were, other people, not us, but other people were reacting strangely, you know, with kind of discomfort and trying. There were signs saying, do not make jokes. We were, we were, there were regular signs at the airport saying, do not make jokes. This is a serious situation. And the security personnel were themselves very awkward. They they themselves didn't know how how to function, how to, how to behave. I mean, everything has, of course, changed hugely. Everyone is kind of blasé and also very strict and tense. You know, they wear these big black uniforms and so on. But that was not the case then. So it was it was a huge shift. And for those of us who write science fiction, it was like, wow, <laughs> this <laughs> this is this is kind of oh, this is happening. These things that we write about are are happening seeing those towers come down was one of those one of those experiences it's like i you know there's there's if you've seen the um, if you've read the comic of the watchman there are course, scenes brilliant. scenes towards the end where people are running away because there's that make it it is a manufactured crisis that the fellow in the arctic puts together but the scenes of people screaming and running away from this huge cloud of smoke, it's like he, it it and absolutely anticipated the visions that we had from New York at that time. So it was it was a you know it was one of those cataclysmic events, and of course we have all moved away from that time, so it it you don't think of it in quite the same way because we have all adjusted to it. It's it became the normal later on but so all of our plans to uh, tr uh, to relocate to the US which is which was for me a kind of vague notion i you know wanted to do it but wasn't sure and you know it's not it's not ever easy to relocate and for most people the decisions to relocate are made by other other events in that person's life the, the events such as a job or going abroad to study and then you get used to a place and you settle down for me as i've often said to friends uh the decision to go to the us was based on i like it there not because i had a job and not because i can afford it i can't really afford it at all and we still essentially can't afford to be there because it, as anyone who has tried to relocate to another country knows, it takes a lot of not just energy and effort, it also takes a lot of money. I, as as I continue to say to friends who, at least in the past and certainly immediately after harvest, began to look at me as if I were, you know, suddenly a millionaire, I kept having to make the point, you know, it's not really that much because there's it's what what that sum of money did for me was it helped stabilize an incredibly unstable situation. But it did not mean that I was suddenly fine, you know. And as I very often it's something I say fairly often because by now, by by the age I am now, which is 70, and I know I keep talking about age, most everyone I know owns their home. They know where they're going to live for the rest of their lives, even if they travel a lot. I don't. And uh, I still don't. And in a sense, it, it I think it, the point could be made that it seems as if both Ethan and I are living, still living a kind of young person's life. We are still searching. 
but it is still uncomfortable. I can also say that. It's not, it's not really by choice. It's because from then onwards, I mean, including post-harvest, it's still difficult to find a place that I'm comfortable and really happy to settle down in. And certainly for Ethan, who has... He, Ethan, in many ways, has a stronger link to Delhi. He grew up here. I didn't. So he speaks Hindi. He speaks Hindustani. He, as he says, when he's in the U.S., he doesn't recognize the bird song, and it, it hurts him. Whereas here, he knows every plant. He knows all the birds, and he misses all of that when he's there. I, by contrast, because I grew up in different countries, I don't really miss places. And I'm happy in the U.S. in part because being an older person and a brown, brown-skinned brown person in the U.S. makes you absolutely invisible. And I love that invisibility. I love being completely anonymous. It's I, I walk on the streets on the if i not that i walk a whole lot but when i'm walking around i have this feeling of being um like um a kind of cross cultural spy because i can see things i see things with the whole of my history but i know that on the street i look like a completely not just anonymous, but a kind of non-person who, if I were in a movie, I would be one of the completely unrecognizable crowd elements. And I love that sense of of being filled with another dimension inside me, but wandering around as if I were a lamppost, completely ordinary. So I, I, I guess what I'm saying is, I'm very conscious of not being ordinary and yet living and looking as if I were. And it's a fabulous disguise. And I like that sense. Whereas in Delhi, anyone who is even slightly above middle class, you're not ordinary on the streets. And certainly, if you are an older person and a woman and on walking around in the streets in Delhi, you're an unusual feature because everyone else is different. Everyone else is much more kind of uh, local and look as if they belong, whereas people like me routinely look as if we do not belong. And that sense of being other in what is other, what uh, appears to me or by, uh, by any um, uh, existing standards of belonging, you know, it's, this is supposedly my country, but I I am not on the streets. I'm not regarded. I'm not treated as if I were just an ordinary element on the street. So there's that odd uh, irony that I feel I at one level, I'm much more at home in the U.S. because I'm much more invisible. So all of that happened post-harvest and the, the gradual shift from Living in Delhi and visiting India, uh, visiting the U.S., took place between 2001 and 2002. By the end of 2002, I was officially an immigrant and needed, therefore, to spend not more than three months of the year away from the U.S. So I needed to make a shift in how I was spending my time. But I didn't actually commit to paying rent um, and lived as a guest out of the homes of friends and, of course, my beloved sister and my uh, her daughter, who was, again, I mean, everyone has always been extremely kind to me to have me as a guest. And I have, over the years, become something of a professional guest. I'm, and I, I, I like, I'm happy to be living in other people's homes. And it's, in some ways, I'm, I'm again, I'm doing that everywhere. I'm practically a, a guest in my own home, wherever I, I live. But in 2010, I formally rented a space. And I lived in that space from 2010 to just last year. 
And last year there was a crisis. <laughs> it was, I can now laugh about it. But anyway, that was just last year and very recent. So all of these years from 2001 to 2023 have been somewhat nomadic because I have continued all along to have a home in Delhi that I come to every so often. And all of the work that I've been producing between these years has been done in this, you know, in this always in the spare time, the spare spaces between moving around and finding and trying to organize a secure base while doing a whole lot of other things. I would say that the artwork uh, suffered the most because to be an artist, really, you really do need uh, a settled space. And I did, I began in the early 20, 21st century to be using my computer a great deal more for producing artwork because it was much easier to do that than to be struggling with physical paper and paints and ink and things like that. So it was co it was a constant juggling of resources to see how and where I could produce things. And for the years that I I had a comic strip, which was from 2016 to, no, actually I'm forgetting, it's from 2006 to, I forget, 2012 or something like that, it was around six years. I was drawing, I had got myself to to find a way to make a drawing on paper and then scan it to the computer and then co finish the artwork on the computer. So that's what I did with Suki for many years. I, I functioned like that. I think I'm getting my dates completely wrong, so ignore the whatever, 26, 2016. I, I, I have to be looking at the dates. I don't know. I've forgotten what they are. I uh, continued, I would say I continued to write more easily than I was able to draw. So even when I had a rented home in, in 2010, it would be very many years before I found myself able to paint and to produce artwork on a regular basis. So I'm sorry, I'm, I've been kind of hopping around with dates and I'm not holding a, a clear line of progression because you had asked what, what were the post-harvest years like in terms of work. There was, I, when I look back, I guess there was a long period of uncertainty. And in that period is when I wrote Escape. And then eight years later, followed up with The Island of Lost Girls. And all through that period, I was perhaps writing, I was always writing some small things like columns and so on all the time. But I think the artwork dwindled to just my comic strip when I had it and then the children's books again when I could afford to do them without having to take up a lot of space because I was constantly shifting around. So there was very little continuity so marvelous let's take a digression and i'll begin the digression with an anecdote and uh uh, sort of a, a question and the anecdote is you mentioned you know how the airport said this sign do not tell jokes mm -hmm. so I was in I traveled through Pakistan in 2006 I was covering India's cricket tour there mm -hmm. so at one point me and another cricket journalist we were taking uh, one of those fancy buses from I think Lahore to Islamabad if I remember or Islamabad to somewhere else I've forgotten the exact where we were so anyway so there was this luxury bus mm -hmm. and uh, we bought our tickets and they put as they put our suitcases into the hold my friend had happened to you know show off his sense of humor and he joked <laughs> that hey we are from India how do you know these bags don't contain oh bombs and instantly they hauled our bags out you know made us stand outside the bus made us open our bags checked every little thing and meanwhile I was like grumbling to this fellow that this is not the time for a sense of humor you freaking idiot <laughs> so that was yeah so that kind of uh, uh, was an anecdote I'm, I'm deeply moved by what you mentioned about what Ethan said about bird song <laughs> that uh, you know I, I don't recognize a bird song there mm -hmm. and it is I think such a beautiful 
metaphor of something in the external world that is nevertheless internal to you and it mm-hmm. sort of makes you feel that comfort and peace and so i want to ask you a broader question mm-hmm. you know which in a sense in the context of not being able to feel at home anywhere you already kind of answered but in terms of what brings you comfort uh, my question is what is your bird song that's a nice question but coming as it is from the ether <laughs> Uh <laughs> from the Ethan. <laughs> yeah, no, no. <laughs> from the Amit. It's very hard to say Amit because I suspect that the traveling childhood made me internalize the idea that wherever I am is home and also it's not home in the sense that home is can can shift So the the sense of being grounded wherever I am in some ways it's my suitcase it's it's certain things I I have noticed that I I identify a certain number of physical objects as my things for the moment and they will be things like my handbag or of course my computer my the few gadgets that I must always have with me and when when i am uh, in transit i have a account you know that's like i have six things and i must always keep track of those six things must be with me when i'm in transit there's a, a science fiction story it's not my story i read it many years ago it left me with an a, a kind of um, a gadget which does not actually exist but it's a gadget that i identify as being one of those grounding gadgets and what happens in the story is that the protagonist he he's throwing things out he's downsizing his personal belongings and he notices that he has a large commemorative coin of some sort so a large coin and he um, decides he's going to throw it away and he tries to throw it away and it uh, bounces on it he throws it out of the window and it bounces on the wall and comes back in so it begins to be established that he can't throw it away it it uh, remains with him the story goes to a very different space the space it goes to is that this this object is actually a type of recording device for a movie a kind of they call lifees being made by or an organization or film company in the future that that uses certain gadgets to track the characters that they use for making lifees in the future of the past so if you if you as the protagonist discovers this he finds a way to to connect with this future production company because it turns out that his role is is growing a bit unstable as it would because he has discovered this thing anyway the point is he then tries to influence the course of his life because he realizes he's going to be phased out now the only point of course so so there's so there's a story there's whatever happens what i began to think of was there are things that i've owned and have been in my possession all my life and it has something to do with this moving around and certain things become what you're calling my bird song certain objects and uh just today i gave away one of these objects i gave away my guitar to amartya and it's you know there are other th- objects like that but the guitar has been with me since i was 12 i'm not musical i never learned to play it but i i had it with me all these years so there i would say for me the bird song is not something local it is something that sits with me it's a, quite often as a certain items of jewelry i'm always wearing a certain two or three things i'm always wearing and when i have tried to Uh, I tried for instance to give away a pair of earrings I had. I did give them away. And for maybe a year and a half I didn't wear my I you know it's like I can't be bothered to change my jewelry. I just I just wear the same pair of earrings all the time. I never take them off. And I was uh, I got a slight infection and I had to remove them. 
and then thought, why, you know, why am I wearing these things? Why? I don't need them. And they are not part of my identity, surely. So I can give them away. So I did. I did give them away. And it, it left me uncomfortable for a year and a half before I, I finally recognized that I'm not liking this. I'm not enjoying the fact of having to keep changing my earrings or no, either not wear them, not wear anything. Again, none of these things were sitting comfortably. And, you know, ultimately you do in your life the things that, I, I mean, you can, you can find some I, ideological reason perhaps. For instance, I don't wear any makeup. I stopped wearing makeup in my mid-20s. And that those those kinds of changes were were freeing. Uh, they they released me from the particular trap that, at least in my opinion, some women get into of looking a certain way and then having to maintain that appearance. And that was freeing. But I found, to my mild dismay, that not wearing earrings. That is the you know little ear studs. It 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 continued to bother me, and then I began to say, well, to myself, if it bothers me, then then it's not working. It's not freeing me up. So, uh, however pointless and silly it might be, okay, then I'm going to be wearing earrings, and and I'm comfortable. It is no longer so. For me, those things are what you're calling what you're referring to as bird song. These these small objects that I keep with me, and then because as to to refer back to being a writer, if you're a science fiction writer, you are at least some part of your mind is constantly streaming the the stories that that you might write or that you might become part of. And if since we live in a world of tremendous insecurity and and um, uh, uncertainty, especially political uncertainty, it always strikes me that if I were ever incarcerated, one of the things I would lose is these little objects that I consider part of me. And it would undoubtedly be terribly disorienting. <laughs> so it would be one of the reasons that I'd like to avoid incarceration. If you are ever incarcerated, I promise you that Amartya and I, on your behalf, will file a habeas corpus petition asking not that you be released, <laughs> but that you be allowed to wear earrings inside the prison because once, if you have your bird song with you, you are after all free. I must uh, point out to my listeners here that the Amartya you referred to is the excellent Amartya Ghosh, the musician who's overseeing the technical aspects of this recording for us. I will link his music from Spotify. So uh, a deserving recipient of your Hofner indeed. <laughs> And, you know, I did a recent episode on the YouTube show that I do, uh, Everything is Everything, mm -hmm. where uh, our theme was kind of declutter. Everybody talks about declutter. And I came up with something, you know, pretty similar to what you just said, that there was a time that I would be attached to physical objects, to particular physical mm -hmm. objects. But I've reached the stage where... I am deeply attached to physical objects that I use as tools of my work, like my laptop and my mics and my, mm -hmm. you know, Zoom H6 and my beautiful headphones and all that. But they're all replaceable. So if they stop working, I won't cry. I will instantly order. Amazon will deliver the next day and I will continue with my life. So what I am in love with is those particular functions. Mm -hmm. But I will take the risk of throwing another question at you out of the ether, as it were. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is something I asked a bunch of friends recently when I got together with them. And the answers were really fascinating. And I'll tell you my answer also to set you mm. off. And the question is, can you think of one physical object that sort of represents you or means something to you in a particular kind of way? Like to clarify what I mean by that, mm. the object I came up with was, you know, my dad was in the IS and every year in the 80s and 70s and all mm. that, Sarkari people would get all these diaries mm -hmm, and all mm -hmm. that. So at one point, and when those diaries would come in January or in the end of December, he would give them to me and say, right, you want to be a writer, write in this. <laughs> so in 1986, when I was 12 years old, he gave me this maroon diary mm -hmm. and said, write in this. And recently, 
recently after he died a couple of years back we were clearing out his house i found that diary and i've kept it with me and that diary is poignant mm. because only the first couple of pages are filled and the rest of it is empty oh my goodness and for me i think about how that is my life right. the one thing i wanted to do and the fact mm. that it was undone and uh, you know so it's an object that kind of uh, fits me right. like that's me right there right. and uh, i can't you know sh- obviously share the answers my friends gave yes. but some of them were moving in very different ways but is there something that you can think of that kind of sums it up for you i i mean the f- because one should r- respond with the first thing that comes to mind so yes. for the for me the first thing is a little pouch i always have it is not the same one but i always have some little uh, life saving pouch it often has a number of useful items in it i i'm constantly trying to update it so it just has what it needs i keep trying to to have a changeable pouches you know there so that there's not very much in any one and i so that i can shift but nearly always it settles on one and then i wear it out and i get a new one and it 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 actually links back all the way back to when i was maybe I would I'm going to hazard a guess and say maybe 7 years old. I had a pencil box and I often had quite structured pencil boxes with slots into which you could fit things. And I at that age began to fantasize and it was a long standing I mean it 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 wasn't a dream. It was um a story fantasy in which I had a pencil box in the shape of a for some reason in the shape of a washing machine and it was a tiny it was a tiny thing and in that tiny thing could be fitted any other object any kind of other object including clothes and shoes and maybe a dog or two and anything could be fitted into that so many years later and I, and i built on this theme quite quite rigorously in my in 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 the long long standing long running fantasy of this little object so many many years later when i read the hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy and there's the the universal thing that the, the in which they can i mean the the guide itself you can put things in it you can fit any kind of thing into it and i thought that's that's my thing that's my tiny washing machine come pencil box from when i was 7 so i would say that the little the various little pouches that so, sometimes i have them uh, custom made for me in in leather i i i like real things like i prefer leather to plastic so i sometimes have them made but they all wear out eventually and i replace them and they you know they uh, they would they have that function for me and i'm constantly trying to i stuff them full and the strap breaks and then i tell myself i must uh, downsize and not have i used to have gigantic s- small pouches they they became bigger and bigger and then okay downsized but i want to go back <laughs> to this issue of of objects that matter to one so i i have what what might not be i mean okay so it's a story of something that really did happen and it there's it's a two part story the first part has to do with when i returned from my vanishing in to holland and returned after uh, what for my parents was a five month absence from their lives and family and no one knew where i was for in fact they they thought it was only a month but in fact they hadn't known where i was for 5 months and when i returned from there there was a kind of celebration i mean people weren't ha- weren't sure whether they were furious with me or happy to see me but anyway here i was back and i seemed to be all right and so we were sitting in my parents home in madras and my family my sister and niece and uh, both my parents were oh i'm not sure if both my yes both my parents were there my mother had made what was at one time supposedly a favorite dish i don't really have much in the way of favorite dishes but she knew that i liked a certain kind of freshwater mussel curry mussels m u s s e l and 
So she, it's it's difficult to clean muscles. So it's not a curry that people make lightheartedly. It it requires a lot of effort, and this was made supposedly, and it was made for me. But everyone else also liked it, of course. So we are sitting at table and eating this mussel curry, and I was at the other end from my mother, and I bit down on something, and. Because I am this this is a sign of what type of optimist I am. I bit down on something and thought, oh, it might be a pearl. And it was a pearl. Wow. <laughs> My God. It was a little pearl. And mussels, freshwater mussels do not necessarily they don't they're, they're like oysters, but they're not known to produce pearls, but they do occasionally produce pearls. So I got it was a little, beautiful little pearl. It wasn't spherical. It was a tiny cone-shaped pearl. And so I took it out of my mouth. I showed it to my mother and I said, See, Mom, this is a sign from God that that I'm okay. I'm looked after. And she, she made one of those, Oh, yeah, sure, whatever. <laughs> but, but she did set it in a small ring. She set it as as the centerpiece of a small ring. It was a modest ring in gold with six turquoises around it. The turquoises are important. So some years later, I went to Bhutan. And Bhutan, again, was a huge watershed moment for me because it changed my life in in many many ways. One of the ways was I, I became aware in a, in a real sense, in the sense of actually being there, became aware of the, you know, I had been exposed to the Southern type of Buddhism, that is the Hinayana school, which is the path of sorrow. But the transcendental Himalayan version is the path of joy. At least that's, I'm, I'm calling it that, because in the Himalayan version, you can gain enlightenment in this life. I, not that everyone does, very few people do, but you can. I think this is the important thing. You can. And it seems seemed to me then that that as a result of that, that that tiny country and the people of that country had this extraordinary elevated sense of of, of something indefinable. And anyway, so, okay, so Bhutan did a lot. I I met Ethan in Bhutan, and I spent four months there when I was supposed to be there for two weeks. Anyway, while I was there, I had this ring with me, and one of the um, ladies, the senior ladies in the ministry, I think in the Ministry of Education, but I could be wrong, she was a very charming, delicate, featured, slight, and, and rather beautiful older woman. And she was fascinated by my ring because of the turquoises. The Bhutanese and many Himalayan cultures are fascinated by uh, by turquoise. And she she said, "I really like your ring." And she said it in the way of someone who is actually saying, "I would really like to have your ring." So I took it off and I gave it to her. And that did not sit well with me. And so for some, maybe two weeks, I I found it gnawing at myself. No, 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 that was wrong. That was a wrong thing to do. That that ring is mine in a in a deep way. So I approached her and I said, you know, that's not working for me. I wonder if you could give it back to me. And she said, yes, I understand. And she gave it back. So these this issue of objects that that have a connection. And I don't, believe me, I don't wear it. It's gold and I don't like to be wearing gold these days and, and haven't for many years. I don't wear gold. And at, at least not in any obvious way. My earrings are gold. But anyway, I don't, and that, that ring was a little showy and I never wear it. But it's it's with me. It's mine. <laughs> so these <laughs> these things, these things matter. So if I'm incarcerated, I'm, I'm afraid... You will not be able to ensure anything, but I think it's enough if if you and the few people who will little, listen to this podcast are aware that there are objects belonging to me somewhere, and they still belong to me, even if they're not actually physically on myself. 
So that's also, you know, there there is there is a virtual belonging. It doesn't actually I have learned how to own things and to to keep them with me even when they're not physically on me. They're still there. This is such a lovely story and I have to put a statutory warning at this point to all my listeners please do not put your dog in a washing machine. <laughs> Uh, you know this woman does all kinds of things do not put your dog in a washing machine and you know that was such a lovely story and especially the mention of the gigantic small pouches which is uh, so delightful and also the ring you know i just came across this video yesterday which i rather like it's uh, might also be kind of kitschy but it's a, it's this instagram video by this young woman who is saying that you know if you whatever you think is important now means nothing mm-hmm. imagine life a 100 years from now in uh, uh, to in the year 2123 somebody else will be living in your house if your house is there at all you know nobody will remember who you are do you remember your grandfather's parents no one will give a shit no one will remember who you are and all your things wherever they are will either be decayed or they will be thrown away by people who have no idea of their significance and that includes your rings so there's you know when we talk about mortality it, it is not just a person but it is a significance of all these things yes. which are suddenly stripped of meaning yes and yeah that makes me uh, really sad so let us move to a happier subject <laughs> of but, but uh, before we go to a happier subject i just have to share a moment of a kind of scary hilarity that occurred when at at the time of uh, 9/11 and when we were finally we had been in the US for I don't know whatever 6 months and we're finally returning to India and as i said security had become really extreme and they were also very nervous so they didn't know how to deal with people and so on so th- all of that you know telling people who were not white to stand aside was a bit uh, everyone was finding it awkward and difficult and trying to pretend oh it's not because you're not white it's because you know you uh, uh bought your ticket in delhi or whatever it was and so but both ethan and i had been told to to stand aside for special screening okay fine now and another feature that i have not so far mentioned is i typically always have some kind of cutting device a box cutter always have a box cutter with me i used to i do not at this moment have a box cutter because i have gotten out of that particular habit and i mean i always have at least three or four and one is with me one is in the top pocket of my suitcase and one is in the other suitcase there's <laughs> always you know okay so we had not yet been trained to not be carrying uh, objects but we'd been told what we should not have in a and i had it i knew it was there and it was in my pouch in in the little sling pouch which as i said i often have so there i had my backpack i had my little pouch and the woman who was checking my things said do you have any sharp objects and i said um well i'm an artist and i often have sharp objects with me so i was i was trying to cover my backside if in case she found something and then I realized and I I I reached to unzip and she said no you can't touch it okay so I stood back I was standing back like this and I had given her my pouch and as she was looking in the little pouch she had turned to her colleague and was saying this lady says that she often has cutting devices in her on her possession in her possession and I was watching her she was carefully searching my pouch and she did not find it it was there and i was standing there with a kind of i'm you know completely innocent i am not a terrorist look on my face and she zipped everything up and gave it back to me and i kind of sailed on to the air, uh, aircraft thinking my god <laughs> I have taken a box cutter onto the flight even though she searched which means there could be a terrorist on this flight <laughs> <laughs> Anyway yeah. I have then I have since then stopped doing silly thing it's silly I mean why do that you know why do that and it's not you know it's not an offense they would they just take it away but I no longer therefore carry box cutters in my pouch I used my to sto- 
my storytelling brain is telling me that you know once you are in that plane and you've gotten away with the box cutter you feel it is now your moral responsibility to hijack the plane with the box cutter because yes. fate yes. has brought you here yeah. so no, why but, else but, wouldn't but i had but at that time even then because you know hijacking had been taking place well before so we were all familiar so from the era of hijacking there is a very i i don't i think it's a i think it's a funny joke but it's also very silly and it is this if you in the, from that era when it was bombs not box cutters so the the way to ensure that there is no bomb with a terrorist there's no bomb and a terrorist on board your flight is to yourself carry a bomb because the chances of there being two bombs is very low Therefore, that's plot thinking. That's plot thinking. Yes, yes, of you. course, I know. I studied yeah. statistics. But it's it's the <laughs> it's it's a droll, nevertheless. I mean, you can if you're caught with a bomb, you can say I'm just doing this yes, so that nobody else exactly. carries a bomb. Exactly. Mine won't go off. I right. hope. Right. Yes. <laughs> exactly. And I'm not a terrorist. I'm just carrying it for statistical reasons. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also curious about. what that shift and that gradual settling in as an immigrant in america means for your work because what how we do our work is either we shape the texture of our days around our work or we fit our work into whatever that texture is and i'm guessing that that texture now changes dramatically in this new place uh, because life itself is different so a how does you know how do your habits change is it difficult for you to build that kind of discipline do the same kinds of things and also th- how does your art change because of the shift you know i i i imagine that had you just stayed back in delhi and never shifted never gone mm-hmm. there except to visit there would have been some subtle differences in what you write about or how you write about them and perhaps even in the quantity of your work mm-hmm. uh, so to tell me a little bit about the effect of that on uh, your work if if one can possibly disentangle it's these hard things. it's obviously it's hard for me to be doing that and there was because as it is i'm hugely self referential in the sense that i have i have a different stages had long running column i've had a comic strip i i had written getting there which is a personal memoir and and of course i had written escape which is when one thinks about what happens in escape which is about a country which of course i i do not name the country but in in fact in, in my mind it's not that it's india it's it's really sort of south asia in which a group of vicious <laughs> cloned generals has decided on the on behalf of their entire nation that the world will be better off without women and have actually destroyed all the women of that culture and there the book involves one little girl who has remained hidden and the the effort made to get her out of that country of that region and this could some level be seen as a very abstract version of what it certainly i but in some ways what many authors attempt to do which is to escape their circumstance in order to live another life or a, a hopefully a better life but what happens in escape and and the novel that follows it which is called the island of lost girls is to begin with it's hard to escape and then the middle portion because there will be i'm writing the third book of this series the middle portion is the real is the terrible realization that when you've escaped what do you escape to it's not as if there is some paradise outside there never is and you you by by changing everything about your circumstance you you are left with this this giant question of who are you anyway when you're not speaking you're speaking not uh, some language that is not your language in whatever way you're speaking it because of course in the books there are translation devices but she, it's like she therefore is speaking in a way that she, even she doesn't particularly understand and in fact she's been um, at least in the first three quarters of the second novel 
she's been d- divested of her memories. So she she really deeply doesn't know who she is. And she is so different from all the others because all the other girls, all the other young women in the place where she's been taken for her protection, those women are so damaged that she, who has not had, not n- barely, she doesn't really even know what it means to be female because she has grown up in a in a context where there are no other females she's the only one and therefore she doesn't know what she is and the others who in their response to her are hostile because she is so unfamiliar she's so unused to to the abuse that they have they know as their only life that as someone who is who has never been abused, she becomes a different kind, a kind of reverse victim. And that, in a, in a sense, these two novels explore, if, if I can be allowed to say this, they explore the otherness that, in a sense, I have, I have internalized as, in some ways, my life. Because I think by whatever means and without actually choosing it i have lived a somewhat protected i mean protected in very many ways life in a world where very few people are protected especially very few women are protected so i have grown up with a, without a sense of uh, fear and without a sense of being oppressed in a world where most women are, even extremely privileged women. So it's it's a kind of, you. one could say it's a kind of positive othering, but any othering is has the effect of reminding you that you are not like others. And, you know, you might, you might find, uh, you know, you might find w- many ways to be adjusted to that. Uh... But it is, if if you want to feel sorry for yourself, which of course I don't, you could tell yourself it's lonely. In another context, there's a, a kind of othering that has possibly reduced in recent times, which is the othering of science fiction, where people will often think of it as, oh, it is a genre. While I more and more think that it is science fiction above everything else that engages with the best, with the most important questions of our times and comes up with the most striking metaphors. Like even in your own work, you speak about that question that comes after Escape, you know, in the second book about, you know, what do you escape to? And that is such a, a, a much larger and much more resonant question and uh, you know all the way you know right from Atwood and Ursula Le Guin and all the way to modern times with people like Ted Chang and Ken Liu and the kind mm-hmm. of work they do I think the best science fiction is actually the the best literature because you're engaging with those questions in a way that you know other forms uh, possibly aren't and and I want like what drew you to science fiction to begin with what was it this aspect of it that you can explore these big questions and would you sort of get attracted to the story and come to the larger question and the larger theme later or would you begin with the larger theme and then the story would suggest itself like is there a sense of that or is that also hard to disentangle I I can only say that my interest in a certain kind of strange story began when I was 11, 12, 13 in Thailand. And I, again, I, I can't disengage whether the experience of in the previous three years when I was 8, 9, 10 in Delhi, when we had returned to Delhi from uh, other places, and I came to understand in a very precise way because of suddenly being thrown into school with um, uh, Indian children who were not used to people who had spent time outside India. So I was regarded as odd. And it was always difficult for me to establish firm friendships. I was much more comfortable with my parents, uh, my sister's age group, whereas people of my age seemed to be um, seemed to be much more rigid in what they liked and what they knew. I remember when we would play these, these certain kinds of 
childish games, uh, ch you know, these written games where you, you make lists of things and you you have to name, you know, three colors, three animals, three. So the colors, you know, they, it's like, I, I, it's the fact that I even continue to remember such a silly thing. It's like the others were naming colors like yellow, blue, and red. And I would be going to scarlet and magenta and, uh, you know, indigo. And this was regarded as weird. Why was I doing that? And how do you even spell the stupid words? And um, this sense of always being slightly outside the loop. And I, I imagine that one type of person yearns to belong, but I did not yearn to belong. I was very happy. I, I, was, I was constantly attempting to get others to be like me. And if they wouldn't be like me, then too bad. It was not, you know, the, and the knowledge that in a short while we'll move in any case, so it doesn't matter. That there was there were there were all of these other trends. So when I became aware of a certain kind of odd story, which was when I was 11, 12, 13 and in Thailand and I had access, I think I already mentioned it to a huge library. The kind of stories and I also the, I also had access to huge stocks of of comics, comics of the not, you know, what we what remains from that era is comics like Archie, but in that era there were there were certainly two or three different trends. One was the superheroes, was Superman and Batman and the Justice League of America and Green Lantern and all of these kind of mostly guy types superheroes, and then there were all the cute, funny characters like Casper the Friendly Ghost. And Casper had a, a buddy who didn't always appear with him called Hot Stuff, a little cute little devil. And there was many child characters called Little Lotta and Dotty and all kinds of, and very many of them. And you could get them easily. They were available and, you know, easily available. And in fact, we traded them in school. We, we shared them. And this range of imagineering, which you can see in that, because very many of them were very standard everyday lives, like Dennis the Menace and uh, Tweety and Sylvester and all of They all showed a certain extreme middle-class home in the U.S., not, not in, locally to where I was. And... Some of them, and again, I remember very specifically certain episodes on TV, in TV cartoons or in these comics, where something surreal would happen. That would interest me. And that looking for that surreal moment, the thing that, oh, something has happened outside of physics, began to attract my attention. So I was following up with an interest. I had, I adored Tarzan, Tarzan, both comics and the books. There are, there's a fabulous series of written books. So then I followed the other books by Edgar Rice Bros. And that, you know, then, then one is leaning in towards science fiction. And then, of course, on TV, there was The Twilight Zone, and Outer Limits, and Lost in Space. And these, you know, what does one choose to watch? What does one... I, in fact, I watched everything, whatever there was on TV. But these were the things that I especially didn't want to miss. So that interest began early. It began with with things read and things seen. But I remember in my boarding school, when we had very little spare time when I went to in the school I went to in Kode Canal Presentation Convent in Kode Canal, it was in that era that I began tiny. When I say tiny, I mean two in small exercise books, maybe two or three page weird stories, and I can, I can remember them, kind of open ended, with no with no real purpose, but but a feeling of strangeness, which I enjoyed. And I, I guess 
the early urge to write was to repeat that that pleasure with strangeness, a, str a sense of being outside of the normal and and being comfortable with it, settling down with it. So I, I don't know whether I have wandered too far away from your question for it to actually matter anymore. <laughs> but you, you, you might have a marvelous imagination, Manjula, but you cannot wander too far away from my question because your whole purpose is to make you wonder. So which, that's, you know, tell me also about both in the context of your drawing where you already mentioned it, but also in the context of your writing, how computers change the game. Because again, I imagine that when you started writing in the 70s and so on, you're writing by hand on paper and etc, cetera, etc, cetera, the same way I started. And then at some point you go to maybe typewriters, I don't know if there's a transition, but you shift to computers and computers are really different because there is a backspace, whereas writing on a piece of paper forces you to go at a certain slow, certain mm -hmm. slow speed. It on the one hand, it forces you to think more slowly and, you know, in a more considered way. But on the other hand, it might even cramp your style and not let you think as fast as you want. Computers are a whole different ball game. So tell me a little bit about how these changing forms sort of change. I mean, is, is that something you ever noticed or thought about in the context of both the drawing and uh, the writing? And was there also a change in the writing, not just because of the change of your instrument, but but also because of the change of the shape of your day. Mm. Like in modern times, especially, and I hope you're not as much prey to it as people like me have unfortunately fallen. But in modern times, you're always looking at the smartphone and, you know, we are constantly mm. distracted and have to kind of battle that. And the thing is, when you are like that, the rhythm of your thinking changes you that sometimes you're in danger of losing that terror and have to figure out ways of finding it. Mm. So give me a sense in terms of your work on how both the tools and just the texture of your day is changing how that has affected your work? Well, I made the transition to typewriters very early because when I began working for the first magazine for which I worked, which was called Parsiana, so I was 20 or 19, 19 and a half. I was straight out of BA when I started my MA. I began working for this small magazine. And the editor, Jahangir Patel, absolutely forbade anyone working for him to work with a paper and pencil. So we had to start to think on the typewriter. Now, I loved machines. I, I was very happy to work, to be working with a machine. And I had, as even before that, as a child, when I was alone, I spent a lot of time alone in Thailand. And there was a big old Remington in the house. And I would, I had a I had attempted to start an in-house, that is just for that house, newspaper of occurrences and incidents in the house. So I, I had started to use it to type up stories which were immediately destroyed by anyone else who happened to come across them. Um, but so in in Parsiana, I was very happy to make the transition and you quickly learn the, the techniques. I, I remember the shift to computers began in when I was in Delhi and working for the Center for Science and Environment, and we were all being trained how to use the big clunky uh, computers. And I remember the sense of uh, dismay, you know, that you you know your hand keeps going for the return, <laughs> <laughs> and it, there's nothing. And and the the sense of because with that with the early software. You had to format the machine to begin with, even to accept any commands. And then when you have a blank space and you see the cursor blinking, it doesn't mean that the rest of the space that you can see is available to you. You can't move the cursor down except by the space bar or, you know. All of these adjustments, which were disorienting, but... I I was very ready <laughs> because I liked I I was very electronic ready. I was very fond of I liked machines. I liked working with them. I liked the sense of the gradual sense of awareness that the machine begins to have. I I invested uh, all kinds of gadgets with personalities. I had a sense of you know uh, not being rude to my equipment, not being unkind to them and being being careful how I looked after things. 
the sense of, you know, the room is alive with little objects that are either watching or... So you can see that in some of my, my cartoon strips. The, the telephone is self-aware and it sometimes communicates with other gadgets and sometimes not. But the sense of uh, an awareness in all things was something that um, I just live with. It's it's not It's not frightening to me, but it's... It's. Uh, I feel contained by a sense of consciousness of other things, and of course, gadgets because they are blinking. You know, there's a light, there's a sense of life. But I, I have also grown much more relaxed with that sense. I'm not. You know, it's like I'm not as respectful as perhaps I should be, and I am glad that they still say please. I mean, they don't say please, but. I think the gadgets are still fairly polite. They they don't they no longer say as they used to. What I forget the fail delete ab- abort. <laughs> control all delete. <laughs> no, that's control all delete. But yeah. if if you had messed up and the the message you got was something something and abort, and there was a moment in in the world when people said abort is a really horrible word <laughs> to, to use. So you no longer see that. But I I kind of enjoyed the the kind of machine consciousness, you know, the way that it was very, very abrupt, but also completely truthful. You 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 couldn't, you know, it would just tell you, okay, fail. <laughs> it's just fail. <laughs> <laughs> There's no please or thank you. You failed and you have to reboot. And it's all very abrupt. And you can see that that it's you know there's a black screen, there's green letters, and it's very, very basic. In that way, I really, really, I I would say that one of the. I as I keep talking about benchmark moments. For me, another huge benchmark moment was playing the DOS text version of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy game. Whoa! So, so it's a DOS text game. You have a blank screen, you have a blinking cursor, and it's oh, <laughs> you're in you have you have no instructions. And there's there's nothing to do except to keep trying to get it to go beyond that blinking cursor. And I can't I can't even begin to explain in what you know, I kind of melded with the machine for the whatever length of time I attempted to play to the end, and and the end is completely without anything except Yao. You have arrived on the surface mm-hmm. of the planet Magrathia. That's it. End. And I must have spent. I think that final portion was maybe three hours continuously at night. I would say that that was. Perhaps foundational in in getting me into this other phase of my life where machines are so much a part of my life that I don't I don't really think of it as a as another thing. It's just an extension, and making the shift from paper and to on to software which like Photoshop is what I use to draw with. So I use Photoshop as a drawing tool, not to fix photographs, but to fix uh, or to augment the the drawings that I have created on paper. So I don't, I usually, dis, I don't like to actually draw to pr- produce a primary image electronically does not interest me. It's because I, I discovered some time ago, a long time ago, that that there is a a disconnect when when my hand is drawing if i'm physically drawing on paper i can't talk at the same time but my mind will my mind my words cut out or my hand cuts out if i'm talking i can't continue drawing i i can force myself but why would i do that so by contrast i can work electronically and continue to talk so i think it's using Working electronically is using two different areas of the brain, the the speech 
does not speech does not allow me to draw phys- on paper but speech and electronic work is it's you know it seems to be the same area so i would say but i, I would say that i made the transition easily and smoothly over because the 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 software gets better and better and it it is so i mean most people would be shocked to hear that i use photoshop to draw with because there's so many other tools but i i don't i don't use those other tools so even though i know about them i feel un, until i'm forced to retrain the way i think because there's a bezier drawings you know where you use um, a, a kind of uh, a pen tool to create curves so i i don't i haven't transitioned i know what it's like to do that but it doesn't it it's because i i'm lazy and i would need to retrain the way i think to use them and i haven't made the effort it's much easier for me to draw on paper which i like the thing is i enjoy that i enjoy the sense of drawing on paper and and in recent years i have reconnected with with drawings on paper so i do a great deal of that I I use charcoal I really enjoy it. I started using charcoal only 5 6 years ago and didn't realize what a sensitive medium it is. I always thought my goodness how do people ever do anything in charcoal it is a big thick thing. But I realized I realized I was wrong. <laughs> and and it is a fabulous medium. So you know I really enjoy that. And just the other day someone I I said something about uh talking to people who who talk lightheartedly about how much they love to write or you know to be in the midst and i was saying you know i i don't even understand that because uh, because i wouldn't i would never say that i love to write because it it doesn't even occur to me to think that way because it's just what i do it's not something that i would say i love to do it's i i'm very happy at the end when i mean there's a wonderful 5 seconds of having finished a book that's fabulous that lasts about as i said 5 or 10 seconds and then after that there's the heavy slog of getting it out of there getting to you know getting it obviously getting it to the publisher is not a physical process but that whole thing of of then showing that piece of work to others and, and recognizing that they will either dismiss it or not love it as much or whatever it is that they say or do it is altered immediately by that you know so that moment when it is fresh and nobody else has seen it no one has heard it no one even knows that you're working on something or maybe they do but you know they have no idea that's wonderful that's a great moment but it passes and everything else is then the downhill so but the writing is i i can't say that i enjoy the writing by contrast i really enjoy drawing i really like it i look forward to it i budget time for it i'll squeeze it in to between other things it's like eating candy and again it's working towards the end So sometimes you know I will put in whatever five or six hours finishing something and it'll be a mess I'll hate it and I'll sit quietly for a little while and then start another one because I want that that you know that thing. So it, they are very different in that sense. I didn't like your analogy of it's like eating candy because you know sugar is poison and candy <laughs> yes, is also yes. working towards the end. Exactly. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, and I, I, I love the image of the room being alive with all kinds of little objects which are like looking at you. And I'm gonna try that. But my worry is that I'll go to bed and then I won't be able to sleep because from a distance I will hear my laptop call out to me and say, "You haven't shut me for five days. Yeah. There are eight hundred tabs open. What do you think I am?" Yeah. Etc. Etc. Yeah. Et all of this happens. <laughs> all, of the, all of this happens. All of the above. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about your rediscovery of Suki because you have Suki go on for a long time in the 80s and 90s and then it's over and then you come back to it after more than a decade yeah. and it lasts for a few years like you mentioned right. but what is it like to rediscover Suki because through this period of time you have also changed and uh, what is that process of getting to know Suki again is has she also changed how does that play itself out what does rediscovering suki tell you about yourself hmm. well suki and i have always 
always had a slightly complex relationship because in the very very early strips you can see you can see that she the i of suki is clearly supposedly me and you can see that in the in what happens in the strips because there is the, the it's addressed directly but uh maybe a year or two down the line because suki then was weekly so i had a i had time in which to compose each each new episode and when it began to she began to separate from me and i no longer thought of her as i but she so then she she very she developed as the you could say you i mean i don't know who would make the point but you could, it could be said that she represents my id in the sense that she is the unregenerate version of myself where i never cut my hair and it is always curly and kind of bushy and full which it in fact is not and she never has a job she never has to i mean every so often in the past she used to sometimes fret about paying rent but it never actually came to anything she she had a very um authoritarian mother who again it, you know the mother didn't last long in the strip and the the kind of friction free life that suki lives is very much the life of my mind so it it is a friction free atmosphere in which she lives and i suppose it it is in that sense she is close to my life and that is always the case i mean even if she has frictions with some people in some of the characters after all i'm the one drawing them and i can always draw them out and that that happens when whenever something doesn't work i just uh, no longer represent it 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 ceases it ceases to be of consequence she hasn't i mean the the it's one of those things that is uh, i mean i keep saying things are hard to explain it's always been a point that i've tried to emphasize i created suki as part of wanting to earn a living it is it never she never existed in a a non-financial uh, vacuum she always had to be paid for and that is one of the reasons why in theory even though i could in theory always be producing her i never do and i have tried i have tried to produce strip because you know you can put anything online uh so many people uh, uh upload their thoughts or their diaries and, and begin to earn a living from doing that well i have never had the slightest doubt that suki would never earn anything <laughs> because <laughs> the 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 curious irony is that i'm always told it is always it's often said not always but it's often said of me that i have a highly popular comic strip this is the exact opposite it was never popular it was always regarded as weird and not in not at all like the existing comic strips which are from the west and which are from you know a tremendously organized outlets where the 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 strip is not created at all in a lighthearted casual way they they may look that way but they're not and the fact of being hugely supported by the distribution network makes makes everything that happens in the in those comics the comics that come through syndicates they 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 are very very much more it's not the sophistication is not merely in the end product it's in what underlies the creation of those uh, of items that have that have been paid for by small sums of money paid out by millions of newspapers whereas my product was only ever featured in one newspaper so the entire commercial underpinning of that one item is it's it's actually very difficult for anyone to even be thinking about what it means it's it's hard to express that 
it's hard to even think about it because no one thinks about the underlying economics of comic strips, how they how they get to the daily newspapers and what it represents. That the the ninety percent, ninety five percent of them all come out of two or three syndicates in the West, and what they represent in terms of a lifestyle. Whereas Suki was always battling her competitors were these incredible long-standing uh, heroes of the little strips, whereas she had no audience. She did not have people who supported and liked her in any way, except one person that is the editor who may own... I mean, Vinod Mehta was the dream editor to have because he loved comic strips and he never got in my way in terms of trying to tell me what to do. Other editors have been very kind and supportive, but they I I never got the sense that they they interacted with the strip in the way of somebody who is a comic strip uh, appreciator. And that is it's like uh, there are consumers, you know, there are people who just consume it and they don't think about it anymore. There are others who understand the underlying principles, and they like it in a different way. But there are very few people like that, and very few editors. So for me, uh, co the this comic strip and Suki was always a kind of um, uh, stand-up, like, like being a stand-up comedian without a room, without an audience, but a mic in the sense that I had that space. And what can I say? It It was... Whenever I've had the strip to produce, it's like a, an area of the brain opens up, like a desk opens up, and there it is, you know, to do, a thing to do. So it's it's an ongoing gathering process that you gather things towards that. that it, it's also gathering energy. I always have to budget the time and make sure that just before deadline, I have the time in which to produce that thing. <laughs> I I think you know be, being a bit harsh on yourself and on Suki like I'll go back to what I said earlier that I think Suki would certainly be uh, you know it's in that category yes where it's loved by a few but not necessarily liked by many but I would say it's actually loved by many but the problem is that because of technologies of the past you don't get to hear from them you just get to hear from the editor and everything else that you hear you meet someone socially they say hey we really like sushi that's you know that happens but too rarely whereas today I think technology and I've experienced this personally over my time blogging and over my time podcasting and also as a columnist where I never heard from any readers when I wrote columns for newspapers but today technology allows uh, readers to give you a sense of the following that there actually is for whatever you're producing so I would actually argue that if you were to do Suki on your own today and go online you would probably be surprised by uh, you know the reception that you get but I also understand that in one's mind one often compartmentalizes mm -hmm. and says there are some things I'll do for money though I'll do them really well and I love them but I'll do them for right. money and other things are a labor of love right. And what are your labors of love? Wow. Not much. <laughs> your art? Well, the art is, is all, yes, I guess that would be that. But the, it's like, it's actually mental spaces. There's a certain way of thinking that is the, you know, the, the kind of pleasure thinking. <laughs> and I don't actually sketch much. I I plan to put down a to create a drawing or a painting and then when I'm it's has to do with the time management because there's big time management issues for me there there are things that I must do and then there are the things that I do in the hope that I it will eventually result in a painting or some for instance I've I never write just like that I never do that. I I need to be commissioned. And I mean it like I, I I'm starting with out with my, the third book of the uh, Escape Island series. But I've already signed a contract for that. So I I know it's kind of it's there. Whereas so it would be paintings. But paintings, you know, it's like 
I work towards that finished product. I, I do enjoy it. I do enjoy the process of getting it down. But there is always a hope that it will not be like a tree that falls in a forest where no one's going to hear it. This is a tree that falls in full public view, I hope. <laughs> so, I, uh, I, I mean, I, at most what I do is I have passion projects that I, I hope to realize, but I am always expecting that it will be something, whatever I'm working on will be published or will be exhibited or used in some way. I have grown used to that the sense that a thing I produce will actually find its way outside of me. So there is, there is alongside all the little objects in my room that are thinking, <laughs> there is also a, a team, a kind of a council of audience in my head who are always uh, sitting in judgment of everything that I'm doing. And and I have to and I will often do things regardless of what they're yelling at my at me from the gallery. Oh, stop that! Stop that! You know you can't do that. No, no, stop it. You'll go down some other path. And all of this, there's that that chorus is always there. Then that's a dangerous chorus, isn't it? Like, do you listen to it less and less as time goes by? Do you wish it wasn't there? No, I don't. I don't wish it wasn't there. It's I can't. It's it's there. It's there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I I wish the chorus of things were telling you don't worry about that other chorus just listen to us and produce work. That would be uh so nice. One of the quest one of the questions you asked was about the working life I have had in the US. So, you would imagine that having a space all to myself because for the largest time I've had in a small place in which I lived in Newport all to myself in t- that's where i began to rent in 2010 and you know authors and artists all say that they yearn for that you know for that away space well i have spent hours and hours and hours days weeks months doing nothing at all uh that is just getting the laundry done or uh, i mean one of the one of the late life is i can't call it a discovery because you know we all need to eat but i'm not a, i've never been interested in cooking and i am still not uh, at all interested in being a chef but whereas in the pre rented accommodation uh, world i just you know i very rarely had to produce edible food and would just produce I, if I had to, uh, you know, it would be at the toast and cheese level. In this rented space, I finally recognize that it can't. It can't just be that. I I have to learn, uh, make some effort to be a little more competent. And years before my, I mean, years before this this era, one of my I have two nieces and a nephew. But one of the nieces got tired of hearing. Uh, uh, stories of my incompetence and she taught me to make uh, a particular kind of biryani and for many years I lived off lived off in the sense that I didn't make it for myself but I would make it for other people as a sign that I am even even I am capable mm-hmm. of doing this much I can do this and it would be hugely appreciated it was horribly rich very tasty but of course it's a big heavy dish and I'm certainly never going to be making it whipping it up for myself the thing the thing that i learned as 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 a resident of the small apartment i was in when i say small it had two rooms it had a bathroom and a kitchen and a hallway and that's it and they were all small rooms i mean one room was the size of the studio and the other room was maybe a a, a half again bigger anyway i subscribed to a meal service called blue apron where they send you a carton of uncooked food and a menu and and a recipe um, uh, instructions and and i would sweat over this <laughs> but and often produced half cooked and un- because i i i have al- always known that the thing that f- i didn't like was the sound of frying so everything would be un- undercooked because the sound would 
terrify me and I would think it's uh, going to burn down the house and all these things. But the big thing, I'm not a good chef. I, I still cannot, I would never say that I can cook. But Blue Apron for three years helped me overcome the resistance to cooking. Now I will, I will do things. I will make things. I can follow a recipe. I'm never going to be good at it. Anyway, the reason we got into all this was to talk about my artwork. But this is the point. Art and writing have to grow out of real things. And one of the pleasures of, to the extent that I've learned to cook, of learning to cook, is the realization that millions upon hundreds and thousands of millions of people produce wonderful food on a daily basis. And this is their fabulous gift that I don't have. And that it is a real thing. It is a, a real gift. And even though part of my issue is that I don't, I don't have a, a sensitive palate, I don't have a very a clearly defined sense of taste. And I, again, I realized this many years ago when I, when I simply didn't believe friends who said things like, oh, there's too much ginger in this. And I used to wonder, how can they possibly tell? You can't possibly know something like that. I have realized since then that, yes, <laughs> you can actually <laughs> tell such things. I never, I, it, would, it nev never made any, any impression on me if, you know, it would be I like or I don't like something. It, it, I could never tell something so specific as it didn't have this or it has too much of that. I have improved in this sense. I, I understand what that means. And that feeds back into artwork in the sense that artwork is all about detail and a sense of proportions. And, and I have understood that, it, you know, this extends to many fe features of life. But for all that I'm saying, I began to live in this place in 2010, and it was only in 2020 that I met other artists in Newport. Until then, I had not met any artists. And in 2010, if you recall, which is when the pandemic began and everything was shutting down, I was I came to know of this small gallery in a nearby. I mean, it's continuous with Newport. It's called Middletown. The gallery is called De Bloy. And it is a cooperative gallery, meaning that there is no controlling, you know, there's no office uh, or a production company holding it together. We run it. And I, the, many galleries have a, have a, a concept where they, they make a show available to anyone in in the region who has work that they want to show then they have what is called an open show and you sign up for it and for two or three weeks your work will be uh, uh, featured displayed alongside other people's work and you know there's a little bit of fuss about it about that, that show so after many years of not doing anything in in the sense of an exhibition, I produced two paint, two drawings, and they got a little tiny notice. And the other people, the other gallery members, said, you know, they came up to me and said that is nice. They really liked that work, and I I hadn't had that experience for so very long. It was like completely unfamiliar to be. Uh, appreciated just for the work, not for who I am or why I am or anything else, just the work itself. It was a kind of revelation. And I asked if I could become a member and they said yes, because of course, you know, obviously even to participate, you pay for that. You, you, don't, it, you don't just throw it onto their walls for free. But as a member, you have to you it you know you you can exhibit something every month, so but you also have to put in hours of work, of not not long hours, but you put in hours of work at the gallery doing work in the gallery, and um, all of this was a kind of extraordinary revelation because I'd never done anything like that in India, and of course. I hadn't been to art school, so the the um, experience of working 
in connection, not even alongside, because we don't work alongside one another. We, we're, we're all separate. We have our separate lives and our separate establishments. But the the concept of being in collaboration with other working professionals was something completely unfamiliar to me. I had not done that before. And all the others are all working artists in their later years. No one is, I mean, there are now a few younger artists, but there are only 19. Even at the moment, there are only 19. And the majority of us are 70 plus. So these are people who have been working their whole lives as artists. They're all good. None of us is interested in being, um, you know, event artists or in, uh, sort of um, very, a few of us produce objects which are other than traditionally artistic. There are one or two like that. But the huge majority of us can actually paint. We are good at it. So that this this wonderful sense of being surrounded or being working alongside people who are all good, who are who have gotten over the ego things. And of course everyone has some kind of ego, but we're also good at working together and being supportive. It's just fabulous. And it has made a huge, huge difference to my sense of myself as an artist. I have produced a lot more work. I sell work. It's been really fabulous. And I, I think one of the things that was most touching for me was the ease, the smooth ease with which I was just accepted. Without any I can't I I can't say it enough. It's not even at the level of where are you from. Okay, you want to be a member, great, sign up here. We are sit down. You know, sit down and that's the cash box and you run the you know just you just accepted without any fuss. I was just blown away. And it continues I mean I, I say this to them. It's like we we laugh over it. I, I call myself their resident alien and we all laugh. <laughs> but it's it's also that, you know, I'm still doing things for them like tonight, late tonight. Uh, so for me, it'll be 4 a.m. There is an uh, a regular monthly Zoom meeting. So I'll be part of that. And it's, as I said, it's um, it's been huge for me to work alongside because all these years I've been solitary. I like personally I love the mention you made earlier of Blue Apron. Like just as Blue Apron was something that got you to cook, I wonder if artists need different kinds of blue aprons in their life to take them in certain directions and you know make things uh, uh, easier for them. I'm also intrigued by one more thing. You've, of course, been an artist all your life in many different mm -hmm. ways, in many different forms, including writing and comic strips and so on and so forth. And yet this is almost feels like a new journey that you've embarked upon in a new way, mm -hmm. in the sense that it's not just a solitary act now. There is that sense of community and yet everyone working separately, but with that sense of, you know, there are sort of others with you. And I wonder in these times how one things about that in the context of the journeys that people make like the typical impression we've had all through history is that if you're an artist you know often especially if you're a musician and so on you strike it big young and then you are kind of uh, the, there's a danger of getting ossified as what you are of course but essentially you become something when you are young and the rest of your life is a journey just refining that and new journeys are seldom taken partly because of the reason that lifespans just used to be so right. low until relatively recently mm -hmm. expectancies were so low and yet you have great cases like the, the person I am most inspired by is Penelope Fitzgerald who wrote her first book when she was 68 uh, in 58 and her first novel in her 60s and ended up winning the Booker Prize and writing just a bunch of great novels uh -huh. and I find that inspiring myself that it is never too late that one can redefine oneself and learn new things and it isn't just about what you were at 30 and the rest of your life you elaborate upon right. that but there are new journeys to be taken so do you get a sense of that also that there is a new Manjula that you are a new person that what you have done in the last few years is completely different from what you've done in the past you're creating yourself again um yes and no it's just because 
from the time I was very young, it it was very clear to me that I would be an artist, and then being a writer was a kind of add-on, and then later on it became, I'll be a writer with an with art on the side, and then somewhere in the midst of all, because all along I was attempting to earn for myself. I was not supported by any foundation or my parents. Because, as I ha- have said in the past, at 21, I stopped accepting money from my parents. And that has been tremendously, it has it has very much formed who I am, the need to earn a living. One of the features of, of being connected to this gallery in Newport, and where I'm living in Newport, is the realization that all the other things the, of my the others other members at the at the gallery are equally in this in the sense of being as being artists are equally solitary people we are not people seeking a companionship i mean some some of the others are young enough to have their families around them all the time and others have you know their families have grown up and grown away but essentially everyone is working as a as an solitary and i i'm going to make a a cultural point here i have a feeling that it is not something familiar to the indian world to live as a solitary person it is we are very much more collectives and uh artists who who make it good here they kind of they are supported by their whole family and the space is made for them and but they're still very much part of a network and the otherness of an artist's life is something that they they do on the side whereas it seems to me both my life and the other li- the other artists in my uh, gallery and artists in general in that space are people who who work for you know on their own and they uh, and are they f- they form their personalities as as private private inner worlds so in it, what has changed is i am not i it's like i would say one of the features of of living long enough is a is like a constant refining a throwing off of things that are less important and a constant re clarifying what one is you know i'm this i'm this i'm this earlier on in the conversation you mentioned about how when you were in america it became a, a ritual for you to have a morning call with your sister mm-hmm. that you would make sure you spoke to her every day and i'm wondering about such rituals in your life and the role of intentionality in it like often there are many things that we take for granted and they get normalized and we don't make intentional efforts about them whether it is with regard to our relationships or to the work that we do etc or, or even to self care and i wonder if over the years there are things that you become more intentional about whether it is in whether it is keeping in touch with friends and family whether it is you know devoting a certain amount of time to practicing your art or your writing or whatever or whether it is just giving enough time to yourself and uh, to loving yourself in a sense so what are the things you are intentional about i play wordle every night <laughs> 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 i it used to be something else twister or something like that so i i often end the night actually it's not wordle i play wordle in the morning at night i play for that we always have four games for boards of the scrabble version called uh, it's not actually scrabble but it's called words with friends and uh my sister in connecticut and i play four games all all, all the time so we we we're not playing at the same most often we're not playing at the same time we we fill, we you know we play our moves on four games and then come back to it every so often to see uh whether she has moved or i have moved and be continue so that is quite often the last thing i do at night and i try to keep a diary so in recent weeks i have found that it's a nice thing to do to not write the diary at night it's just a page 
But to wake up in the morning, I'm not an early riser in the sense that I, I don't wake up easily. It's a struggle. And one of the habits that I'm trying to break for myself is the habit of waking up and even before I'm out of bed checking my phone. Because of living in two time zones, typically at night or in the morning, a, a, a raft of I, of messages will come in. So I have tried to stop myself from checking any electronic device because I, I think it's not good for the eyes to not do that for about half an hour. So I'm trying to train my, this is very recent, trying to train myself to when I wake up to set up, I spend a lot of time working in bed. That is, I, uh, I'll make my bed, but I'll sit on the bed and write. I like to write sitting in bed with my laptop on my lap, on a cushion. But I tried, I have been trying to make myself write my diary entry for the day before in the morning because it's by hand, you know, it's, it's with a pen on paper and I'm not staring at my, um, at any device. So that's, you know, I'm, I will admit that I'm constantly trying to improve myself. So there are, I've just heard that there are, that it's become apparently a really hot thing to do sit ups from a sitting position. It's it's supposedly not not squatting on the ground. Uh, I would not survive that. But apparently the world's uh, um, designers of good exercises for lazy people is a lot of exercises from chairs. So apparently sitting up and sitting down very fast for just a count of two, uh, of even half a minute is good. And if you can, uh, there are various routines that you can add to that. And that's all very good. So I'm certainly at that age when things like back aches and shoulder aches and so on are all settling in for the long haul. So I, you know, I try to always do something to, you know, to over, to overcome those issues. One point that I have done, one exercise that I do every single day and have for at least 50 years is a back exercise because many, many years ago, a friend, a family doctor said to me in reference to uh, an observation he had made, I have a very flexible back. People who are flexible, you know, when you're young, it's treated as, oh, how nice, you're so flexible, you can do this, that, and the other. But that can result in early back issues. And he taught me, if you do these three, uh, two, -ish, two back uh, exercises every day, you will be saved the more obvious problems of back issues from being sedentary. So I do, in fact, I, who am not... Uh, who don't have many habits and who don't, I'm a person who does not follow through with most routines. This is something I actually do every day. Well, that's quite inspiring and I'm going to get inspired by you every day. I will sit down on my chair and I will take half a minute to stand up again. That's what you mean no. by half a minute, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. yeah. well, I thought I could get away with that. You know, Amartya could tell you, we lazy Bengalis, uh, any, uh, you know, once we are sitting, why stand? Exactly. I mean, I can imagine lying yes. down. Well, I'm but, already yeah. halfway there. I'm in the bed. I'm, I'm, I'm reclining. You know, I look at a body of work where you have done art and illustrations and comic books and you've written plays and you've written books and you've written short stories and you've written science fiction and you've written newspaper columns and you have the audacity to say you're not successful hello excuse me it's it's a beautiful powerful body of work i'm sure it's moved many people so uh, you know please and and i actually wonder if you were born in the current day what you would have done because just in terms of the means of production now being available to all creators mm -hmm. uh, more ways to actually make money from mm -hmm. what they they do and the the solution of forms mm -hmm. so that you can you know just into a, a writer has so many more options in terms of the forms they can use mm -hmm. you know uh, artists do as well in in the audio visual medium also it's just exploded so you know the, the golden age starts now so uh, please spend the next 50 years well <laughs> but my, my my sort of uh, final question for you mm -hmm. uh, for me and my listeners mm -hmm. uh, you know recommend to 
us books music art films any kind of um, uh, creation at all that means a lot to you and that you like so much you want to share it with everyone sure so recently very recently i read a pair of excellent novels by the the author's name is tan tuan eng it's very difficult not to want to say twang <laughs> um but tan tuan eng and his books the two books they are not the same story but they're in the same place panang and the first one is called the house of doors and the second one is the gift of rain and i would very strongly recommend the gift of rain they're both beautifully written i should also mention that i i listen to books rather than read them so the audio the on audible these books are brilliantly read they're beautifully voiced but most recently i read a book in uh, as a book physical book called fire on the ganges by radhika ayengar an outstanding book i'm going to be in conversation with her uh, in early march about the community of uh, corpse processors called domes d o m she embedded amongst them and lived sort of lived alongside or with them and back and forth for something like 8 to 10 years. She I mean obviously not continuously, but she lived very closely amongst them and her reporting is warm, it is compassionate and heartbreaking and also incredibly uh, positive and optimistic as well. So if anyone wants to read about something that is happening in our world that is it is a very indian situation that you have a community of people whose only job is to process corpses for the ghats in banaras and and to hear about the horrific conditions under which they work and and under which they are oppressed if you read it with an open heart and without um without resistance to the resistance of believing that this can be happening in today's world and we just all accept it but that a young woman went out to find out more is just fabulous as it happens radhika wrote to me a while back uh, uh, talking about the show and asking if she can send me a book and i immediately picked it up because it sounded sounded so interesting i haven't read it yet but i am moving it straight to the top of my queue after what you just said uh, <laughs> you know, films and music on the favorite movies list so i you know we all already have uh, lists made up so at the very very top is fellini's amar cord I no, think I, loved it. I think Amar Khan was one of those movies which when I saw it it's it like it just I, I remember staggering out um of Eros Cinema in Bombay it was it was beyond now there are many movies that have done that for me and you know and I'm not saying that I could watch Amar Khan uh, repeatedly many times whereas I have in fact watch there are a couple of films which i've watched like that i remember with jayanth and golan kruplani we watched the godfather five times in a row i think and then with another friend ketiki shet and a school friend called rudaba uh, namporia all three of us were in boarding school together but following boarding school in ketu's house the three of three of us watched that obscure object of desire bodu well beautiful yes again and again because we couldn't read the titles it was uh, too small it was videotape and we couldn't read the titles and we could not decide is it or is it not a different actress and of course it is a different actress and i had come in late to their viewing and they they said we've already watched it twice and we can't tell and i took one look and i said of course it's a different actress then we we argued and argued that we watched it again three or four times in one afternoon it was fabulous to do that and another movie like that was all that jazz again with golan and jayant we watched it again and again not because we couldn't get it or we were wondering about <laughs> actresses but i mean there are so many great great movies but when i when i'm asked for just the one it'll be amar khan but then 
hugely the Star Wars series, and it's like, whoa, they just blow me, blew me away. Not all, obviously not all, and there's nothing to compare with seeing that first one, the first time which I saw in New York with all the, you know, the special effects and the sound and everything. And and at that time, I remember, I don't know whether I've already said this once, but I remember saying to my sister at that time, you know, he's already told us that there are going to be nine, and this is episode four. And I know that I'm going to die unfulfilled because I will, in my last breath, I will think, but I didn't see the ninth one. So when I did see the ninth one, which was last year, a year before, it was like, okay, good. I can now, I'm at peace. I, I, can, I can die. Of course, there are now other things to fret about, but <laughs> that was one. But in the middle of my, in the middle years of my viewing life, I encountered friends who are cinema enthusiasts, such as Kiran Nagarkar and Shumantra Ghoshal, who, in their very different ways, hugely influenced the way in which I f saw films, the way in which I understood the craft to the extent that I understand. And of course, I realize that as a young person, the way I enjoyed movies was very, very different to the way that enthusiasts like these two in their different ways ex understood and enjoyed the craft of cinema. And I certainly do, uh, even though I'm, I, you know, I'm nothing, I'm an amateur in, in, in my appreciation, I can certainly recognize what they're talking about when people say, when cinema enthusiasts talk about what they, what they admire in the craft. And I remember this, I've mentioned this in, a, in an essay about cinema that I wrote for J. Arjun Singh in his um, popcorn uh, essays. I mentioned that moment when I was sitting next to Budu, Budu Ghoshal, Sumantra Ghoshal, because he had taken me to see 400 blows, true foes, 400 blows. And at the end, I mean, this was the moment of revelation for me that there is this other way of seeing movies because I had watched it along with everyone else, you know, in a kind of neutral way and, you know, enjoying what, what, enjoying it in the way that I had enjoyed mood movies before that. But towards, at the end of the film, there's this long tracking shot. I can now say such things. At that time, I would didn't have the words to say it. I can say that now because I know it now. But I noticed that he was growing restless and he was kind of shifting in his seat, you know, sort of wriggling in the way of someone who is really uncomfortable with something. And, you know, the movie ends in a short while after it, this long shot. And I turned to him and I said, what, what was making you anxious? And he said, you know, that track, how, how long was the track? And I, 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 didn't, I didn't have any idea what he meant. So it took a while to explain it. And by the time, I mean, obviously it's not going to be clear right away what he means, but that the camera is, for the camera to move smoothly alongside the side of a person's head, it means the camera is on a track and that it is moving smoothly and that he is walking at the pace of an ordinary person's walk, but the camera has to follow. That way of thinking about the how had never, ever occurred to me before. I mean, even if it had vaguely occurred, you know, sometimes you would see the mic boom and you would say to yourself, oh, that is really cheesy that you can see the damn mic boom. But this, you know, this level and this, uh, also of noticing where the, the scene cuts out and you see the little, uh, the, the, the little blinking, slight blink at the side of the, uh, the screen. This notion of thinking about where the scene cuts and where the jump occurs and all of this, you know, it never, it had never been obvious to me. It, it didn't even occur to me to think. And that moment, or that moment meaning that evening of discussion, 
was a it's again like so many other moments of revelation of how to see films it hasn't in i mean i've discussed this with friends who say oh come on doesn't that how how can that possibly augment but of course it does of course it augments your per- perceptions about the the skill required to put through uh, to create a scene and also to enjoy the performance of of a scene without a single cut and you know that they're you know they're doing that they they're working on it and it's fabulous and if you know it like i remember seeing again with budu two or three he was he was tasked with subtitling his uncle uh satyajit ray's I, i think it may have been his great uncle satyajit ray's um movies some of his famous classic movies and he was we were he and another friend and uh, i were sitting at the preview theater in eros cinema in uh, churchgate in bombay and just the three of us watching these three or four and i remember i saw charu lata like that and he had primed me that is budu budu had already said notice that she never blinks on screen and then you you know you know that then you know you know to notice that she never blinks and i mean for there are people who will say what you know what is that what what of what possible consequence well it's those i don't know it's like uh it's a tiny insider style a little touch of style and you can see that you know you can see that in so many different forms of art a little signature style i mean you know dracula also doesn't blink <laughs> so you can you can tuck that into your pocket as well but yes yeah, so there are so many films and as for books i mean in this way i have oh, obviously there are thousands of books over these many millions of years that i've lived but i always place if i'm asked i place at the very head of them the megas by john fowles i adore the megas and of course i also hugely adore alice through the looking glass and the two alice books but especially the looking glass and if you think about what happens in alice through the looking glass you'll see that same element of surrealism that for me really sparked it for me so in a sense they really do it for me but again so very many if i if i had to make a list it would of favorite books and it would be at least 25 books long and as for music then it's the beatles and pink floyd and others <laughs> you know we've been talking for many hours and what you haven't noticed is that in all these hours uh-huh. you have been like a woman walking through your life and i have been the tracking camera <laughs> so now i've made you long sort of track. <laughs> uh it's gone on for pretty long but i want to you know i i love uh, i was about to say i uh, i love your uh, taste in cinema but that, that's partly because i share your taste in cinema because some of those favorites are mine too mm-hmm. and at this point i will make a recommendation for our listeners and this goes in with the theme of age about people doing some of their best work when they're older louis bunuel made his last uh, three films when he was past the age of 70 in the 1970s oh my goodness wow and uh, i love all three of them the first first of those was uh, the discreet charm of the bourgeoisie mm-hmm. which is this beautiful film where a bunch of people keep meeting all the time and they're trying to have a meal but they never actually get down to having it for a variety of different reasons mm-hmm. the next one was called the phantom of liberty mm-hmm. and that's really interesting because there the narrative keeps shifting so it's like you and i walk into a bar we talk for 2 minutes and then amartya walks past us and suddenly the camera follows amartya and he is a story <laughs> and so on all the down so there's no constant character it's just moving through and then finally of course that obscure object of desire which as you pointed out uh, you know has two yeah. actresses playing that one role right. which is again so fascinating and they were all co-written with this gentleman who i think died recently jean claude carrier who went on to you know co-write peter brooks mahabharata oh okay so uh, you know and also the unbearable lightness of being which right. philip kaufman
and direct it. So, and Amar Kaur is one of my all-time favorites in the sense I am unlike many in the sense that I love Fellini, but not so much his concept films like Eight and a Half yes, and so on. Right. But the more intimate looks like E with the Loni, which is mm. about the coming of age of young people in that particular town. And Amar Kaur, when I it's a mid seventies film, and when I first saw Amar Kaur, possibly in the late eighties. I thought oh my god these italian families are just like bengali families <laughs> but yeah uh, but on on that pleasurable note thank you so much for spending uh, such a long time uh, thank you, uh, with Abed. me uh, uh, re- really loved our conversation yes thank you so much it was it's been fabulous really thank you If you enjoyed listening to this episode share it with whoever might be interested check out the show notes enter rabbit holes at will all of manjula's links are there i'd encourage you to go to your nearest bookstore offline or online and pick up all her books especially getting there which i absolutely love manjula doesn't appear to be on twitter but you can follow me on twitter at amit verma a m i t v a r m a you can browse past episodes of the scene and the unseen at scene unseen dot i n thank you for listening Did you enjoy this episode of The Scene and the Unseen? If so, would you like to support the production of the show? You can go over to sceneunseen.in/support and contribute any amount you like to keep this podcast alive and kicking. Thank you.